I call members to order. Today we mark an auspicious event in the history of our Senate as we look forward to celebrating 20 years since the election of the first Assembly in 1999. I'm pleased to announce that this space is about to become home to a second exciting Senate, our first ever Youth Parliament. And this is a conclusion of many months of work by organizations, schools, and the dedicated Youth Parliament team at the Assembly. And we are very much indebted to everyone who ensured that this project has come to fruition. Over 450 young candidates, almost 250,000 registered to vote, and representation the length and breadth of Wales. And the statistics speak volumes about their success. ...to enthuse the next generation, and I'm confident that these young parliamentarians will be fabulous champions for the issues of importance to the young people of Wales. I'm pleased, therefore, to announce the first ever members of the Welsh Youth Parliament, representing constituencies and partner organisations nationwide. Here are the 60 names. Dyma Enwer Senedwyr Ifanc. From North Wales. Evan Burgess, Nia Griffiths, Brengain Glyn Williams, Talula Thomas, Harrison James Gardner, Thomas Comer, Ivan Price. Abby Carter, Jonathan Dawes, Jonathan Powell, Ivan Wynne Nerville Jones, Grace Barton, Hasna Ali, Katie June Whitlow. Or Canolbarth, Argotlewin, Mid and West Wales, Arianwen Fox James, Margaret Lois Campbell, Kai Thomas Phillips, Caleb Rees. Megan Caris Davis, Rhys Lewis, Ellie Murphy. Or De Duirain, South Wales East, Callan Jones, Aled Joseph, Guion Richard, Betsan Roberts, Rian Shillabia, Manon Clark, Fionn Griffiths, Tommy Church, Lloyd Mann, Charlie Oliver Holland, Finley Bertrand, Maisie Evans, Abby O'Sullivan, Luke Parker, Caris Thomas, Angel Esdoom, Greta Evans, Chloe Giles, Abby Cooper, Levy Rees. Ac yn ola, finally, De Orllewyn Cymru, South West Wales. Croeso i Cian Agar, Todd Murray, Eleri Griffiths, Fionn Haf Davis, Elena Lewis, Lane Woolcock, Evan Rees Fairclough, Alice Hall, Ruth Sibayan, Ubaday Rahman, Lleiki Haf William, Caitlin Stocks, Casey Jane Bishop, Oliver Davis, Sandy Ibrahim, Nia Rose Evans, Anwen Grace Rodaway, Sophie Billinghurst, and William Hackett. Congratulations to all of them. Thanking them all to the Senate for their inaugural meeting in February. Congratulations, everyone. Ben de Gerig. Excellent. Thank you to members and congratulations to the members of the Youth Parliament. So that takes us on to the business of the day. And the first item is questions to the Cabinet Secretary for Finance. And the first question is from Jenny Rathbone. Um, in light of warnings from the Welsh Local Government Association about the impact of cuts to local government funding, what discussions has the Cabinet Secretary held with the Cabinet Secretary for Local Government and Public Services regarding the safeguarding of local services? Uh, thank Jenny Rathbone for the question. I hold regular discussions with all Cabinet colleagues, including the Cabinet Secretary for Local Government and Public Services. On Friday of last week, for example, we jointly attended a meeting of the Local Government Working Group, attended also by members of the WLGA and others. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, obviously, the uh, additional funding that was made available last week uh, for local government is very welcome. But um, in terms of the, how it translates into money going to Cardiff Council, it's £1.5 million uh, in the context of Cardiff Council having to look for sh um, potential cuts of £34 million. So it remains a very challenging landscape for local government. And I wondered what uh, work the government can do to ensure that we are ensuring that public services are joining up together to uh, try and protect these preventative services, which are so important to the well-being of the community. 
Uh, well, can I agree with, with Jenny Rathbone that it remains a severely challenging period for all public services in Wales, nine years into austerity and local government is certainly in the front line. Uh, I'm grateful to the WLGA for what they said when we announced the additional resources for councils. The WLGA itself said that the announcement signalled significant progress, demonstrated a concerted effort to offset the impact of austerity in Wales. Uh, we will go on working with local uh, government colleagues to strengthen the way in which they are able to act collectively and regionally and to find ways in which money can be moved upstream so that we spend money preventing problems from happening rather than having to respond after the damage has been done. Susie Davis. Uh, deal, so with, as, as you know, Cabinet Secretary, the local authorities in my area are all labour run and even they are starting to say that schools and social care budgets can't be protected. Uh, one of them saying even that Welsh Government cannot continue to use austerity as an excuse for not allowing local government to deliver vital services to all constituents. Uh, with that comment in mind, um, I wonder if you could tell me whether you've discussed with the councils in my region directly yourself um, whether the fund, uh, changes to the funding formula would make a difference and in the meantime um, whether you've discussed any particular ways about how they can protect those budgets um, on, the, um, on the money that you have given them in this year and next year. And if you haven't had the chance to do that, if you are First Minister in a few weeks' time, how will you be instructing colleagues to do that on your behalf? Uh, well, uh, thank Susie Davis. I, I congratulate her, of course, on having all Labour local authorities uh, in her uh, area. And uh, I've no doubt they look forward to having a Labour government at UK level as well as here uh, in Wales, because that is what would make the greatest possible difference to their financial uh, circumstances. The funding formula was discussed. Uh, at the meeting that I attended with Alan Davis on Friday of last week, including representatives of councils in Susie Davis's area, I think council leaders recognise that in the end the funding formula is a distraction from the main issue. The funding formula shares out the amount of money uh, available and changing it when money is reducing is exceptionally difficult. What they emphasise, and we emphasise too, is the need for the UK Government to provide proper funding for all public services in Wales so that it is the size of the cake that is growing rather than an argument over how a reducing cake is shared out. Jane Hutt. Cabinet Secretary, what assessment have you made of the research by the University of Cambridge which shows cuts to spending on services by councils in England are on average double what they've been in Wales? Well, I thank uh, Jane Hutt for that question. She raised uh, this during our debate on the draft budget uh, yesterday, pointing to the research by the University of Cambridge, which, as I said, yes, it was published uh, as it happened on the same day that the provisional settlement for local government in Wales was published. And it absolutely demonstrates, uh, as the report itself says, that Wales and Scotland have taken a different approach to the way in which we safeguard local services here, that we have within the constraints which are real that we face, and they, you know, our actions don't mitigate all of the difficulties that local authorities face, I know, but within those constraints we have protected local government in Wales from the worst effects of nine years of austerity, while local government in England has simply been thrown to the wolves. Question, Question two, Lynn Eagle. What steps is the Welsh Government taking to improve the understanding of Welsh rates of income tax? I thank uh, Lynn Eagle for that question. In November, over two million people in Wales received a letter from HMRC setting out how Welsh rates of income tax will work. The Welsh Government has launched a social media campaign in addition to the work of HMRC to help explain the changes and we work with HMRC and stakeholders to go on raising awareness of Welsh rates of income tax here in Wales. Thank you for that response, Cabinet Secretary. I'm sure I'm not alone amongst members in this chamber in having to reassure constituents on receipt of that letter from HRC that there are currently no plans to put up income tax in Wales, um, because the letter has, I think, alarmed some constituents, certainly of mine. 
What assurances can you give my constituents that there are no plans to raise income tax in Wales? And while I welcome what you've just said about the social media campaign, what more can we do to ensure that there is a good understanding of our new income tax powers in Wales? Uh, well, I uh, thank the member for that uh, supplementary uh, question. Uh, I'm sure she's not alone in having constituents uh, come to ask about Welsh rates uh, of income tax. And it's very good, I think, that uh, local residents turn to Assembly members for explanation of these important changes. Uh, I'm glad that Lynn Neagle was able to offer the key assurance that uh, members of her community will have been looking for, that we have no plans to raise rates of income tax here in Wales next year. Uh, we are following up every inquiry that has come to the Welsh Government uh, as a result of letters that members of the public have uh, received. I know that Lynn Neagle will be uh, interested to learn that we directly have received fewer than five calls and five emails to the Welsh Government as a result of the letter that went out. HMRC has so far received 94 uh, calls in relation to uh, that letter. Uh, that is a very small fraction of the two million letters that were sent out. But we will follow them all up. We will learn from the questions that people uh, ask us, and we will feed that into the social media campaign that we will be mounting uh, over the coming weeks. Mohammad Ashka. Presiding officer. Cabinet Secretary, I agree. Uh, you are also going to agree with me that one way to assist Welsh taxpayer, taxpayer understanding of their tax deduction would be to have the Welsh rate included on both pay slip, where people get salaries either monthly or weekly, and, and form P60, where there was, if some people working in England and in Wales, an end of the year deduction should be shown what was taken out in England and what was taken out for Wales. So that difference of tax collection in different two, uh, two regions in the country. So what discussion he has had? In this regard, please. Uh, well, thank you, Mohamed Ashka, for those uh, suggestions, and I'm very happy to pursue them with HMRC to see whether they would be a practical way of continuing to explain to uh, citizens in Wales the changes that fiscal devolution have brought uh, about. Uh, he's right to point to the fact uh, that there are some detailed discussions which have gone on, and indeed detailed analysis that HMRC are undertaking of the 98 cross-border postcodes where people could be living in England or in Wales uh, in order to ensure that notification letters are issued only to those taxpayers living in Wales. We think there are less than 900 uh, people in that situation, but the additional detailed work that HMRC has carried out will mean that letters to those remaining citizens uh, will be issued by the 10th of December. Questions now from party spokespeople. Plaid Cymru spokesperson, Rina Piorwerth. Thank you very much. Cabinet Secretary, what value should be placed on the views and comments of the Commissioner for Future Generations when the government comes to a decision, or comes to major decisions rather, on policy and expenditure? Well, of course, we listen to what the Commissioner says. I have spoken with her more than once when the budget was being prepared during the spring and summer, and she has been very constructive, I think, during that process, and we appreciate the work that she does and the support that she provides to us as a government. Um, I'm sure you will have guessed that I'm going to be referring my questions to the M4. The Commissioner has made some very strong comments over some time now about your proposals for the Black Route around the M4. She mentioned last year that the M4 scheme could pl put in place a dangerous precedent for the future, and more recently she has made her view expressly clear that she doesn't believe that this proposal meets the requirements of future generations. Should such strong comments from a commissioner that we have entrusted a great deal in be enough to put a stop to this proposal? 
Well, of course, the Commissioner has put forward her own comments as part of the inquiry and research that's been undertaken, independent research for an independent report that has emanated from the work over the past year. I have to simply repeat what my colleague, the Leader of the House, said uh, yesterday. Uh, there is a legal process underway in relation to decision-making on the M4. As Finance Minister, I have a part to play in that process, and I'm not going to be drawn on any aspect of the decision-making that would draw me outside the legal parameters within which I have to operate. There is quite rightly a, a lot of uh, weight of expectation on what the Commissioner can, uh, can do for, for Wales. And surely in this first major test case of the influence that the Commissioner uh, has, um, government should be showing that they are taking this and her role extremely uh, seriously. She raises um, some serious and fundamental questions about value for money and what that means for um, finances available uh, for future generations. Now, as the holder of the public purse uh, in Wales and somebody who is charged with ensuring that uh, we get maximum value for uh, money uh, uh, and get maximum bangs for the Welsh uh, buck, can you give an undertaking that whilst we still uh, await decisions uh, by, by government on the next steps for, for the Black Truth, that you will uh, investigate every possibility of spending that substantial amount of money, up to £2 billion or more even, in a more sensible way, either spending uh, less for the same results through in strengthening the, the road network and investing in public transport, or even spending the same amount of money and getting vastly greater results that would please not only future generations, but future health uh, secretaries, uh, future transport secretaries, and indeed future finance ministers too. But I understand all the points uh, that Rina Pioreth has made. All of them are serious points. All of them were rehearsed in front of the independent local public inquiry. Uh, no doubt they will all be reflected in the inspector's report produced as a result of the inquiry. I am yet to see that inspector's report, and I have to reserve any comments that I might make on this matter until I'm able to do that and to see the advice that is provided alongside it. Conservative spokesperson Darren Miller. Cabinet Secretary, what provision have you made in your budget for next year in respect of the North Wales growth deal? Um, well, Llywydd, I am on the point of being able to make provision for the North Wales uh, growth deal. I hope to be able to do that uh, within uh, a short uh, number of days. Uh, I have not been able to do so up until this point, because unlike the Cardiff and Swansea city deals, where the amounts of money to be provided by the Welsh Government and the UK Government were agreed in advance of a UK Government announcement, the Chancellor of the Exchequer chose to announce the sum of money from the UK Government unilaterally and without agreement with us. You're very slow off the starting blocks uh, in respect of this deal, aren't you, Cabinet Secretary? Because, as you will know, uh, this bid was put together and submitted by the North Wales Economic Ambition Board uh, on the 23rd uh, of October. The UK Government managed to consider it uh, and put its hand in its pocket and to place £120 million on the table within a matter of just a uh, few weeks. Why have you spent so long dithering about this? I'm sure the member would rather that we had a constructive and cross-party uh, uh, approach to the North Wales growth deal. Uh, I understand that it is supported by members across this chamber. Uh, the Welsh Government certainly will play our part, uh, and I will make a decision on the amount of money that we are able to uh, contribute to the deal. I would rather have been able to do that in the way we did in relation to Swansea and Cardiff by prior agreement with the UK uh, Government. Uh, the UK Government having decided to put its hand in its pocket, but not all that far, I must say, given that it was £170 million uh, that was asked for by North Wales authorities, not the £120 million they ended up with. Uh, but I will make uh, certain that there is a contribution from the Welsh Government, and then I look forward to uh, the cross-party consensus that has existed in this chamber on the importance of that growth deal continuing. 
Uh, I noted your criticism of the 120 million, but there's 120 million more than you've managed to put your hands in your pocket for uh, so far. And you're quite right to say that there is cross-party agreement uh, on this matter. I noted that in advance of the UK government's budget, uh, there were um, uh, members of parliament on a cross-party basis, including Labour members of parliament, uh, who were writing to the UK government asking it to uh, make an announcement uh, in the budget uh, on the North Wales uh, growth deal. Uh, I would anticipate that you've also received similar letters. Perhaps you can tell us whether you have uh, from, uh, from either Labour Assembly members uh, or MPs in respect of the role uh, that you might play. I think what people in North Wales are looking for is some rapid decision-making uh, on this. We know that the Welsh Government, quite rightly, was very eager to get things signed off for the Cardiff uh, Capital Region City Deal and the Swansea Bay uh, City Deal, but for some reason you appear to be in a little bit more lethargic uh, than uh, you have been in respect of both of those deals in terms of engaging uh, on, the North Wales, uh, uh, on the North Wales Growth Deal with the Economic Ambition Board and in terms of putting some money uh, on the table. You say now that you are going to make an announcement in the coming days. I welcome the fact that you have revealed that uh, to us today. Can you tell us, uh, in advance uh, of that announcement, whether you will be providing sufficient monies for the bid to be completely fulfilled? Uh, well, Chloe, I, of course, received correspondence uh, in relation to the North Wales growth deal. By and large, uh, it urged me to put pressure on the UK Government to make its mind up in relation to the deal. Uh, this was the third budget. Uh, I, I notice the member talks about decision-making being made rapidly. This was the third annual occasion on which the Chancellor of the Exchequer mentioned the North Wales growth deal. Two years ago, he told us he was thinking about it. A year ago, Go. He told us he thought about it a bit more, uh, and this year uh, I was very glad to see that he had come to a funding uh, conclusion. Uh, I will make an announcement, as I say, as soon as I am able to. It will be a significant investment from uh, the Welsh uh, Government. Uh, I think we are then much better off focused on making sure that we work together, the UK Government, the Welsh Government, local authorities, private sector partners and others, to make the best possible success of the deal, rather than worrying too much about whether a decision was made one week or two weeks later than somebody else did. UKIP spokesperson Neil Hamilton. Uh, can I commend the uh, Chief Economist to the Welsh Government for the document that was published this week, summarising the economic analyses which have been made by the UK Government of the uh, effects of Brexit under different scenarios. Um, but the document contains some of the more ludicrous projections, uh, including the ones that have been published by the Bank of England this week in the continuation of Project Fear, which uh, claim that by the end of 2023, on the worst case scenario, GDP in the UK could be between 7 and 3 quarter and 10% lower than it was in May 2016, uh, which would be quite remarkable because not only is that a much more severe contraction than we experienced in the recession of uh, 2008, but it's actually greater than the fall in output which occurred during the Great Depression in the 1930s and is only seen in countries like Venezuela, which have been given a full dose of Corbynite economic policies, and where, and where uh, a 16 per cent contraction in GDP in one year is now the norm. So uh, would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the kind of, uh, of uh, worst case scenarios produced by official organisations like the Bank of England are actually grossly irresponsible in the current climate of uncertainty over Brexit because they just magnify fears unnecessarily and therefore make that uncertainty even worse. And that has a real impact upon businesses and the lives and, and livelihoods of ordinary people. Uh, well, Lewis, can I uh, thank the member, first of all, for drawing attention to the document that the Chief Economist published uh, yesterday. Uh, he is uh, independent of government in the judgments uh, that he makes, and I know he was anxious to publish his assessment alongside the debate that we had uh, yesterday, and I hope other members will have a chance to read uh, what he said. Uh, I think his analysis is sober. I think it is 
deliberately couched in language intended to be non-alarmist, and where I can't agree with the member, as he will know, is in dismissing projections that are made by absolutely mainstream and respectable forecasters, not simply the Bank of England, but also the Treasury itself, also uh, um, analysts outside government, all of whom uh, share a broad consensus on the potential impact on our economy uh, of a hard line slash and burn Brexit. Uh, and I can't afford to dismiss those projections in the way that he does, because in government, I'm afraid you have to prepare for the worst, uh, even when you are working as hard as you can to avoid it. Well, I'm afraid the Cabinet Secretary, in disagreeing with me, is also agreeing with the former uh, Governor of the Bank of England, Mervyn King, and indeed with Nobel Prize winner Paul Krugman, whose political views are very far from mine and are actually not too far uh, from the Cabinet Secretary's, because uh, Mervyn King uh, has uh, said that he is saddened to see the Bank of England unnecessarily drawn into this project fear type of exercise, and Paul Krugman no friend of Brexit, uh, describes the bank's estimates as black box numbers that are dubious and questionable. Uh, so when such a broad range of uh, economic analysts of uh, world renown are able to dismiss these kinds of uh, hysterical uh, prophecy, uh, I, I, I can't understand why the Cabinet Secretary himself, in the interests of a sober analysis uh, and debate, which I agree with him, the Chief Economist uh, has added to our deliberations yesterday, why he can't calm things down by agreeing with me that it does us no good whatsoever to have forecasts for the future which are wildly, uh, alarmingly out of kilter with reality. Well, uh, so it, uh, I would see to calm things down uh, in this way uh, by saying that two things happened yesterday that make the prospects of a no-deal Brexit uh, recede, and I'm very glad uh, of that, and that the very best way uh, to calm down anxiety will be for the UK Government to take the advice set out in securing Wales' its future and negotiate a form of Brexit which authentically supports the Welsh economy and jobs. And then we wouldn't have to be trading expert against expert, dealing with the hypothetical but catastrophic possibility that we could leave the European Union on terms that do the maximum damage. I refer back to the Chief Economist's report because he does uh, say uh, in it that uh, there is a strong consensus amongst economists about the key principles of forecasting, one of which is that distance itself is a barrier and trade is generally more intensive with partners who are approximate both geographically and in terms of their stage of economic development. And the Treasury model and most of the other models which uh, are referred to in this document uh, use what is called a gravity model uh, of forecasting and uh, the fundamental principle of that is that the amount of trade done between two countries diminishes with the square of the distance between them. Uh, but all the data upon which this rather dubious um, uh, forecasting model is based, uh, the, the data on which that's based were, were compiled in the 1980s and before, a world in which there was no internet, no FaceTime, no email, no Google Translate, no standardised container, containerization, no opening up of former Marxist states like uh, China, for example, no World Trade Organization even. Uh, and therefore, given that trade in services is now vastly more important to our economy and indeed the economy of, uh, of our European neighbours than it was then and uh, global mobility is so much greater and the digital revolution has taken place that the assumptions upon which these forecasting models are made are, are wildly out of date and that is why they produce these alarmingly out of kilter predictions which are always proved to be totally wrong after the event. Uh, well, so the, the gravity uh, analysis is, as the member says, summed up generally as trade halves as distance doubles. Uh, and that does tell you a relatively commonsensical thing, that you are more likely to have intense economic relationships with those who are closest to you. And the further away your market is from uh, your own, uh, the less likely it is that you will have the same intensity of trade. The real difficulty for the member is, is that all the things that he 
points to in trying to discredit uh, gravity analysis apply whether we are in the European Union or not. Uh, and uh, leaving the European Union is not a material fact in the analysis that he just attempted to set out. Question three. Question three, Mark Reckless. Uh, will the Cabinet Secretary make a statement on the Welsh Government's long-term strategy for taxation levels in Wales? Uh, so the Welsh Government's long-term strategy was set out in the Tax Policy Framework, published in 2017, and is reflected in the report on our tax work programme, published alongside the draft budget on the 2nd of October. If the Cabinet Secretary is in charge, can we expect tax rates in Wales to be higher or lower in five years' time? Uh, so if taxation rates must be judged in the prevailing economic circumstances of the time, and that is what I would expect anybody charged with responsibilities for the Welsh finances to do. My catches. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me about the importance of taxation to support public services in Wales? If I can remind the Cabinet Secretary, in the last three weeks, the Conservatives have asked for more money for local government, more money for further education, more money for health. How are they going to fund it if they don't want taxation? Uh, well, of course, Mike Hedges is absolutely right. Taxation is the admission charge we pay to a civilised society. It is through pooling the money that comes through taxation that we are all able to afford the things which around this chamber we regard as important in the lives of people uh, in Wales. Uh, now, uh, if you choose to lower taxes in Wales by one penny, the gross cost would be around £200 million. Pounds. Uh, which of our public services would have to be cut with to enable that to happen? Uh, you can't do the sort of voodoo, voodoo economic trick that we are often uh, offered by members on the benches opposite, in which you cut taxes, have less money, and still are somehow able to spend more on everything that they tell us uh, they would, uh, would favour. Question Pedwar. Question four, Vicky Howells. What are the Welsh Government's priorities for capital investment in Cannon Valley? Uh, thank Vicky Howells for that. Our capital priorities for the Cannon Valley include investment in town centres, in flood prevention, in the health service, uh, including, for example, the new primary and community care centre due to be completed in Mountain Ash in 2021. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. In fact, there's an exhibition on for that primary care centre in Mountain Ash today. Uh, but in particular, I am keen for work on sections five and six of the duelling of the Heads of the Valleys Road to be completed, which would be so important for my constituency. I noted the Local Government Secretary's comments last week about maximising the benefits of the investment in the A465 corridor for local communities. This was set against a 12-month time frame, so with work on sections five and six due to start at the end of 2019, how will this investment be exploited to bring the most advantage to communities in Cannon? Well, uh, thank Vicky Howells uh, for that. She will know that we went uh, out to tender on sections five and six of the A465 back in uh, July. Uh, we are now having an opportunity to consider fully the inspector's uh, report, and I hope that a decision to proceed with the next stage of procurement will be taken very shortly. Uh, directly in that project, there will be contractual requirements uh, for the successful bidder to deliver a range of community benefits around employment of local people, training, apprenticeships and work contracts for local companies, all of which will benefit uh, residents in her constituency. Uh, my colleague Alan Davis uh, was referring to a working group set up by the Valleys Task Force which is to consider how best to maximise the opportunities around the duelling, not simply while it's being built, but once it is open as well. David Melding. Cabinet Secretary, um, you will know, and I'm sure you welcomed as I did, uh, the decision of, kind of uh, RCT uh, uh, Council to uh, launch their largest ever capital investment uh, uh, programme. Uh, in their history, uh, set at 300 million, of which 45 million will be on housing, and some innovative uh, schemes are planned, and some important uh, partnerships with uh, the private sector and uh, housing associations and, uh, and the local authority itself, of course. And given now that the Treasury is lifting the, uh, uh, the borrowing cap on uh, uh, councils that want to build more houses, don't you welcome this approach, which 
in tough financial times is just the sort of way to really see our local economies being stimulated. Uh, well, I do welcome the lifting of the cap, and I know my colleague Rebecca Evans has been in correspondence with local authorities about what that will do to their ability to raise further funding to invest in housing. Of course, David Melding uh, is right about the local economic impact of house building in communities, and I agree with him uh, that RCT Council, under the leadership of Councillor Andrew Morgan, has been amongst the most innovative councils in Wales in finding ways to expand their ability to invest in capital projects, not simply in housing, but in many other areas uh, as well. Uh, Councillor Morgan, the author with uh, Jane Hutt of the Local, uh, Bor Local Authority Borrowing Initiative, which we have helped uh, to fund, uh, and I congratulate them uh, on the work that they do in this area. Question 5, Mohamed Ashkar. Madam Presiding Officer, what discussion has the Cabinet Secretary had with the Cabinet Secretary for Education about the funding of the West Government Apprenticeship Programme, please? Thank you, Member. I meet all Cabinet Secretaries as part of our budget preparations to discuss delivery of our priorities set out in Prosperity for All. And that includes our commitment to deliver 100,000 high quality all age apprenticeships during this Assembly term. Thank you very much for the reply, Minister. The Economy and Infrastructure Skill Committee recently expressed its disappointment at the lack of transparency surrounding the funding and operation of the apprenticeship program. The committee also expressed concern that this lack of transparency posed a challenge to the effective scrutiny of this flagship WESH government in initiative. Cabinet Secretary, what discussion you have had with the ministerial colleagues about this matter and what action will you take to ensure the concerns of the committee are addressed and resolved? Uh, well, thank the member for that. Of course, we take seriously the views of uh, the committee, and I look forward to studying them in more detail to see how we can uh, tell our story more clearly on apprenticeships, because it is a very good story indeed, Tlawid. And as a government, we would certainly wish to make sure that no one is left in any doubt that, for example, next year, we will invest £150 million of Welsh Government money to help us in our journey to that minimum of 100,000 all-age apprenticeships during the course of this Assembly term. Bethan Syed. Um, research from the National Society of Apprenticeships um, shows uh, that apprentices spend 20% uh, of their salary uh, on transport, which is significant uh, given that some apprenticeships are only on uh, £3.70 uh, £3 an hour. I was wondering um, what uh, plans, or if you had any plans, uh, potentially to um, encourage free transportation for apprentices so that they can reach uh, the place of work uh, in a timely fashion and in an affordable fashion uh, so they don't have to budget for transport when they have to budget for so many other things uh, in their lives as apprenticeships. No, I will ab absolutely <laughs> always recognise the point that uh, Beth and Saeed has made about the cost of travel on people who are going to work and managing on low incomes. Uh, the policy matter is not one uh, for me, it would be for my colleague Ken Skates, but I'll make sure that the points that she's made this afternoon are drawn to his attention. Mike Hedges. Oh, dear Clover, would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the UK's Government's much vaunted apprenticeship levy has now been exposed to what it is, nothing more than a tax on employers, which has done little to improve access to apprenticeships, and would he also agree that the further education colleges in Wales are doing a phenomenally good job in training apprentices for the benefit of our country? Uh, well, of course, Mike Hedges is right, Clover. Uh, the apprenticeship levy is simply a tax uh, in any other name, and a very badly designed uh, tax a tax that is friendless, as far as I can see, uh, amongst the uh, nations of the United Kingdom and amongst employers uh, as well. It was a botched job from the start. There was no prior discussion with Scotland or Wales. We could have helped the then Chancellor of the Exchequer to do a better job of it had he simply allowed us, as the statement of funding policy required, had he allowed us to be part of the design of what he was attending to uh, achieve. I certainly agree. Uh, with Mike Hedges, that further education colleges in Wales uh, do an excellent job in responding to local economic needs, in matching young people with careers that they will be able to develop over the long term. I have recently myself met with apprenticeships at, at Airbus and in Tata uh, in South Wales, uh, and they all had 
really impressive stories to tell of the support that they have received from major employers in Wales and how that has been matched by a genuinely responsive approach by their local education uh, authorities and the further education colleges on which they rely. Question, Question 6, Andrew R.T. Davis. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, what changes does the Cabinet Secretary intend to make to business rates here in Wales in light of the UK Government's budget announcement regarding business rates in England? Uh, thank the Member for the question. Uh, as you will know, I announced yesterday that I intend to enhance our High Street Rate Relief Scheme for 2019-20. I said yesterday, Llawe, that I would use the full £26 million consequential for that uh, purpose. And I can say today that I intend to make £24 million directly available to the High Street scheme itself, and that I will also provide an additional £2.4 million to local authorities to fund the discretionary rate relief which they are able to provide. With the UK Government's announcement uh, in the budget back in October, the figures that came out of the UK Government budget announcement said that businesses in England would receive about £8,000 rebate on their business rates up to a rateable value of £51,000 over two years. Given the series of announcements you just made there, Cabinet Secretary, which are welcome, uh, additional money going into business rates, uh, what tangible benefits will be felt on our high streets here in Wales, given the Small Business Saturday was only last Saturday, and time and time again, business operators on high street say business rates is the biggest millstone around their neck to expansion and employing more staff on those high streets. Well, I think it is important for me to uh, make sure that members understand that once the small print of what the Chancellor said on the 28th of October was examined, it turned out that there is to be no national scheme in England at all. Uh, that there is simply to be funding to local authorities to, in, to carry to use their discretionary powers. Uh, there will be no national uh, rules. You will simply be in the hands of your local authority to use the money that the Chancellor provides as they uh, see fit. So the figures that the Chancellor uh, used are illustrative at the very best and simply not to be relied upon as representing a scheme that businesses across England can rely on. By contrast, our High Street uh, relief scheme has a set of all Wales rules. Uh, there, is a, there is a way in which businesses will know exactly how much they will be entitled to get. And of course, I do agree with the member uh, that the money, every penny that we will get as a result of that announcement will be spent to assist businesses here uh, in Wales. But we will design a scheme that meets the size, the distribution and the value of the Welsh tax base in this area, which is different to the one in England, and we will design a scheme that puts the money where it will have the best effect. Julie Markham. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm aware that many childcare businesses um, in my constituency in Cardiff North are very concerned about um, business rates. And will the Cabinet Secretary confirm that all childcare providers will be exempt from paying business rates in Wales from April 2019? Uh, yes, uh, we Thank you to Julie Morgan for that, because I can uh, confirm exactly that, that our small business rate relief uh, scheme is to be extended to provide 100 per cent rate relief to all registered childcare providers in Wales, and this higher level of relief will start on the 1st of April 2019, and it is a very good example of aligning our taxation responsibilities with our policy ambitions, because, of course, we have an ambition to provide uh, the most uh, enhanced level of childcare to people here uh, in Wales, and the decision on rate relief was designed to support the sector on which we rely to deliver our childcare offer. Question side. Question seven, Joyce Watson. Howard, what assessment has the Cabinet Secretary made of the most recent public spending figures for the nations of the UK? Uh, well, thank Joyce Watson for that. The figures show that investment in health and in social services and in education grew faster in Wales in 2017-18 than in any other UK nation. Uh, I was interested to listen to the news bulletins yesterday morning, uh, but dismayed to learn that spending on vital care services for elderly people in England has been cut by 25% per person since 2010. 
That, of course, hasn't happened in Wales because the Labour Welsh Government has protected those budgets, and, and I'm extremely proud of that, and I'm sure everybody would want to join with me uh, in celebrating that fact. But from next April, a portion of the income tax paid by people in Wales will directly fund Welsh public services. How will that free up Welsh Government to go further in terms of prioritising those vital frontline services? Well, thank uh, Joyce Watson for that Im important question. She's absolutely right. That is what the figures produced by the UK Government uh, demonstrate, that despite the impact of austerity and the very real challenges that that poses for uh, public services, we have protected spending in local authorities and spending on elderly services to an extent certainly not seen across our border. And health on spending per head uh, on health and social services in Wales combined last year <coughs> increased by 3.8%, and that was the highest increase of any of the four UK countries. Uh, Joyce Watson is absolutely right to point out uh, that the new fiscal responsibilities we have bring with them some new opportunities. She will be aware of the report of Professor Jerry Holtham looking at the possibility of a social care levy here uh, in Wales. Uh, the Cabinet has a subgroup set up, chaired by my colleague Hugh Aranka Davis, bringing together Cabinet colleagues to see whether it would be practical to take some of that analysis and to put it to work in Wales using our new fiscal possibilities to support our ambitious policy agenda. Mark Reckless. Uh, could the Cabinet Secretary confirm the uh, funding floor guarantee that the UK Government has provided in respect of uh, spending in Wales and uh, compare and contrast that to any uh, funding floor that was in place under previous <coughs> Labour governments in the UK? Um, well, uh, thank the member for that. Uh, the fiscal framework does include a multiplier. It's 105 per cent. I, I think the Leader of the Opposition yesterday mm -hmm. suggested it was 120 per cent, but it's actually 105 per cent. For every pound that is spent uh, in England, uh, we get 105 per cent uh, of that through the Barnet consequentials. Uh, that's amounted to £70 million so far for Wales, uh, with the additional money for, for health. No, uh, it's not uh, allow the Cabinet Secretary yeah. to answer uh, the question. I think I'm... Uh, I think I'm uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. The point that the member asked me was whether there is a mechanism in the fiscal framework that guarantees that Wales gets a fixed percentage of the funding that is uh, announced in England. The answer is that it does. Uh, that has given us £70 million additional so far following the signing of the fiscal framework. And if you take into account the promised additional funding for the NHS over the next few years, that will give us £270 million, uh, beyond what we otherwise would have had without the conclusion of that agreement. Now it's your turn. Question with Darren Miller. Hey, Darren Miller. Will the Cabinet Secretary make a statement on the future of tax levels in Wales between now and the next Assembly election? Uh, thank you, Darren Miller, for the question. The draft budget published on the 2nd of October proposed that the Welsh rate of income tax remain the same as England and Northern Ireland in 2019 <coughs> 20, consistent with my party's manifesto commitment not to raise income tax levels in this Assembly term. Very grateful for that uh, response. I've listened carefully to you respond to similar questions uh, as well during the course uh, of this question time. And what you haven't indicated is what uh, your plans or the plans of your party might be beyond the next uh, financial year. I'd be grateful if you could assure us of your personal commitment not to increase income tax rates before the next Assembly election, including in those years beyond 2019-20. Well, uh, Shawid, I've already repeated the manifesto commitment of my party not to raise income tax levels in this Assembly term. Uh, I would be uh, much better placed if the UK Government was able to tell me how much money this Assembly will have beyond the next financial uh, year. Uh, there is to be a comprehensive spending review which will not even begin until January, and I have no figures at all for the Assembly's budget beyond 
2020. That will be a great help to us all in being able to provide the sort of certainty for the future that the member has asked me about. I can all question. Finally, question nine, Rhiannon Passmore. Thank you very much. I think um, the question has been asked. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that Welsh taxpayers have received their HMRC letter about Welsh uh, rates for income tax? That is the question in front of me, Claire. Uh, that's no, not the question no, in front of fine. me. Um, I think we'll leave it at we'll that it. and thank the Cabinet Secretary for his uh, uh, you, contribution. And that brings us to questions to the Cabinet Secretary for Local Government and Public Services. Question one comes from Helen Mary Jones. Can the Secretary make a statement on Welsh Government support for rural councils? The majority of Welsh Government support for rural councils is delivered through the £4.2 billion local government settlement. The settlement funding formula includes a number of indicators which account for varying degrees of population sparsity across all of our authorities. I will thank the Cabinet Secretary for his uh, answer, but here is the reality. Uh, Powys is looking at a £14 million budget gap for the next financial year. Carmarthenshire has had to make £50 million worth of cuts at the same time as raising its council tax by 22 per cent over the past five years, and citizens in Pembrokeshire are facing a 12 per cent increase in their council tax in the next financial year alone. Now, I realise that the Cabinet Secretary is dealing with a difficult budget, and I realise that it is not the fault of the Welsh Government that the settlement is tight. But surely, given those figures, Cabinet Secretary, you can see that there must be something wrong with the way in which the money is being allocated because if you compare this with communities in more urban parts of Wales, it just does not seem equitable or fair. The, the member is absolutely correct, of course, that we are dealing with um, a very difficult uh, financial settlement, and I, I and the, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance have, made, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, have been absolutely clear in our response to this, that this is a difficult settlement, and we would prefer to be able to allocate greater funding to all local authorities. But let me say this. I, I do regret the um, increasing tendency amongst many members to pit uh, different communities against each other. Um, in the question from the member for Llanelli, she pitted rural against urban. Um, in the past, um, we have pitted north against south, east against west. I do regret this uh, tendency with, within our debate um, because it, is not, it does not reflect either um, the uh, debates that we have with local government, and I do not re believe it reflects the reality either. I will say to the member that the finance subgroup, which provides representation for all authorities across the country, endorsed the settlement funding formula for <coughs> the, the, the next financial year at its meeting on the 27th of September. In addition to this, I spoke to representatives of all political groupings in local government last week, and I, I repeated to them the point I made in this chamber during uh, a Conservative Party debate on the funding formula and a settlement. But if I receive a letter from all four political groupings within local government asking for a review of the formula, then I will institute it. I have to say the response on Friday was not very uh, positive to that. I think you're very fortunate at this point that the member for Llanelli is not in uh, the <laughs> chamber. Uh, <laughs> I think you, refer, you, need, you wanted to refer well, to the West member Wales. from Mid and West Wales. Yes. Uh, Russell George. Uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary, on the 31st of January, the leaders of both Powys County Council and Ceredigion County Council will be coming here to the Senate as part of a growing Mid Wales delegation, jointly sponsored by the Llawydd, the uh, member for Brecon of Radnorshire, and myself. And there'll be an opportunity to showcase produce and services from local businesses from across these two. Uh, rural local authorities. Now, I appreciate you're not leading on the Mid Wales Growth Deal. That's a matter for the Cabinet Secretary for the economy. But can I ask you, what are you doing to support these two rural local authorities to boost the economies uh, of Mid Wales? Uh, as uh, the member indicated in his question, um, that does not sit with my responsibilities. But I will say to him that the first time I met with the leadership of Powers County Council, these matters were discussed. I met with the, um, the leadership of the authority and I said to them there that this government wanted to be an activist government seeking to promote and support economic development across the whole face of the country and that we would be active in supporting that. And certainly in the conversations that I've had with all local government leaders across the country, we've always emphasised that we will continue to provide that level of support. Question to Question to Leanne Wood. What assessment has the Cabinet Secretary made of the impact of local authority funding cuts? 
I and my Cabinet colleagues consider local government funding with local authorities through the Partnership Council and its finance subgroup, as well as other formal and informal engagements. I know you'll be aware of the findings from Professor Philip Alston, the UN Special Rapporteur for Extreme Poverty, and um, among many of his stark conclusions were that Westminster cuts have fallen hardest on the poor, on women, racial and ethnic minorities, children, single parents and people with disabilities. He argued that a misogynist would find it hard to do a better job. Has your government taken a full impact assessment of your local authority cuts to ensure that you are not repeating the callous decisions of the Tories and exacerbating the situation for those people with the least in our society? We, we, we certainly will be, will, will be re, re, reviewing um, the, the report from the UN Rapporteur, and, and I must say I, I've read his report and I concur with, with the member for the Ronvers' uh, um, conclusions on it. But let me say this. Um, the the, the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Finance, in answer to an earlier question, pointed out that the University of, of Cambridge has recently published a review of the approach from uh, different UK administrations to local government. And that review was very, very clear that Wales and Scotland have followed a very similar approach, which is very different to that of England. And the consequences for that are very clear for uh, in the English population. But let me also say this that uh, one of the reports that I read last year, which is very influential in my thinking, was that those local authorities who represent poorer and more deprived communities have, more, have greater difficulties in raising funds and are more reliant on central government funding than richer, more prosperous areas. And that is one of the reasons why I have always pursued in my time in this office a, 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 a route which seeks to uh, in, in, have a structures in place that maximises impact of frontline services and ensures that we have services provided at a scale that is able to withstand future financial pressures as well. And I look forward to support from Clyde Camry and elsewhere in pursuing that agenda. Mark is short. Uh, yeah, uh, what dialogue have you had with the Chief Executive of Flintshire County Council since he uh, wrote to all councillors there on the 16th of November asking them to back the Back We Ask campaign uh, to uh, get a fair share of Welsh national funds, which was uh, on the 20th of November backed unanimously by members of all parties uh, to take, quote, the fight down to the local government department in Cardiff. I haven't spoken to the Chief Executive, to Colin Everett, on this subject in, in that uh, uh, time frame. But I will say this, as, as the Chief Executive was making that statement in Flintshire, the leader of Flintshire County Council was with me in Cardiff, in, in Cates Park, telling me that he had no wish to reopen the funding formula or debate or discussions around that formula. Christian Nenau. We now have questions from party spokespeople. The Conservative spokesperson, David Melding. Uh, our, uh, flow with, uh, uh, Minister, it's uh, nearly a year since uh, the finance sector announced his changes to land transaction tax, moving the standard threshold for payment from 150,000 to 180,000. What assessment has your department made on the likely effect this will have on first-time buyers in Wales? And of course, um, the decision around the land transaction tax means that around 80% of first time buyers in Wales won't pay tax with our threshold of £180,000. And this, of course, is the same proportion of first time buyers as in England with their SDLT. Currently, the average house uh, price here in Wales is £140,000. So I think it is um, incorrect and unfair to suggest in the uh, Conservative Party's white paper released uh, this week that there is no relief for first-time buyers, because that is misleading. Around 80% of first-time buyers are protected from that. Well, well Minister, uh, when this policy was introduced, it uh, diverged from the uh, uh, option that uh, they took uh, in England. Their uh, first-time buyers uh, have uh, a relief up to £300,000 uh, on properties that, uh, at, at, at a price at that level. Uh, there is no stamp duty at all. Now, you quote the average pr uh, house price, as I thought you said, 140000 I think that uh, is uh, not accurate. The average price, I think, at the moment is 180000 or thereabouts. And uh, that is, uh, you know, a significant... Uh, amount and 
uh, for properties then between 180 and 250,000, which is where the average price in many local authorities uh, now is, uh, uh, the first-time buyers will not get full relief. They'll get you know, a margin of that on 180,000, but they will not get the same deal that uh, uh, those buyers would get in, uh, in England. And let me just spell out that, what that means. In Cardiff, it means our first-time buyers compared to the uh, equivalent in England pay uh, £1,700 more in tax. In Monmouthshire, they pay £5,400 more in tax. And even in Anglesey, first-time buyers there are paying more than 1000 in tax in addition to what uh, 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 that, 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 that they would pay if they were in England. Uh, you know, do you think it's fair that our first-time buyers in Wales do not get as good a deal as they get in England? Well, the Office of Budget Responsibilities assessment of the first-time buyers' relief was that it would do little to help first-time buyers and it would increase house prices and result in very few additional first-time buyer purchases. So we don't want to replicate a relief that's not deemed to be effective. And in fact, our approach is much more fair in Wales because our approach is keen to assist all of those who struggle to buy a house uh, to do so. So um, you don't have to be a first-time buyer to, um, to benefit from our land transaction tax uh, relief uh, here in Wales. And actually, I think that's a fair thing to do. People struggle to buy their second house, people struggle to move. And I think our approach has been to help people who are struggling rather than uh, first-time buyers uh, as an entire group. Relief is either helpful or it isn't, so I think you need to make your mind up on that. And I wouldn't like to go out into the streets of Cardiff or go to Monmouth or Anglesey and tell the first-time buyers there, paying well over the odds of what they would pay if they were in England, uh, that, uh, uh, that you know, this extra tax is neither here nor there. Uh, I think that is a really bad message. The other thing, I mean, where I do agree, uh, that we do need a broader range of policies, and the building rate... Uh, is the key thing, really, in terms of providing a better market and a more competitive market for our first-time buyers. So how do you think the lowest building rate on record, almost, is helping first-time buyers in Wales? Uh, well, clearly, Welsh Government is committed to increasing the scale and pace of building, and one of our commitments in Prosperity for All was to work very closely with local th authorities to do that, and we're able to do that now as a result of the raising or the, um, the, the scrapping of the, uh, the borrowing limit, which of course Welsh Government has been campaigning for for some time. We're well on course to meet our target of 20,000 new affordable homes being built through the course of this Assembly. And today you'll have noticed that we've published Planning Policy Wales, which clearly uh, takes, um, takes us forward in terms of uh, breaking down some of those barriers in terms of planning. So ensuring that um, the areas that are brought forward for planning will genuinely be built on rather than as we see at the moment, uh, plots of land being included in LDPs, and they have the, uh, the impact of raising the value of that land, but actually doing very little to um, improve the uh, rate of house building. So I would point to Planning Policy Wales as being an important uh, move forward in terms of being able to break down some of the barriers that we are seeing to the pace of house building across Wales. Kimberley Spokesperson Leanne Wood. Yes, I spoke at the crisis conference on ending homelessness back in June, and I'm sure you've uh, read the report that was produced at that event, which outlines what can be done to end homelessness. It's a very comprehensive report with recommendations for all governments, including your government. Can you tell us what you learned from that event and from the report, and how it's influencing your decision-making? Uh, thank you very much for that. As you say, I did um, attend that report and um, have read the very extensive document. I think it's about uh, two inches thick, so it certainly is uh, full of evidence, uh, which we are taking very seriously. What I learned from that, confer uh, that conference really was about the importance of supporting people with a direct um, impact of an experience of homelessness and listening to people who have that experience of homelessness because of course I stayed for longer than my own slot within that conference and was able to hear directly from people who have that experience of homelessness which I think has to be the answer in terms of guiding us to our response. Um, this is one of the exciting things that Swansea is doing with the additional funding that we've been able to provide to them for tackling rough sleeping. Uh, they're undertaking some work with Shelter to gather those individual stories of rough sleepers uh, so that we can understand at what point an intervention could have been made to prevent 
that rough sleeping, how we could have helped people out of rough sleeping much sooner, and how we can prevent people from losing te their tenures in future. Thank you, um, Minister. For some years now in Plaid Cymru, we've been uh, arguing the case for the phasing out of priority needs. Now, two weeks ago, you responded to my colleague saying that that was the subject of a review. But of course, in 2012, your government commissioned Cardiff University to review homelessness law, and they recommended abolishing priority need, a recommendation endorsed by uh, this year by the Equalities, Communities and Local Government Committee. Uh, and of course, there's this recommendation in the crisis report. So why has your government rejected the recommendations of these reviews and instead asked for another one? Uh, well, we're looking at in very, uh, very seriously at the issue of priority need, and I completely understand uh, where the call is coming from to it, and I am sympathetic to it, but at the same time we need to understand any possible unintended consequences. For example, when we look at the um, situation in Scotland where they abolished priority need, you find uh, larger groups of people staying for much longer in temporary accommodation, which isn't something that we would want to see here in Wales. So we need to be doing this alongside the increasing of the supply of housing uh, and also the rolling out of housing first, for example. But um, this is something, you know, certainly an area that we are looking at, but it can't be done in isolation because the unintended consequences are there. And if you look at Scotland, where they have reduced uh, remove priority need. You can walk around Edinburgh or another city and there will be um, people sleeping on the streets and rough sleeping. So it isn't a panacea by any stretch of the imagination. It has to be a part of a larger picture. You've had since 2012 to work out the unintended consequences on this and the numbers of street sleepers is on the rise. People are becoming homeless and staying homeless because of your delay in tactics, and we need action on this now. Now, your colleague Andy Burnham in Manchester has pledged to eradicate rough sleeping by 2020, eight years sooner than your government, seven years sooner than the Tory target, and as part of that, he's spent the autumn working with local authorities to provide a bed for every rough sleeper this winter, every night, in a range of accommodation, including women-only places and places that also allow people to take their dogs. Members of the public can now download an app which they can use to direct rough sleepers to where they can have assistance. Why is this level of ambition and action possible in Manchester, but it's not possible from your government? Well, clearly you're not aware of the work that we're doing through our um, Housing First programme and also through the Rough Sleeper Action Plan, which was published last year, and the fact that we've uh, asked every single local authority in Wales to put forward a homelessness reduction plan and a, and a plan to tackle homelessness, which has a specific focus so on rough sleeping. When you look at the, um, uh, the number of places are available as compared to the number of people who are rough sleeping, actually in uh, many cases there are the beds there, but I understand that they're not attractive to the people who are rough sleeping because um, in many cases rough sleepers tell me that they don't want to go to certain places because they can't, uh, they can't be around people who are taking drugs or using alcohol or people want to stay with their dogs. Uh, people want to go as a, as a couple. So we've asked um, local authorities to address this in their housing action plans, which will be submitted to government by the end of this month. UK spokesperson Gareth Bennett. There were press reports recently which revealed that Cardiff is now the second highest council area in the whole of the UK for collecting bus lane fines. Some quarter of a million drivers were fined in the course of a year. Only only Glasgow Council, in fact, finds more drivers than Cardiff. Now, I appreciate the need to adhere to the local driving restrictions, but sometimes mistakes can be made innocently because drivers aren't familiar with an area. The RAC are saying that, with this number of people being fined, there are probably, there are probably genuine problems for drivers with things like signage and the road layouts. Do you think there is a danger that councils like Cardiff could be too punitive in collecting fines from drivers for these kind of minor driving offences? I have no responsibilities for these matters uh, raised by the member. What I will say is that it is a matter for the local authority to deliver on their responsibilities in a way that they see fit and then a matter for uh, uh, residents and electors in Cardiff to hold the council to, to account for those decisions. 
Yes, I appreciate the need for local democracy and for decisions to be made at the ballot box, as, as you indicate. But, of course, people make decisions at the ballot box based on a variety of factors, not merely whether or not they were fined for driving in a bus lane. So as you have oversight for local government in Wales, I wonder if you are perhaps alive to the possibility that there could be a danger that councils, without naming any particular council, perhaps in this instance, well, let's forget I named that council. Is there, is there a theoretical, is there, to please the minister and to, to um, perhaps, perhaps engineer a more enlightening answer, is there a theoretical possibility that councils could be uh, perhaps too punitive in collecting these kind of fines? That may theoretically be true. Uh, let, 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 let me say this to, to, to the member for South West Central, who is clearly having some difficulties with this matter. I, uh, I, I do not believe it is right and proper for ministers standing here in this place to pass comment um, upon the decisions taken by local government in uh, fulfilment of their functions. We have accountability here for decisions taken by the Welsh Government, not by individual local authorities. Yes, indeed, you are, uh, you are correct in, in stating that. Thinking about um, the issue of fines in general, as a general um, issue, we know, I think we can agree on this point, that local government is in a difficult place at the moment in terms of its finances. Is there a possibility that sometimes councils could be over punitive in many kinds of fines and they could be simply using the, the local ratepayers as cash cows? I, I will, President Officer, provide the Leader of UKIP with a list of ministerial responsibilities uh, prior to our next uh, session in this place. Um, it, I, I have been very, very clear with him and other members, to be fair, who have uh, tried equally as hard to tempt me into a terrible indiscretion. Uh, that I, 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 no, I, but I will not be tempted on this occasion to, uh, to, 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 to make comment upon the decisions of any local uh, council in any part of the country. I, it is right that and we have debated and we will debate again the difficulties facing local government in terms of um, funding arrangements and how they will um, exercise their responsibilities into the future. But I have made it uh, my policy, and I continue to make it my policy, not to comment upon the individual decisions of individual authorities. That is a matter for them, and they are accountable to their electorate, not to this place here. Question, tr Question three, John Griffiths. Does the Welsh Government encourage innovation in local government? I would encourage all authorities to innovate in their plans for improving service delivery. Innovation and creativity is always central to delivering effective and sustainable services to all of our citizens. Yes, Cabinet Secretary, I very much agree with those sentiments. And in this time of UK government imposed austerity, it's all the more important, I think, that we find these new ways of delivery uh, and indeed um, often delivering more with less. But obviously, that is quite a challenge. Uh, and in terms of local government working jointly with other key partner organisations, I wonder if you might say something about the early experience of the public service boards, and particularly how health and social care are taking forward um, joint working, uh, and more particularly, how Welsh Government has a role in identifying good practice within public service boards, because I think it is variable from one to another. How Welsh Government might identify best practice in public service boards and ensure that those lessons um, are shared across Wales? Presiding officer, I will say to, to the member for Newport East in his capacity as chair of um, the relevant committee in this place, but I'm looking forward to his report, um, his committee's report on these matters, and I will give it some, cons uh, some considerable uh, attention w w when I'm able to do so. Um, but he's right to identify public service boards as an opportunity to bring together authorities to innovate and to provide uh, new and different solutions to many of the difficulties we face. Um, I have just uh, agreed a package of support for public service boards, and I will, preside and officer, be making a statement on that matter in due course. As a part of that, I think we should be setting some very clear ambitions 
for public service boards as to what we want them to achieve. And the preventative agenda that um, the member has described is, I believe, absolutely central and critical to that role of um, public service boards. I hope that we will be able to see uh, local government working together with their colleagues in order to deliver a more profound approach to preventive services than we've seen in the past. And I think uh, public service boards are key to that, to their ability to deliver it across a particular geography. And I hope that they will be able to, as well, maximise the opportunity that um, new means and methods of working uh, uh, present, pre present to us. And I will say, presiding officer, um, the, the member, fortunately, uh, on this occasion, Lee, Lee Waters, has uh, produced an excellent uh, report on this matter in terms of digital services. And um, I'm looking Looking hard at that at the moment, and I hope that we, uh, alongside um, the, the Leader of the House and the Cabinet Secretary for Health, will be able to respond fully to the remarks and comments that he makes. Mohamed Ashka. The Cabinet Secretary, new ways of working are indispensable for sustaining the quality and scope of service delivery by local authorities faced with budget constraints. This requires the adopt adoption of innovative solutions coupled with the development of new technology. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that strong top-down leadership is required if this is to be achieved? And would he support that each council having a recognized innovation champion, since new ideas are often developed by the passion of individuals rather than a matter of process? I do agree that leadership is important, but I'm not sure I do agree that it's top-down leadership that is required. I believe that we have uh, some extremely talented people working throughout the public sector, both in local government and elsewhere, across Wales, and the working group that I described in an earlier answer um, is providing to us uh, a, a very challenging report which um, seeks to ensure that Welsh Government is able to respond fully to the challenges of technological change as well. And I hope that working together with all parts of the public sector, we'll be able to do so. Question, Question four, Dailoi. Thank you, Clare. Will the Cabinet Secretary make a statement on local government budgets? Local authorities in Wales set their budgets in the context of their medium-term financial plans based on a mix of locally raised revenue and Welsh Government provided specific grants and unhypothecated funding through the Revenue Support Grant. This year, local authority budgeted for over £7 billion of expenditure. Thank you for that answer. Now, as you would be aware, local government funding has been cut by uh, £1 billion over the last eight years. Many councils are reporting acute pressures on schools and social care. They report fatigue and low morale amongst the workforce and project the loss of a further 7,000 jobs over the next few years just to balance the books. Now, the call for necessary financial support by local authority leaders across Wales is seemingly falling on deaf ears. Are you proud of your government's role in driving local government and schools into the ground? Presiding Officer, it's, it's the easiest thing in the world for us to describe the problems facing local government. But in, on these benches, we seek to describe solutions as well. It is, in, it is an inadequate and insufficient response to the challenges we face today to simply issue a press release calling for additional funding on all areas of government's expenditure. It is an inadequate and an immature response. I will say this to the member, but I have met with all um, leaders of Welsh local government, of political leaders of Welsh local government within the last week. I've been very, very clear with them to the, the revenue ch challenges that we face. But I'll say this as well. In the future, we need to think harder about how we organise and structure our services to meet new challenges. And that is a challenge, not simply for government and the governing party, but also, I would suggest, for all parties represented in this place. Because all too often, when proposals for reform come here, we see the same people who have issued a press release saying how difficult things are, standing up and queuing up to oppose all proposals for reform. So I would hope that we will see a great deal of maturity on benches in this place when facing the challenges for local government, rather than simply listing those challenges in speeches. Susie Davis. Uh, of course, it's not easy necessarily for councils who are trying to make the most of the money that they have as well in order to regenerate their city centre, in the case of Swansea, and improve the local economy there. Um, a Cabinet report from, from the Council there last month stated that there is a risk 
that the local authority does not have sufficient resources to complete phase one of its city centre regeneration project, Swansea Central. And in response to that report, uh, the leader of Swansea Council told councillors, and I quote, that the public will shoot us, slightly unfortunate, I think, uh, referring to Swansea Council's uh, Labour Cabinet if the regeneration scheme is dropped. We all want to see Swansea City Centre thrive, and uh, you know, I, I say that even though it's a different colour council there. How, are you how can you be confident, bearing in mind the settlement that they've just had, that uh, it's able, the Cabinet there is able to manage its funds and budgets appropriately so that they can respond appropriately to such financial warnings? I've got complete confidence in the leadership of uh, Swansea City Council to, well, yes, to manage the funds it. available to it in, in, in a proper way. Um, the leadership confident. of Swansea uh, Council, I think, has, prov uh, has provided uh, almost inspirational leadership in terms of their ambitions money, for, uh, for that city and is putting in place the means of achieving that. Uh, uh, the leadership shown by, uh, by Rob Stewart as the council leader, I think, is, is an example for many other leaders to, to look at, but also the leadership shown by all those authorities in that area in terms of putting together the Swansea uh, Bay City deal. And I, I, I hope that we will see um, the, uh, those ambitions realised. But what I will say to remember for, Sw for, for South Wales West is that the greatest challenge facing Swansea is, is not the funding formula, but the policy of austerity that has meant for eight years Swansea and other local authorities in Wales have not received the level of funding that we would seek to give them. And I would suggest to, to Conservative members, rather than come here and list those problems, they should go to London and list those problems. Question, Question 5, Dylai. Uh, what assessment has the Cabinet Secretary made of the effectiveness of local authority regional working? We expect local authorities to work together to assess the effectiveness of those arrangements and where regional arrangements are required by law or Welsh Government policy, the relevant Minister has oversight of the effectiveness of those arrangements. Well, the Chyn, uh, and we both You'll be aware that local authorities in Wales often send their recyclables to facilities in England or beyond for processing. Exporting this material adds to our carbon footprint, of course, but also means that we are missing out on an opportunity for job creation. Do you agree that the Welsh Government should be doing more in terms of working with local authorities to develop regional recycling centres in Wales to ensure that all recyclable materials are dealt with here in Wales? We have for several years been working with local government and different councils to create exactly the kind of regional network that the member suggests that we put together. And that does exist in the vast majority of the nation. And I am very content with the kind of arrangements that councils have made in order to ensure that their waste materials are recycled or treated in the appropriate manner. to bring significant economic benefit to the four local authority areas covered. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that these projects have the potential to bring major employment opportunities across the region? And does he also agree with me that this sort of collaboration, if done in the right way, could be seen as a blueprint of local authorities effectively working together in the future, and it would therefore not require forced mergers as he, as he originally wanted? I do support um, the collaborative approach that the member for uh, Priscelli has outlined. I, it is important for local authorities of whatever size or shape to be able to work together with their neighbours to deliver the sort of ambition that he and I would probably agree on in terms of the, um, the Swansea Bay City deal. However, the, the issues on mergers or structures within local authorities are slightly different, of course, and that is about the sustainability of uh, those, uh, those units of governance. Um, it is my view and the view of local government that the current structures are not sustainable uh, I I into the future. So therefore, as a minister, it is my responsibility to ensure that those facts are put in front of this place and uh, local government and that we are able to move towards a conclusion on that. But I will say to the member that it is right and proper that he then supports those proposals to ensure that his electorate and all our electorates have the quality of services they require and that local authorities are sustainable into the future. 
Mike Hedges. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I first of all say I agree with everything that Paul Davis just said? Uh, the other point I would, uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree it is important that all public services work within the same regional footprint? Which is true of the Cardiff City region, but not true of the Swansea City, Bay City region. And the importance of ensuring that local authorities get used to working together. And the four local authorities in South West Wales may have different political leadership, but have shown great leadership in the area in working together. I do believe that um, at times we make government too complex. I think I've made that very clear both here and elsewhere. I believe that we need to look for uh, a clarity both in the way in which we structure the delivery of our services, but of course also the way in which we structure the account public accountability for the delivery of those services. So I do believe that, um, uh, we, do, that we need to ensure that we have um, a, a, a regional footprint, footprint that is understandable, not simply to those of us who have to work with it, but also to the electorates that, that, that we all serve. But I do not believe that that in itself is a sufficient response to some of the challenges we will face in the future. Uh, we, we, we will all be aware of the financial um, difficulties facing local government today, but we also know that Brexit and other issues mean that they will face even more difficult decisions in the future. And so we do have a responsibility to think hard about that future and to put in place structures that are sustainable in the future. Question six, Julie Morgan. Services in Wales. Members may recall that I commissioned the development of blueprints for youth justice and for female offenders. I have shared these blueprints with members of the Cabinet, and I hope, Presiding Officer, to be able to provide, updates with, uh, provide members with an update in the next week or so. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response and look forward to um, uh, reading the updates. Um, the latest safety figures published in October uh, reveal that the number of self-harm incidents in prisons in Wales are rising, and that, of course, includes Park and the Young Offenders um, Institution there, um, where I believe there have been a staggering number of incidents already this year, 777 incidents between January and June. Um, can the Cabinet Secretary provide an update on Park's plan to employ behaviour anal analysts to improve safety levels? I have visited uh, HMP Park and the um, Youth Offenders Institution within um, the prison. I have discussed these matters with the director there. Um, H, uh, Her Majesty's Prison and Probation Service have confirmed that there are behavioural management analysts in Park who are working towards reducing self-harm and violence within the prison. However, I believe we need to go further. Than this. I believe that we need a distinct uh, penal policy for Wales, which looks in the first instance at the issues around young of youth offending and female offending, and that we need to look both at, the, uh, at investment within the secure estate, but also critically a holistic approach to policy that seeks to reduce uh, offending, to enhance rehabilitation, and to ensure that women particularly are not treated in the way they are today. David Melding. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, a little while ago, the uh, Ministerial Advisory Group on Outcomes for, from children, for Children um, received a presentation from Lord Laming and his uh, review in the, uh, into youth criminal justice system and the uh, alarming discovery that uh, uh, looked after children were much more likely to come into contact with the youth justice system compared to their peers, often because those involved, the uh, uh, police, teachers uh, and the courts, uh, uh, it assumed a certain response was appropriate for looked after children, which they wouldn't have uh, from, uh, uh, for children uh, from other backgrounds. And uh, this inbuilt bias is obviously really very uh, worrying. It's an excellent review and a very compassionate one. And I do hope that all relevant agencies are taken on board the recommendations that are contained in that review. I, I agree very much with the conclusions uh, from the member for, for South Wales uh, Central. Um, I, I did meet with Charlie Taylor, Chair of the Youth Justice Board, um, in the last few weeks to discuss uh, uh, these matters um, with him and how we approach uh, youth offending. The, the, the analysis that the members described is absolutely correct and one which I believe is an emergency that we need to address. Uh, I, I hope that, by, uh, that, that when he reads the blueprint, uh, uh, when, when it is published, which I hope will be next week, 
then he would be reassured that we are doing so. I would certainly very, very, be very happy to attend the cross-party group to discuss these matters in more detail, uh, if, if he wishes me to do so. But the, the burden of my um, analysis is that I believe we need to take a far more holistic approach to policy. The broken settlement we have in Wales at the moment is an impediment to that, and I would like to see the devolution of the penal system and criminal justice to Wales to enable us to develop and deliver exactly that holistic approach to policy. I share the concerns that have been outlined here uh, by the findings of the recent Wales Governance Centre report into violence and self-harm in youth institutions. You were responsible for uh, youth justice services, but of course the other services that are, uh, operate within Park Prison are adult services, and that falls within the remit of Westminster. So what we really need is to see the criminal justice system devolved. Now, that's something that Plaid Cymru has been calling for for as long as I can remember. And it's nice to see that some of our political opponents have come on board now with that argument. Will this government remain committed to the Commission on Justice in Wales under the next uh, First Minister? And has your government managed to persuade your Labour Party colleagues in Westminster of the case for the devolution of the criminal justice system to Wales? Because there were a block of MPs from the Labour Party who I found to be every bit as devo sceptic as some of the Tories during my dealings with them over the part two of the Silk Commission. Despite the best efforts of a member from the Rhonda, I do believe we actually agree on far more than, uh, than, than perhaps uh, she, she would believe. Um, th this government is absolutely committed to the devolution of um, policing and criminal justice to this place to and to the, creation, to the creation of a holistic approach to policy. Um, we created, uh, at, at the request of the police, a policing board for Wales, which met uh, last month for the first time, and we're working well together with the police. I've met with um, the Home Office on a number of occasions to pursue these matters, and I've met with ministers in the Ministry of Justice to pursue these matters as well. It is my view that the, that the um, matters that we're discussing this afternoon are best addressed by this place in a holistic way. That is the view of this government, and that will continue to be the view of this government. Questions. Question 7, Joyce Watson. Secretary, to provide an update on what the Welsh Government is doing to support veterans in Mid and West Wales. We have made tremendous in, uh, progress in improving services and support for veterans, which includes those living in Mid and West Wales. I hope the Member will agree that my, my recent statement on these matters highlighted that. Uh, I do indeed uh, welcome your recent statement, and I do also believe that ex servicemen and women have done their duty by our country, that we in turn then owe them something back, not least how they return to civilian life. And part of that is, of course, trying to find work. But meaningful employment, I think, is pivotal to that journey, and also uh, findings that they will, it will support their mental health. So I'd like to uh, ask you, uh, Cabinet Secretary, if you could tell us some more about the employment pathway that you just said you announced yesterday. President, officer, members will be aware that we launched the um, employment pathway um, in partnership with the Armed Forces Expert Group, which consists of representatives of public and third sectors, as well as military charities, and including the Department for Work and Pensions. It provides uh, op options for veterans and service leavers on where to find support and information to secure employment relevant to them. I should also say to members that prior to my duties here today, I launched the uh, a new toolkit for employers alongside business in the community and others to complement the employment pathway. This is, seeks to ensure that employers themselves uh, understand the benefits of employing former service personnel and to ensure that they are able to deliver the best opportunities for employment for all those leaving our services. Russell George. And last month, the Welsh Government voted against the Welsh Conservative proposals to create an Armed Forces Commissioner for Wales to ensure that the Armed Forces Covenant is upheld. Will the Cabinet Secretary reconsider the Welsh Government's opposition to the creation of the post to ensure that the new cross-government strategy uh, for veterans in the UK can be delivered effectively? No. 
Helen Mary Jones. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that veterans are often overrepresented in the homeless population. Um, and in Mid and West Wales and rural communities, these people are perhaps less likely to end up actually rough sleeping, but are very often in very insecure, um, a kind of sofa surfing, sort of second from one family member to another situations. What discussions have you and your colleagues had with local authorities in Mid and West Wales to ensure that this kind of hidden homelessness amongst the veteran population is addressed? One of the reasons why I was very anxious uh, to ensure that we do um, fulfil our responsibilities under the Covenant is to deliver um, resources to the front line where they are needed. So we will be spending um, a considerable resource um, supporting the local authority liaison officers uh, network across Wales, which delivers support um, for, uh, for all service personnel, um, both in terms of housing and, and in, in, in other um, terms as well. So I hope we will be able to work with local authorities to ensure that, people, that local authorities are able to deliver exactly the services that the member for Mid and West Wales describes. And for me, and certainly for um, those people that I'm talking to at the moment, they want to see that level of uh, resource there delivering services for people. As we've heard in, uh, many times during this session this afternoon on the challenges facing local government in terms of delivering services, it is therefore incumbent on all of us to look at how we can deliver those resources onto the front line to ensure that people do have the services that they need and require. And that, presiding officer, was the point I made in reply to the Conservatives about the request to create a commissioner. What we want to do is to put money on the front line and not create further bureaucracy here. It is a matter for members here to hold uh, ministers to account for, for the decisions we take and the services we deliver. And that level of democratic accountability, I think, is important. Can I ask a question? Only question eight, Neil Hamilton. Will the Cabinet Secretary provide an update on the local government settlement for Pembrokeshire County Council? I published a provisional local government settlement for 2019-20 on the 9th of October. The government announced further funding for local government on the 20th of November. The final settlement will be announced on the 19th of December. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. When I raised this question a year ago, Pembrokeshire was being forced to raise its council tax by 12.5%, the highest rise in Wales. This year, uh, the draft budget was presented on Monday, as a result of which council tax is set to rise by another 10 per cent, and there are going to be £15.5 million pounds worth of cuts in services. Prior to the budget being set, the senior officers in Pembrokeshire had warned that council tax would need to rise by 28 per cent in order to meet service needs. Um, Pembrokeshire is being penalised by the current local government uh, uh, settlement. Um, and there seems to be no incentive for economical councils to continue to be economical because the higher your council tax is, the more you get from the Welsh Government. Um, so uh, can I add to the plea from Helen Mary Jones earlier on that this settlement uh, system um, formula should be reconsidered because it's not just rural councils that are... Um, penalised in this way, but any economical council is bound to be, because the higher uh, your council tax is, the higher the financial needs estimations are, and consequently the higher the grants from the Welsh Government, which does seem to be perverse. I, I did uh, notice the comments made by the, the leader of Pembrokeshire County Council on these matters in, um, in a newspaper recently. I will say to him and to the member for Mid West Wales that Pembrokeshire County Council has taken a number of decisions over its council tax levels over a number of years in full knowledge of the consequences of those decisions. And it is a matter for the electorate of um, Pembrokeshire to determine whether those decisions were correct or not, and not a matter for me. What I do not believe that is that either the professional or the political leadership of Pembrokeshire can take those decisions and then turn around to media and say that they have no idea of the consequences of those decisions. Whenever we take political decisions, there are consequences. And Pembrokeshire has taken decisions to re reduce its, its council tax in relative terms over a number of years. It has the lowest council tax in Wales. And, that, and as a consequence of that, they're now facing difficulties in their budget. That is a matter for that authority and for the electorate of Pembrokeshire. I thank the Cabinet Secretary. The next item is the topical questions. And the first question 
to be, is to be asked to the Cabinet Secretary for Education. The question comes from Susie Davis. Uh, with a recent Eston report stating that secondary, in schools, uh, secondary schools in Wales could do better, with only half currently judged as good or excellent, what work will the Welsh Government undertake to ensure that standards are raised across all secondary schools in Wales? Our national mission sets out clearly our plan to raise standards for all young people in all of our schools. We are delivering record investment to support teacher development, to support our most disadvantaged learners and to enhance <coughs> leadership capacity and good practice across the system. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that answer, Cabinet Secretary. And uh, I think perhaps I should just begin by acknowledging that Estin does say that they're, that they're happy that there's been progress in the primary sector. But I think it would be a betrayal of those young people if they then move on to schools in which the majority of pupils, and I mean the majority, um, across the age and ability range continue to fail to develop from skills and knowledge well enough or make enough progress or struggle to think independently or feel responsible for their own learning. Obviously, you're taking those quotes from the Eston report. Uh, and uh, with, uh, with half of schools underperforming, and um, a suggestion by Estin that the gap between well-performing schools and those that are not uh, performing well are likely to widen. Um, I'd be grateful if you could give us a little bit more detail about what you're planning to do, because Donaldson will not be biting until 2022. That's almost a school generation away, and you cannot sacrifice this current cohort uh, to another period of inadequacy. And I think you'd be the first to say that if you were sitting on any of the benches other than the front bench in this place. So firstly, um, the schools that are in special measures or in, are still in need of a significant improvement. I asked you what action you'd taken on these back in September, and you reeled off a list of actions, but admitted that you'd not exercised your powers under the School Standards Act to intervene with schools. Bearing in mind the results of this report, I'm wondering if you would now be prepared to do that. Uh, for some of the students, um, the, a third of the schools that Eston investigated, they saw that pupils were disengaged, had little interest in their work, they would disrupt the learning of others and that some year 12 students had a lack of critical and independent learning skills, meaning that they were struggling with their A-levels and actually dropping out in year 12. There's a, I think there's a significant number of students here who are failing to meet their potential as their independent and critical learning capabilities have not been developed earlier in their education. And what worries me about this, Cabinet Secretary, is that those students could be internalising this as their own failure, when actually it's a failure of their education. Um, it's clear that um, some of these schools need the support that they're not getting at the moment. Now, after Consortia, Schools to Challenge Cymru and Academy Wales, which talks all about leadership, um, I don't think they've been giving you the results you were hoping for. So what can you do next to ensure that this year's Year 7 pupils um, progress towards meeting their potential rather than, I don't know, getting static or even slumping? Can you tell us what the, what the updated plans are for your National Academy for Educational Leadership? Um, that's an idea that the Welsh Conservatives were very interested in themselves. And will you share with us the answers of, to the searching questions, which you will undoubtedly be asking the consortia on the back of this Estin report, um, why they have not prompted the seed change that we might have expected in most schools, um, especially as you've been content to give them an extra £5 million in year as a result of um, uh, uh, space in the budget. I mean, I'm very keen to hear about what happens to our pupils now, not after 2022. Thank you. I welcome very much the Chief Inspector's uh, annual report for 2017-2018. I'm looking forward to studying the report in more detail and, of course, will formally respond in the plenary date, which I understand presiding officer is provisionally scheduled for the 19th of February of next uh, year. Uh, I'm, glad that the member, I'm glad that the member uh, has acknowledged the uh, progress that has been made in the primary sector, but I would be the first person to say that progress in our secondary sector is not good enough. And I say it not just because I'm on these benches, I say it as a parent who has children in the system herself. I want all of our children to attend a good or excellent secondary school here in Wales. And our approach is to support all schools to be good and excellent, rather than the approach that we saw very much in operation yesterday across the border, when £50 million was announced to support just 16 highly selective secondary schools. That's the difference between the approach of this government and the approach that the Tories would take, picking off certain schools and certain children to support, whereas we want all of our schools to do well. Now, let me be absolutely, let me be absolutely 
clear what we are doing. The inspection report yesterday says we need to do more to support our teaching profession. That's why we will spend £24 million over the next 18 months in supporting the professional learning of our staff. That is the single biggest investment in Welsh teachers since devolution. And we are determined to make sure that all our practitioners in every classroom is as good as they can be. The Eston report also rightly pointed to disparities in the quality of leadership in our system. That's why we have <laughs> established the National Academy for Educational <laughs> Leadership. And to, to, to be fair, Susie, that is less than a year old. And to say that it has not delivered is simply not fair That's on those I'm people that are working very, very, very hard to ensure that our leaders, our new and our aspiring head teachers, are as good as they could be. For me, what is absolutely critical is that by the time a school is put into a category by ESTIN, either in special measures or significant improvement, that is too late. Both local authorities and regional consortia should know their schools well enough that when they suspect a school is struggling to meet the needs of their pupils, they are able to intervene earlier, and we should not let it get to the stage of needing an ESTIN inspection report to say that that school needs extra help. I am currently considering options of what more we can do to intervene earlier in schools that are potentially are not meeting the needs of their children, are struggling to cope, and are causing concern. At the moment, local authorities have the statutory responsibility for monitoring those schools, and for schools where there are those concerns, I expect local authorities to take prompt action. If they need more help to do so, either by Welsh Government or by the regional consortia, I will make that help available. Thank you. Um, however challenging the situation is in Wales, it's uh, nowhere near as challenging for pupils in England, where schools that have been found to be in special measures are simply being hung out to dry because they are obliged to be taken over by academies and academies are simply walking away and they don't even get inspected by HMI. So it's absolutely ridiculous for people on the Conservative benches to say uh, that our situation is not, uh, not to recognise that our situation is so much better. Um, I think the Eston report is a very good guide to um, what, look, what good practice looks like and which um, is a in a very readable form for all um, school leaders to be able to access. Um, I, and, I, and it's absolutely not true that, um, that uh, half the schools are failing. Um, what I want, I have one concern which is around the paucity of excellent early years provision because this may seem a very long way from secondary school education but actually that is where we can really begin to tackle um, the disadvantage of deprivation. Uh, it's excellent we now have four um, uh, early years provision uh, which is deemed excellent but uh, which is you know a great is four more than last year but we obviously need many more. Um, but in terms of the um, um, supporting uh, excellence in our secondary school teaching. Um, I wondered if, in your response to the Eston report, you might uh, reconsider restoring the school's challenge Cymru, because am I, I'm not the only person on these benches who thinks that either they were dismantled before they'd had time to embed the sharing of good practice that is very clearly evident in many of our secondary schools and needs to be shared, particularly with those schools who are facing the most challenges. Because um, we saw what, what, how excellent and how transformative it was in London. And um, I, so therefore, I wondered if you would consider that. Uh, the uh, evidence to note from uh, the Schools Challenge programme in Wales was mixed. Uh, undoubtedly, there are some schools that benefited from participation uh, in that programme. Uh, there are some schools that, despite uh, considerable extra financial resource and support, have failed to make the progress that we would have liked to have seen. And again, uh, one of the challenges around school, uh, Schools Challenge Company <coughs> is that that support was limited to a single group of schools rather than a national approach to schools that are causing uh, concern. Uh, you will be uh, aware, uh, I'm sure, Jenny, of the interesting proposals that have been put forward by Graham Donaldson in his review of Eston the Inspectorate. Uh, makes it, there is some commentary 
about how we can improve the situation for schools that find themselves in categorisation or in special measures. For too many of those schools, the support that is available to them to make rapid uh, improvement uh, is not uh, consistent and it is not uh, what I would want it to be. And I continue to discuss with Estin about what more we can do to support those schools that find themselves in uh, categorisation. Uh, are, we are aware of some crucial uh, elements that can make a real uh, difference to improving schools' performance rapidly uh, if they find themselves in that situation. But as I said, a school that has to wait for a formal categorisation by, by Estin has waited too long for support. We need to work with our local authorities and with our regional school improvement services to better understand how we can identify problems earlier and how we can provide assistance uh, to those schools uh, before Estin comes in and says that they need uh, to improve. I thank the Cabinet Secretary. The next item is the 90-second statement. Vicky Howells. Wednesday, the 7th of December, 1938. Thousands of people gathered at the pavilion in Mountain Ash, including my very own grandmother, who would regale the family for many years afterwards about the amazing and talented superstar that she saw there. They came to attend a Welsh National Memorial Meeting and concert in honour of 33 members of the International Brigade from Wales, men who had given their lives fighting against fascism in defence of democracy in the Spanish Civil War. And appearing at that concert was the famous American artist and actor Paul Robeson. Robeson, the son of a former slave, was a skilled sportsman and academic, but he chose to pursue a career in the arts, winning plaudits for his roles on stage and screen. The 1930s saw Robeson's increasing association with political causes, and central to this was his support for the Republican side in Spain. Robeson regarded this as a turning point in his life. Speaking at a benefit concert for Spanish refugees, he proclaimed, the artist must take sides. He must elect to fight for freedom or slavery. The decade also saw Robeson forging lifelong links with the mining communities of South Wales. He performed in miners' clubs, sang for the miners' relief funds, and starred in Proud Valley. Just as the Spanish Civil War shaped his activism, so did his association with these communities. And on Friday, 80 years since the Pavilion concert, I'll be opening an exhibition at Mountain Ash Workman's Club to celebrate this historic event and a truly remarkable transatlantic association between Robeson and the South Wales miners. Hello, Mary Jones. Yesterday we said goodbye to Professor Mike Sullivan, Director of Swansea University's Morgan Academy, Socialist and Welshman. Mike grew up in a working-class family in Risca, the first in his family to go to university. Graduating from Oxford, he worked as a social worker before starting a distinguished academic career, first in Cardiff, then in Swansea. He served here as a Labour Special Advisor during the period of the One Wales Government, ensuring the passage of the best possible version of the Rights of Children and Young Persons measure. After his return to Swansea, Mike was pivotal in raising the university's international profile, initiating the relationship with Secretary Clinton, he found, and he founded the Morgan Academy, named for Rodri Morgan. Mike was warm and compassionate, but he could be steely when he needed to be. His passion for social justice and for Wales informed all that he did. He had a great gift for friendship, and I know so with that there are many in this chamber who were proud to call him their friend. Mike died too soon. He is survived by his wife Jane, their son Kieran, and his stepchildren, and their loss is incalculable. For those of us who knew him, Mike's life will inspire us as we work to build the Wales and the world that he believed was possible. And with his beloved university beset at present by troubles, we vow to protect his legacy. Bethan Syed. 
week is Lifelong Learning Platform's Lifelong Learning Week. This is a pan-European civil society for education, which is using this week to bring together partners from across Europe to encourage and talk about ideas to foster lifelong learning. With our future in the European Union currently uncertain, I hope that Wales can continue to play a role in European engagement platforms such as this one. Exchanging ideas and visions in this area can help us understand what works best in other nations and how it can work here too. We can learn from smaller fellow countries which have seen success in improving and developing a lifelong learning framework which is truly cradle to grave. In previous generations, the pattern of life was often school, career, retirement. This is not the case anymore, and in a world where we face challenges from automation, competition from around the world, and a flexible and fast-evolving economy, we must put an emphasis on learning and training at any age, and constantly promote a mindset which emphasises that nobody is ever too old to learn a new skill or to take up a new interest. The Lifelong Learning Platform believes that the objective of education and training should not only be described in terms of employability or economic growth, but also as a framework for personal development and to promote active <coughs> citizenship and engagement. Going forward, regardless of our position in Europe, I think it's vital for us to support and fund a lifelong learning here in Wales so that we can support this vital asset for our nation. The next item is the debate on the Standards of Conduct Committee's report to the Assembly, Understanding Order 22.9. And I call on the Chair of the Committee to move the motion, Jane Bryant. Um, as, as Chair of the Standards of Conduct Committee, I formally move the motion. The Committee considered the report from the Commissioner for Standards in relation to a complaint made against Gareth Bennett AM. The complaint regarded his failure to comply with the rules and guidance on the use of Assembly resources and bringing the Assembly into disrepute, which is a breach of the Code of Conduct. The Standards of Conduct Committee gave the Commissioner's report careful consideration, and our report sets out the Committee's judgment as to the sanction that is appropriate in this case. The facts related to the complaint and the Committee's reasons for its recommendations are set out full in the Committee's report. The motion tabled invites the Assembly to endorse the Committee's recommendations. Dustin. There are no speakers in this debate, so I take it that the Member does not wish to reply to the debate. The proposal is to note the Committee's report. Does any Member object? The motion is therefore agreed in accordance with Standing Order 12.36, which brings us to the next item, which is the Welsh Conservatives' debate on Welsh Government performance. And I call on Paul Davis to move the motion. Paul Davis. On the eve of learning the identity of the new Welsh Labour Party leader, it is timely to reflect on the performance of the Welsh Government under the leadership of the current First Minister, the successes, the failures and the lessons for the future. It will be up for others to cast judgment on the First Minister's legacy, but today I want to focus specifically on policy and the burgeoning gap between promises and delivery. For eight and a half of the First Minister's nine years, there has been a Conservative Prime Minister in Downing Street, and for Ministers here, the temptation to play party politics has been too great. Too often, the First Minister has played the role of leader of the opposition to the UK Government, rather than acting as a leader of a government here in Wales. In Labour's campaign for the 2011 Assembly election, devolved areas barely got a mention, as they were keen to take advantage of low levels of public awareness of what the Welsh Government's responsibilities were. Now, of course, it would be churlish not to acknowledge that there have been some successes in the past nine years and areas of agreement between the parties. The 5p carry bag charge introduced with cross-party support has helped change shoppers' behaviour and has reduced the number of single-use carrier bags in circulation. The children's rights measure and the food hygiene rating system were also introduced in the past nine years. All parties worked together on the successful referendum on further lawmaking powers for the Assembly, a decision which was followed by the devolution of taxation, empowering this chamber to make better decisions for the people of Wales. Both those successes have been, I'm afraid, few and far between. The Welsh Government's record since 2009 is sadly one of failure and missed opportunities. 
and no more disastrously than in the National Health Service. Despite campaigning on a leadership manifesto promising to protect health spending, Carwyn Jones became the only leader of any modern political party in the UK to inflict real terms cuts to the NHS. Carwyn Jones's first budget as First Minister took half a billion pounds out of the Welsh NHS. By 2014, the health budget had lost almost 8% in real terms, equating to £1 billion. The NHS has still not recovered from the legacy of Labour's budget cuts. Today, health boards are facing a record combined deficit of £167.5 million. The impact on waiting times and standards has been devastating. In December 2009, no patient in Wales was waiting any longer than 36 weeks from diagnosis to the start of treatment. Yet today, that figure, figure stands at 13,673. Of these, more than 4,000 patients are currently waiting more than a year for surgery. When Karen Jones took office, 224,960 patients were waiting in the queue to start treatment. That queue was doubled to 443,789 patients. In nine years, some key performance targets have not been met once. The target for 95% of accident and emergency patients to be seen within four hours has not been met since 2009, and performance is getting worse. In October this year, only 80% were seen within four hours, and at Wrexham Myler Hospital, that figure was just 54%, the worst on record. Shockingly, the number of patients waiting over 12 hours to be seen in A&E has risen by 4,000% since 2009. Earlier this year, the Royal College of Emergency Medicine described the situation in A&E in Wales as dire and horrific, with an experience for patients which is unsafe, undignified and distressing. Capacity in the NHS has shrunk, with the number of beds falling year on year to the lowest on record today. 2,000 fewer beds than in 2009, and in some health boards, the bed occupancy rate is breaching safe limits on a daily basis. This decline in NHS performance has coincided with Welsh Government decisions to, to, con to continue to downgrade and centralise NHS services, forcing patients to travel further for vital care and putting even more pressure on retained services. NHS cuts, closures and downgrades. That's what we've seen since December 2009. Now, a commitment was made by the First Minister during his leadership campaign to spend 1% above the block grant on education every year until the per pupil funding gap between Wales and England had been eliminated. Nine years on and the funding gap still remains and the education budget is 7.9% smaller in real terms than it was in 2011. In 10 years to 2016, 157 schools closed, mainly in rural Wales, and across the country today, 40% of schools are facing a budget deficit. This is despite the fact that the Welsh Government receives £1.20 for every £1 spent on schools in England. GCSE performance has deteriorated since 2009, with the gold standard of five A star to C grades falling this year to its lowest level since 2005. Wales has declined in the OECD's PISA tests with worse scores in reading, maths and science with the most recent results placing Wales in the bottom half of the OECD ranking and ranked the worst in the UK. Targets and timescales to improve Wales's education system position have all been quietly dropped, ditched and changed to cover the tracks of failure. Under the current First Minister's watch, another target for Wales to reach 90% of UK average GVA by 2010 was dropped. Wales still has seen the lowest wage growth of any UK nation. Opportunities to create the conditions for Indigenous small business growth and greater inward investment have been missed in favour of trying to control and overtax business. The Welsh Government's business rates regime has led to Wales having the UK's highest high street vacancy rate, with too many vacant and boarded up premises. Wales is now the most expensive part of the UK in which to do business. However, it is good to see from yesterday's comments in the budget debate that the Welsh Government is finally listening to our calls for action on this. Nevertheless, this Labour Government still fails to recognise that low tax economies are more vibrant, more competitive <laughs> and actually generate more revenue because of the greater viability of setting up a business. Creating the conditions in which businesses can prosper and investors are attracted to set up in Wales should have been a far greater priority over the last nine years to generate growth and increase prosperity <laughs> levels. Labour has failed to deliver a fit-for-purpose public transport network, so there remains no proper alternative to the car. 
The jury is still out on the success or otherwise of the new franchise, although it's fair to say its start has been at best shaky. Numerous major road projects have been delayed by ministerial dithering, while many of those which did get built fell victim to massive overspends, including the heads of the valley duelling. Inadequate mobile signals and broadband infrastructure are still a problem given the slow progress on addressing not spots. Creating the conditions for economic growth would have gone some way to tackling cyclical poverty, which still blights too many of our communities. The flagship pledge to eradicate child poverty was dropped, while evidence shows that the hundreds of millions of pounds that poured into communities first had no impact on prosperity levels, and after 20 years of labour, these communities remain as poor as ever. The current First Minister has made home ownership further out of reach for many, including denying social housing tenants the right to buy their property. House building has been constrained by red tape, creating a housing supply crisis which has driven up prices and made getting a step on the property ladder more difficult. Sadly, this has been a government which spent billions treating the symptoms of poverty rather than properly investing in the preventative agenda to give the next generation better prospects than the last. The last nine years have been blighted by mismanagement, particularly in Betsy Cadwallad University Health Board, yes. not to mention the RIFU and AWIMA scandals. By indecision and inaction over business rate reform, the M4 relief road and a lack of house building, and by poor decision making, cutting the NHS budget and scrapping the right to buy. For the sake of the three million people we serve, Wales needs original ideas, a fresh approach and new leadership. <coughs> While I wish the First Minister well for the future, I am more convinced than ever that to fulfil its true potential, Wales needs a new government, and I urge yeah. members to support our motion. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I have selected the amendment to the motion, and I call on the Leader of the House and the Chief Whip to move formally the amendment tabled in her own name. Formally. Thank you. Um, Rhun Ap Yawedd. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I understand, of course, what would motivate the Conservatives to table a motion such as this one. We're approaching the end of the tenure of the current First Minister. We could have introduced a list of failings ourselves, but I think it says a great deal about the Conservatives that in this lengthy list there is no reference to child poverty, homelessness, carbon emissions and so on and so forth. The Welsh Government through its amendment responds in the way that we perhaps would have expected, listing a long list of statistics without any context or statistics that have been used, let's talk plainly here, in a way that's misleading, and that's to justify their actions. I can refer to the 20,000 affordable homes that they refer to. Of course, that includes homes sold through Help to Buy Wales, where a third of the homes have been sold at over £200,000, which can't be categorised as affordable, however you look at it. So we'll leave the Conservatives and the Government to play ping-pong today. We will abstain in this vote, but I will take this opportunity to make a few of my own comments. Not in listing in the unimaginative way that the Conservatives have done, but I will look at some of the fundamental factors which are problematic in the way that Labour under this current First Minister have sought to govern Wales. They are patterns and themes which emerge regularly, which have been highlighted in a series of committee reports by the Auditor General and by the various commissions and task and finish groups that the government itself has established to mask its lack of action, and I'll start with all of those task and finish groups and review panels, many of them unnecessarily, and they are put in place time and time again as a delaying tactic to avoid making decisions. Let's look at homelessness and the scrapping of priority need, which is now the subject of another review. Well, why another review? 
the government commissioned Cardiff University to review homelessness law in 2012, and the recommendation was to scrap priority need, and nothing has happened. And what happens is that people in this cold winter are still sleeping rough and dying on our streets because of delays by the government in making decisions. There are other themes, targets. There is reference in the motion and in the government's amendments to targets. Well, we can see what's happening in terms of those targets. The government's targets, time and time again, are set lower than England and Scotland. They're still missed, by the way, and that's in an attempt to make the government look as though they were performing well. There's a lack of ambition. That's the core problem here, I think. Take the government's claim in its amendment that almost 9 in 10 patients in Wales are treated within 26 weeks. Well, the figure, the real figure, is 77% on average over the past two years, according to stats Wales. It's not 9 in every 10 in Scotland and England. 18 weeks is the target, and at least in Scotland, almost 9 in 10 patients do truly start their treatment within 18 weeks. Another problem, the government's unwillingness to learn from good practice. The Williams Commission stated that good practice travels poorly within this government. How many times have we heard about good practice on a small scale which haven't been rolled out. Now, I could go on. Time is short, but one thing that struck me earlier this afternoon, one of the fundamental problems of this government is its unwillingness to lead. This government follows far too often. And I heard a Cabinet Secretary speaking earlier about his staunch support for the devolution of policing and justice. Well, I'm delighted that the government supports that now. But they're behind the curve, as always. We in Plaid Cymru are pleased, in a way, of seeing the government following us and supporting our views on that issue or on a taxation on sugary drinks, but it's very frustrating to see the government missing these opportunities to make a real difference to the lives of people. The Conservatives, well, bring your own ideas to the table too. A, list, a negative list such as this one, without proposing any alternatives, never looks any good in the view of the public. Susie Davis. It is the, uh, the legacy of the First Minister that's uh, in the spotlight today. Um, it's only this week we've produ produced our own policy on, house, on, on um, how to improve housing and provision for that in Wales. So you can't say that we're not we're without ideas. Just, just today is not the day for them. You'll be getting plenty from us in the next couple of years, don't you worry about that. Um, predictably, of course, had the, the First Minister himself been here today, he would have... Uh, tried to respond to the uh, deficiencies in his government just by blaming uh, the UK government. But education has been thoroughly devolved for the last 20 years. And actually, and I think I'll probably be more likely to get it from you, Leader of the House, um, I'd rather hear an analysis of what you think has gone right or wrong on his watch when it comes to education. Um, I can quickly talk about money because there is a connection there with uh, the UK government. Uh, and, of course, the Welsh government's well-oiled Weedle of not having enough money. We say you're on your funding increase. You say real term cuts. Uh, but both positions prompt the question on how Welsh Government has chosen to spend what it does get on giving children the first chance of a better future. In his leadership campaign, the First Minister recognised that education in Wales was getting a poor deal from his own government at that point, and it wasn't the UK. His pitch included a commitment, and I quote, to spend 1% above the block grant every year until we reach a situation where we have parity of funding per head per, of pupil, uh, per pupil in England. Well, we still don't have that parity of funding per pupil nine years later, and England's own figures have dropped in the meantime. What we have had in that time, uh, certainly in the time I've been here, is a 7.9% a real terms decrease, and it's you that like the real term figures, in the gross budgeted expenditure for education, and a 7.5 real terms cut in per pupil spend. You get 20% more to spend per person than in England, yet for years you have spent less per pupil than England. That is undeniable. And we're now in a place where Labour councils are saying that they are no longer in a position to protect school spending. 
Welsh Government had nine years to keep that promise on which the First Minister was elected, first as leader of his party and then as leader of the nation. And that is a promise that has not been kept. On his own terms, that is a failure. But education is not just about money, um, in case anyone was thinking that. It is about a, um, a wider culture as uh, competitive standards, the creation of a, an ambitious and fulfilled workforce, including educators themselves. And most of all, resilient, healthy, creative children and adults who are interested in this world and want to contribute to it to the best of their abilities. And while Welsh Government needs money, of course, uh, the success of education is every bit as much about the philosophy and the policy direction. And the effects of years uh, of Labour policy, well, we've rehearsed them many times. Uh, uh, Paul Davis mentioned some of them for the fourth time in a decade. Uh, we're behind the other UK nations on PISA results, most recent be even worse than 2009, specifically in reading, maths and science. And this year's A to C grades at GCSE, uh, which were down again on last year itself, the lowest year of achievement since 2006. It was maths, English, biology, chemistry and physics, as well as Welsh language, mirroring uh, those PISA results despite being measured in a completely different way. Uh, 45 education institutions across Wales in special measures or in need of significant improvement. One there for four years. As Estyn says in yesterday's report, despite various initiatives, including banding and categorisation, not enough is done to support them, meaning these schools, or develop sustainable strategies for schools. And with so much effort and money going into these various initiatives, especially on standards. You know, we're talking about regional consortia, schools challenge. Cymru, Jenny Rathbone was talking about that earlier. Why are more than half our secondary schools still stuck with inspection reports that aren't good or excellent? Now, this is a year-on-year -year failure in the time that I've been in this place. Thousands of children and young people whose parents and grandparents went through an education system envied and respected, not just in the UK, but around the world. And those children are now denied the same privilege because they've been run by a Labour administration yeah, yeah, yeah. with its eye off the ball, a belated mea culpa from the First Minister and a bureaucratic approach to raising standards. It will not be enough to say that more young people have GCSEs or their equivalent in the 1990s. Not only is that true of the rest of the UK, but the rest of the UK has done a stellar job in comparison. And I have come to this portfolio to face a tsunami of reviews, a tsunami of reviews on which, if by the way, if you want more money, I don't know where the Education Secretary is at the moment, get your act together on the read review. There is plenty of money waiting for us there if you follow those uh, recommendations. But I think these record reviews is a sign that Welsh Government accepts that you've got a very long, very wrong, but a very long time and that you need to start from scratch. It's certainly what it feels like. So for our young people and their future though, a change of party leader doesn't meet a change in substance. All the reviews in the world won't change a thing with the same dead hand on the tiller of the sinking ship that is Labour Wales. Thank you. Cross, Susie. Michelle Brown. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I support this motion. Under Labour, the people of Wales have had to endure a crumbling health service, a failing education system, and economic and local government policies that make no business sense whatsoever. Once again, Labour have, ta Labour have tabled a series of amendments that show they're in complete denial about the problems they have caused, and regrettably, I have to say that it's their propensity to indulge in denial that causes many of these problems to go unchecked. The Welsh Government are boasting in point E of their amendments that A-level students had the best results this year since 2010. That's good news, of course, but the PISA results of 2016, as mentioned um, already, paint a rather different picture from the rosy one presented in Labour's amendment. The results for reading and science were worse in 2016 than they were in 20, 2006, and although in maths there was a marginal improvement, it was only of six points in ten years, which is hardly stellar improvement, is it? In Wales, the percentage of pupils considered top performance across reading, maths and science is less than half that across the border in England. Literacy and numeracy are essential basics of education. And if the Welsh Labour Government can't ensure that pupils are both literate and numerate enough to enable them to learn the skills and disciplines they need to succeed in life and to be financially independent in adult life, there is scant hope that it can get much else right either. The Welsh Government needs to get its priorities right and focus on the basics instead of trying to criminalise parents, dictating the values children are taught and interfering with the dynamics of the parent-child relationship, 
for no other reason than value signalling and an elitist attitude that they know better than the parents. It is no measure of their ability to govern that something may be the best it has been for seven or eight years if it is still worse than it was 12 years ago. In point F, they state that disposable income in 2016 was higher than in 2015, and in point G, they say that wages have increased by 2.1%. All of this might, might sound really positive until you remember that they've been in power in Wales for 20 years. And that boast about wage rises is cynical in the extreme when you consider that inflation is currently at 2.4%. In real terms, Welsh workers have had a pay cut, but Labour don't just deny it, they try to spin it as an increase. No doubt Labour say that the people endorse them as they keep returning them to power, yet they didn't exactly win the last, last election. At the moment, they cling to a majority in this place, thanks to the outsourcing of two cabinet positions to get their policies through. And this isn't the first time that Welsh Labour have had to be propped up by someone else. Their inability to run public bodies can be proven in no better way than the ongoing scandal that is Betsy Cadwallader. Labour have taken direct control of the health board and still waiting times for some services are getting worse. If their direct involvement makes it worse or results in little or no improvement, how can they possibly claim to be the right people to set the overall strategies and targets for the NHS or anything else? As population figures rise, hospital beds reduce in comparison with that population, as do training places for doctors and nurses. And Welsh Labour refuse to make the hard decisions necessary to put the failing NHS boards back on track. That's the Labour version of the NHS. As, com as competition from talented youngsters across the border, at home and abroad increases, Welsh schools sit at the bottom of the UK PISA rankings. That's Labour's version of an education system. As fewer and fewer people vote Labour, they deny it because of anything they're doing wrong and insist they don't need to change. And when the people of Wales vote to leave the EU, they write, rewrite history, patronise the electorate, accuse their opponents of lying and plan a way to thwart the will of the people. That's Labour's version of a democracy for you. Finally, failing policies across the board, a disrespect for the electorate and a never-ending stream of weasel words deflect blame. That's Labour's version of government and it's well past time to change to give the people of Wales what they need and deserve. That's why I'm supporting this motion. Thank you. Mohamed Ashkar. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you. Uh, Sir Christopher Vaughan was the leading architect of London reconstruction after the Great Fire in 1666. He lied buried beneath the floor of his most famous building, St. Paul Cathedral. An elaborate tomb marks the site of his burial. Instead, there is an ins inscription on the floor, and it says, if you are searching for a mo monument, look around. Presiding of Deputy Presiding Officer, if we were to look around at Wales today for the first minister monument, it would be a much less edifying prospect. We would see the sad result of another nine wasted years of West Labour government. Nine years ago, <clears throat> First Minister set out his vision for Wales in his leadership manifesto. It was called Time to Lead. Time to Lead. Launching his manifesto, the First Minister said, our priority has to be that we protect public services like the NHS and education. The reality, however, is somewhat very different. During his period in the office, the First Minister has inflicted real-term cuts to the health budget in Wales. Key performance targets have not been met. In December, December 20, 2009, not one patient waited longer than 36 weeks for treatment. Today, the figure is more than 30, 13,500. 13, more than 4,000 of these patients have been waiting more than a year for a surgery. In December 2009, 225,000 patients were waiting to start treatment. Today, nearly 444,000 are waiting on waiting list. Performance against both the 4 and 12 years old, 12-hour uh, target in which emergency department has deteriorated. The urgent cancer treatment referral target, which says patient 
referred by the urgent route should start treatment in 62 days has never been met under this first minister. In time to lead, the first minister pledged to increase education spending by 1% above the block grants. However, since 2011, his West government has delivered real-term cuts in education spending. GCSE performance has worsened. This summer saw the worst attainment of GCSE top grades since 2005. The International Peace Assessment reveals Wales has having the worst performance education system in the United Kingdom. PISA scores for reading, maths, and science are worse than in 2009, placing Wales in the bottom half of the OECD global ranking. In the 10 years between 2006 and 2016, West government closed 157 schools, mostly in rural areas. Yeah, go on. Would you agree with the OECD viewpoint, strongly made, that Wales is moving in the right direction in regard to its education reforms? No, I am just giving you the facts and figures which are actually produced in the world domain. Interviewed by the Western Mail at his manifesto launch, Carvin Jones said, we know that education, that education is a route out of poverty for many people in Wales. Thanks to his education policies, the First Minister has put considerable obstacle in the way to block that route. I would like to mention another pledge made in the time to lead, namely to increase the building of new affordable and council housing. On, his, on this watch, the number of homes being built annually in Wales has fallen. Successive administration under his leadership have failed to build enough homes to meet Wales' ongoing housing crisis. Over the past decade, the number of new homes being built has fallen from over 10,000 a year in 2008 to just 6,000 this year. The First Minister has set a target of building 20,000 affordable homes. But given his record of failing to meet targets in NHS and education in Wales, what confidence can we have in this government ability to deliver enough new homes? Wales, go on then. Um, I wonder if you've got a, a, a long shopping list of things you'd like more money put into. Do you, could you tell us what you think should be received less funding in order to pay for it? But the thing is, Wales hasn't seen any other side of the coin. It's only Labour Party's performance, I'm telling you. Wales does not need a new Labour government. Wales need a new government here. Material. There are 200,000 poor children living under the poverty in Wales. 200,000. Yeah. And the thing is, poverty is economy, family, ethnicity, and disability. We are worse in the United Kingdom. There's a long list of material deprivation, persistent poverty, poverty in different areas, deprivation in South Wales valleys. They still haven't woken up since the since the Margaret Thatcher. Basically, you can say many things about it, but you are the one running the government since 1999, and nothing has been done, and it's a shame to the West yeah. Labour government altogether. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rhiannon Passmore. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I will be voting for the amendment to this motion tabled by Julie James AM. The Tory motion is both cynical and politically opportunistic. The Tory motion is also fundamentally flawed. We know, do we not, that since 2009 there have been two National Assembly of Wales elections. Both times the Welsh nation has gone to the polls and both times democratically following the elections a Welsh Labour government has been formed. The Welsh people are no fools. They do not support the Welsh Labour Party out of blind obedience. We are talking about a Welsh populace with a great collective memory of their history and our progressive future. The Welsh Labour Party works to renew the immense bond that exists between it and the Welsh people, and we will continue to do so with fresh policies like disbarring nurseries from business rates and the best childcare offer of the UK. The last decade has been dominated by the UK Tory government's policies of imposed austerity purposeful cuts to the Welsh budget, purposeful cuts to the welfare safety net, growing poverty and inequality, 
purposeful cuts to the public sector, who often deal with the most vulnerable in our society. And austerity, the name itself, is actually a stroke of purposeful genius, somehow not a chosen cuts policy, but an inevitable default position of others. Austerity has been a vicious determined ideological attack on the state's ability to intervene to support the poorest in society with the levers of the UK, as highlighted by not one but two UN reports on the severe state of poverty inflicted by the UK Conservative Government on its people. Despite sustained Tory attack, devolution, Welsh Labour and our government have afforded some protection for the Welsh people from a right-wing Tory government's policies. In the dark shadow of this inflicted austerity, the Welsh, La Welsh Labour government has secured 83,000 more people in work since 2010. 1.4 billion of investment via the 21st century schools programme. 41 new schools, including the impressive 22 million Isline High in my constituency. The lowest diagnostic weights since 2010. Wales leading the UK on household recycling and rated in the top three of the world. In the last Assembly, we delivered 10,000 new affordable homes in this Assembly, and we are on target to deliver 20,000 more. Welsh Labour has done all this in the shadow of a greed-driven global recession and the longest period of self-inflicted austerity in living memory. And that has been the Conservatives who have propagated that via their weakening of our financial regulations previously, and all against the uncertainty of a Brexit, a Brexit that will also deliver on national insecurity. The Welsh Government's overall budget in 2019 is down 5% or 850 million in real terms compared to 2010-11, something not deserved by our people and also again as a result of the Welsh Conservatives policy. The Welsh Government's revenue budget in 2019 is down 4% or 650 million in real terms compared to 2010-11. The Welsh Government's capital budget of 2019-20 is down 10 per cent or 200 million in real terms compared to 2010-11. When it comes to leadership, Welsh Labour and our succession of leaders have offered and delivered principled leadership. Compare that to the strength and stability of a chaotic mess that we are seeing in London from Theresa May and the rest of the ragbag UK Tory government. I can assure the Welsh people that the next Welsh Labour First Minister will continue to stand up for Wales and deliver on our strong socialist and ethically principled leadership and our sound socialist policy in action. Thank you. Andrew R. T. Davis. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think it was quite telling at the start of this debate when the government bench had one minister on it and the back bench had one member of the governing party to defend its actions in a debate that was looking back over the last nine years, back to 2009. Uh, that in itself tells you its own story of engagement by the governing party in debates here this afternoon. Um, it is a pleasure to stand up here today, and it is also worth reflecting on the activities and achievements of the current First Minister. This time next week, he will not be the First Minister. And someone who has occupied a role for nine years, uh, and been at the centre of government for the principal part of devolution, I think came into government in 2000-2001, uh, is worthy of any recognition and praise as well, because that is an intensity in public office uh, that really does uh, warrant um, sufficient observation from opposition parties and the governing party as well, that someone's dedicated themselves to public service. But it is right also to reflect on missed opportunities, especially over a sustained period of time. And sometimes, instead of looking at the big issues, you sometimes need to look at the very small issues and work up from the small issues to the big issues. And today, for example, I was in the town of Barry, where there has been a vigorous campaign around the incinerator that has been located there, uh, which has been granted planning permission through the normal process. Uh, the Environment Minister, uh, back in February, agreed to look into giving an environmental, or to consider imposing an environmental impact assessment on that incinerator. I raised the question with the Leader of the House 
yesterday, uh, and some 300 days later, that community is still waiting for that decision from the government. Uh, and if you are in government, you've got the ability to do things. You have the ability, as Mohammed Ashgar said on the front page of the, of the First Minister's manifesto, the time to lead to lead and actually be, make a positive impact in communities. And in respect of that particular community, that inertia in making this decision epitomises much of the bigger stuff that the First Minister and indeed his successive governments have failed to achieve for Wales. You can't not walk away from the successive PISA tables that have shown regrettably we have not enjoyed the success in education that we all want to see. Take the politics out of it. We all want to see a better education system. It's not much good saying we can wait till 2022 when the new curriculum comes in. What about the generation that's going through schools at the moment? I'm a father of four kids. They get one go around the track they do. And you want to give them the best chance possible. So what are we saying? The last 20 years, oh, well, sorry about that, but we'll get it right for the next generation. The international figures do not lie. And, you know, a bit of reflection from the governing party and the governing benches wouldn't go amiss in where things have gone wrong and where we can put things right. I am the first one to acknowledge 21st century schools has made an improvement in schools the length and breadth of this country. But it is a fat lot of good having shiny new buildings if the outcomes coming out of those shiny new buildings aren't replicated in the achievements of our young people. I am as ambitious as anyone for our young people to achieve the best that they possibly can in their lives. But it has to be on the scorecard that the government could have done better. If you look at the economy over the last couple of years, it is a fact that Welsh workers are taking less home today compared to their Scottish counterparts when they started in 1999. £55 a week less, in fact. Now, the governing party talk about austerity. I have not heard an alternative put forward at how we would have cleaned up the mess that Gordon Brown left of a public sector borrowing requirement of £160 billion that is coherent and would have kept the confidence of the, of the markets so that we wouldn't have seen a massive recession. But what I have seen is the economic policies of successive Labour governments in Wales deliver poorer take-home pay as opposed to improved take-home pay in other parts of the United Kingdom. It is a fact. We are the lowest take-home pay economy of the United Kingdom. That is a fact. You cannot deny that. And when it comes to the NHS, it is a fact that a political decision was taken in 2011-12 to cut health spending here in Wales. That was a political decision that was taken. It is the only government in the United Kingdom, and indeed the First Minister is the only leader of government who has taken that conscious decision to cut spending. And the argument at the time was that that money needed to go into other columns to support other services. And that is fine if that's what, the that's what the political choice is. But the fact of the matter is that decision was taken and the government has to reap the consequences because of it. In 2009, for example, the 36-week wait in the Welsh NHS was zero. Zero. Today, it is 13,500 people are waiting 36 weeks or more to have treatment. That is the measure that people measure their success with the NHS, of how timely they can be seen when they are presented with an illness or condition. And that on the scorecard has to be marked down as a failure. So I am more than willing to stand here and praise the public service of the current First Minister, a record that deserves to be praised. But the successive governments that he has led have failed to achieve the real improvements that were promised at the start of devolution and through the time of the governments that he has led. Now, that's not the fault of devolution. It's the political choices that have been taken. And let's reflect on that, because the next week is a time for reflection and a time to get on side and actually change the record so that we change the outcomes. And that's why I hope this Assembly will support the motion before them this afternoon. Yeah. Can I now call the Leader of the House and the Chief Whip, Julie James? Thank you, Deputy <coughs> Presiding Officer. Well, I would very much like to begin by thanking the Conservatives for bringing forward this debate today, because it's given us a timely opportunity to reflect and celebrate the significant progress successive Welsh Labour governments, so that successively elected by the Welsh people, Welsh Labour governments, have made during Carwyn Jones's time as First Minister. As our amendment says, this is an opportunity to thank him for his work and leadership as First Minister, a First Minister that I, for one, have been very proud to serve. For nine years, the First Minister has led the Welsh Government through some of the most difficult times this country, and indeed the UK as a whole, has experienced since the end of the Second World War. Hard times that the Conservatives would very much like us never to mention again. Those nine years have been punctuated by a global recession, followed by the longest period of austerity in living memory, 
which, let us not forget, the UN Special Rapporteur on Poverty last month described as a political choice by the UK Conservative Government. And the final years of this FM's tenure have been dominated by Brexit, the proverbial catfight in the Conservative Party, not to mention the chaos caused by the Prime Minister's flip-flop negotiations and those members of the Tory party once described by a member of David Cameron's inner circle as swivel-eyed loons. A government defeated three times yesterday in the Houses of Parliament, not something to be proud of. Deputy Presiding Officer, through all of this, successive Welsh Labour-led governments have maintained their commitment to work towards a more prosperous Wales and have delivered for the people of Wales. Yesterday, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance set out again in the draft budget debate the impact austerity has had on our budget. It bears repeating today. Yes, certainly, you. Janet. Um, with all due respect, you represent uh, Swansea um, as a constituency. And Mm? Swansea, yeah, yeah, Swansea West, yeah. And you cannot, I cannot be alone here in receiving emails daily about our failing health system in Wales. When you have a constituent that comes to you with such delayed treatment times, you know, such a lack of coordination within our health services, do you turn around and say, oh, it's the UK government's fault, it's austerity, or are you truthful and tell them that you run the Welsh Labour Health Service, you run the health service here in Wales? You know, where is the reality in this debate, Julian? Uh, uh, well, there is that. That is the reality I was about to come on and say. But actually, if you really want to know what I say to my constituents in Swansea, Janet, I say, that the, the Tory government has cancelled electrification, it's cancelled the Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon, it cannot deal with any of the infrastructure problems, it is absolute shambles. So you ask the question, that's the answer you're getting. So, as I said, yesterday the Cabinet Secretary... Um, thank you. ...to hear the Leader of the House, thank you. It bears repeating today. If we were not a penny better off in real terms than we were in 2010, we would have £850 million more to invest in frontline services today. If spending... Point. And you've just said exactly what you tell your constituents. I agree with you entirely on the damage that has been caused by a decade of Tory austerity, but surely you cannot duck the blame uh, uh, and duck the responsibility of decisions taken by Welsh Government on health and other matters. If spending on public services had kept pace with the growth in the economy since 2010, we would have an extra £4 billion to spend on public services in Wales. And if the UK Conservative Government had matched the level of investment in public services achieved by every government for the last 50 years, Wales would have £8 billion more to spend. And uh, what would have happened if uh, the Labour... Uh, government had been returned in 2010 and Mr Darling's spending plans had been put into effect. How would that have affected your uh, well, current you spending? Know, David, Gordon Brown had already turned the economy around and we had growth. The Conservative Party choked that in its infancy immediately. So I don't have any worries at all of what would have happened there. The Tory party that followed was one of the most fiscally irresponsible in the history of Great Britain. Plowith, in the face of this global recession, austerity and Brexit, ours is a government which has and continues to deliver for Wales in every aspect of devolved life. More people are starting the treatment they need within the target time. Almost 90% of patients wait less than 26 weeks for treatment. Cancer survival continues to improve and the NHS in Wales is consistently seeing and treating more cancer patients than ever before. We now have an 80 million new treatment fund which has delivered faster access to 137 new medicines for a range of life-threatening and life-limiting conditions. This year we will complete the 100th 21st Century Schools project, a real milestone in an ambitious programme which, we will see us, which will see us invest more than £3.7 billion in rebuilding our children's schools to give them a better environment for their education. GCSE performance in the very top grades has improved and the overall pass rate for A-levels is at an historic high. Wales now outperforms England at the top grades. Our economy has improved despite the UK's slow recovery from the recession and the negative impact of the UK government policies. We have seen important improvement and in some areas we are outperforming other parts of the UK. There were 1.5 million people in employment in Wales in the three months to September 2018, up 4.2% from the same period a year earlier, the largest increase of any UK country or region. It's been less than a decade since... So you wanted not us not to take the credit for that, but to take the blame for austerity. Crack in, Darren, but not very logical. 
It has been less than a decade since we gained primary lawmaking powers on the FM's watch, and we are using them to lead the way in the UK. We have banned smoking in public outdoor places, legislated to prevent, protect and support victims of gender-based violence, domestic abuse and sexual violence. We introduced the interna internationally recognised legislation to put the interests of future generations at the forefront of decision-making and legislated for our bilingual Wales. We introduced the first deemed consent system for organ donation in the UK and we introduced a 5p charge for plastic bags. At the start of this Assembly term, we set out another ambitious programme for government. We have made good progress in delivering it. We have increased to £40,000 the amount of money people can keep before they have to fund the full cost of their residential care. We have extended the number of places where working parents can access 30 hours of free childcare for their three- and four-year-olds, with more than half of local authorities now covered by our pilots. We are making significant progress towards delivering the 100,000 all-age apprenticeships programme with 16,000 starts in the first half of this year alone. We have delivered the most generous financial package for students in the UK as we continue to provide financial support to our young people and adult learners who wish to continue or return to further education. All Welsh students will now receive support for living costs, which is equivalent to the UK national living wage. Deputy Presiding Officer, we will not be supporting the Conservative motion today. This is a party which continues to insist everything we do is at fault in Wales while failing to acknowledge the terrible mess of its own making the UK Conservative Government is presiding over at Westminster, a government which you have to wonder hour by hour whether it's still in power. It's, it's, certainly, not, it's certainly not in charge. From the welfare cuts to the forced introduction of universal credit, it's left people destitute and starving. From the shambolic introduction of new timetables to the rolling failure that is its rail franchising. From the disappearance of social care from great swathes of Middle England to the deterioration of performance of the English NHS, the real failure is the one happening over our border and to the watch of the party opposite. Deputy Presiding Officer, I am proud to have served Carwin Jones as the First Minister of Wales. His, his legacy will stand the test of time which cannot be said for the current serving Prime Minister. Uh, we support the amendment. Thank you. Can I now call on Mark Isherwood to reply to the debate? Yeah. You caught me slightly unawares. I'm still scribbling lots of horrible notes. Um, but may I start by thanking all, all contributors. Uh, Paul Davis um, referred to uh, some success and some cross-party agreement that pointed out that uh, under Carwin Jones' government, uh, Labour was the first party anywhere in the UK to have imposed real terms cuts to the NHS. He refers to the downgrade rating, centralisation and closure of NHS services, to the per-pupil funding gap with England remaining. He refers to Labour's target to close the prosperity gap with the rest of the UK having been dropped, to Wales being the most expensive part of the UK to do business. He pointed out that higher tax revenues to fund public services do not come from high tax economies. He talked about the Labour having created the housing supply crisis, and I know firsthand they ignored warnings going back 15 years that this would result if they didn't take action, which they didn't take. They spent billions, he said, on the symptoms of poverty rather than targeting the causes and said that Wales needs new ideas and new uh, leadership. Uh, Rina Pjorath referred to Welsh Government's delaying tactics, their repeated uh, reviews rather than action, and he referred to homelessness as one example. He, said to, uh, he referred to Welsh Government setting targets lower than England and Scotland and then missing them, and about their unwillingness from learn, to learn from good uh, practice uh, elsewhere. Uh, we heard from... Uh, here we are. <laughs> I found the missing page. Um, we heard from Susie Davis. We all miss our pages sometimes, even uh, members of the Welsh Government. I'm glad. We heard from Susie Davis to focus on how Welsh Government spends the money it has to spend rather than simply uh, the amount. He pointed out that, yes, they do get 20% currently more per person to spend than in England and yet spend less on school pupils. 45 education institutions in special measures, a bureaucratic approach to raising standards, and it referred to the sinking ship that is Labour Wales. Well, Michelle Brown um, referred to Welsh Government painting rosy picture to conceal reality, to Welsh Government's elitist we-know-best attitude, to Labour only clinging to Government by giving Government roles to two non-Labour Assembly uh, members, and de Labour's disrespect for the electorate. Now, how about Askar? Uh, he, he noted that... Um, 
key performance targets were not being met and that performance had deteriorated in key areas. And he refers again to the failure by successive Welsh governments to build affordable and council homes, not over five or ten years, but over two uh, decades. Um, we know, uh, if I come to uh, Rhiannon Passmore, um, did, can I thank Rhiannon for not giving a shouty speech, although the content was fairly similar. She described facts as flaws. She referred to austerity. So let's hope the next time a Labour government thinks it can break the economic cycle and impose pressure on the regulators in finance to go light touch, they remember the pain that will cause for successive uh, generations. She referred to the increasing employment in Wales since 2010, when the UK government came into power after Wales lagging for years and years prior to that. And she referred to the uh, weakening of financial regulations. Well, if you read the successive reports following the financial crash, as I have, you will know that those identify uh, Messrs Blair, Brown and Balls as being the great financial uh, deregulators whose political interference, read the report, political interference led to uh, the banking crash, despite being warned years in advance that if they didn't take action, this would be the consequence. Andrew R. T. Davis talked about missed opportunities, pupils only getting one chance. It's no good um, having shiny new buildings if the outcome, outcomes haven't done better. And he referred to 36-week waiting times in the NHS in 2009 being zero, now in their thousands. Leader of the House, speaking for the Welsh Government, gave what sounded like a very good Welsh Labour conference speech. But she did not dodge the key political choices taken by almost 20 years of Labour and Labour-led Welsh Government, which have led to the failures outlined in this debate. She referred to the £850 million more that we'd have for frontline service, services if the money hadn't all gone and the UK's credit line being threatened with closure in, 20, in 2010. And as she made reference to the UK government's apparent non-contribution to Wales, well, they delivered the uh, funding floor to the for that formula, which ensures that Wales gets more per head than uh, in England. Uh, they delivered almost three quarters of a billion pounds for the city and growth deals in Wales. We're still waiting to hear from the Welsh government over North Wales. They referred to they provided 10 million for the uh, compound semiconductor. Uh, applications uh, project in Cardiff, £82 million for a defence contract in Denbyshire, and they're pumping millions into RAF Sealand by centering the F-35 uh, programme uh, there. So let's look at some factual uh, statistics in the fact time left to us. From recent official reports, Wales is the least productive nation in the UK. Poverty and deprivation are higher in Wales than any other nation in Britain. Median hourly earnings in Wales are lower than England and Scotland. Average earnings in Wales are lower and have grown slower than in other UK nations. Wales has the lowest long-term pay growth among the nations of the UK. Wales has a higher relative income poverty rate than England, Northern Ireland and Scotland, a higher proportion of working age adults in poverty than any other UK nation, and a pension of poverty rate in Wales far higher than in any other uh, UK nation. Wales is suffering from one of the worst governments endured by any part of the United Kingdom since the arrival of the universal franchise. Not only that, one of the most reactionary governments whose only action is to react against the UK government, whose only policy is to blame the UK government for its own serious and successive failures over far uh, too long. Fanning the flames of public confusion over their responsibility for the mess we're in and adding to the lack of public accountability which has kept them in place for so long and so much pain. Thank you. The proposal is to agree to motion without amendment. Does any member object? Thank you. We defer voting under this item until voting time. The next item on our agenda this afternoon is the short debate. And I now call on David Meldon to speak on the topic he has chosen. Well, I, I, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm unaccustomed to, to such a warm welcome and uh, of the last 24 hours or so, we've discussed the budget, we've discussed Brexit, and we've just been discussing uh, the Welsh Government's uh, record. But now we have a calm interlude, and I want to turn to the Neolithic uh, in the story of uh, Wales. And <laughs> boom, boom. 
there, there were great achievements in the Neolithic, as you were about to discover. Uh, and in uh, northwest uh, Europe, where we find ourselves, the Neolithic ran from about 4,500 BC to uh, 1,700 BC. Although exactitude in these matters is not uh, particularly helpful, no one w woke up one day and said, ah, the Neolithic is over and the Bronze Age has uh, begun. But uh, we do like to use these uh, categories. But uh, what marks out the Neolithic period, above all, is farming and settlements. But there were other great achievements uh, uh, too. Pottery, statuettes, figurative art, decorations such as spirals, chevrons, and uh, lozenges, uh, pictograms, ideograms, axes, and even r rudimentary food preservation. And it, it was a time of remarkable technological invention and uh, uh, discovery. Now, all of the sites I will refer to in my short debate appear on the uh, rolling photo presentation that is now playing on uh, the, the screen. I want to start uh, with Tinkins Wood in the uh, Vale of uh, Glamorgan. It is one of my favorite places. I've walked there and uh, spent time there, read poetry there, discussed eruditely, I hope, with uh, some members in this chamber, indeed, uh, uh, whilst pondering and, and looking at that uh, uh, monument. And uh, it does remind me, anyway, of the amazing achievements of our ancestors in prehistory. And uh, I believe it is really important that we respect and celebrate uh, these uh, achievements. And I'd like now to turn to uh, John Davis and what he says about Tinkinswood in his, what I think, you know, remains a, a, me a mesmerizing uh, uh, history, a history of Wales, surely the greatest one volume history uh, yet written. And we have some really magnificent one volume histories of, uh, of Wales going back to David Williams. But uh, John Davis uh, st starts that work with a chapter titled <coughs> The Beginnings, Paverland, Tinkinswood, and Llyn Kerig Bach. And I think it's absolutely the right context uh, to set. Uh, Tinkinswood demonstrates the growing mastery over environment, which is really the mark of the uh, 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 Neolithic. And uh, just think the capstone uh, on that uh, monument would have required 200 men uh, to put it in place. Just remarkable uh, organization. Uh, and it was built after much of the woodland in the Vale of Glamorgan had been cleared, cleared away by uh, the new technology, the new axes, uh, because after the uh, end of the Ice Age, uh, uh, we had you know, a period of uh, thick temperate forests over most of Wales, and much of that was cleared then to make way for farming. And uh, activity in this part of Wales was heavily influenced by the culture of Brittany. I now quote from jo John Davis, um, this is an aspect of the personality of Wales which can, which can be overlooked if the country is seen as no more than part of the highland zone of Britain. Eastwards, Wales faces the lowlands of England, but it also faces the western waters with their network of sea routes. People and influences came from the one direction and the other, and the interplay between what came by land and what came by sea is one of the most fascinating of the themes of the early history of Wales, and I completely agree. Um, in June 2017, when Welsh Water carried out upgrades on a site at Llanweithli, uh, uh, archaeologists working on behalf of Welsh Water found evidence of prehistoric activity dating back around 4,000 to 6,000 years. Amongst the findings were flint tools. Silica-rich flint can be fashioned into a variety of tools, for example, the knives and axes that I've been talking about. This site also contained burnt foods, such as hazelnuts and other seeds, which will enable experts to radiocarbon up the, the site and reconstruct the Neolithic uh, diet. Additionally, on Anglesey, one can find the mound in the Dark Grove, known as Bryn Cathy Thi, and, uh, and uh, uh, Cadu says of this monument, it seems to have begun in the later Neolithic period, around 5,000 years ago, as a ritual enclosure. Cadu also notes that, the, that later in the Neolithic uh, period, the henge made way for a passage tomb, a monument often found around the Irish seaboard and as far afield as Brittany. The real magnificence, magnificence of this tomb 
is that it has been built with such accuracy that it perf is perfectly aligned to co coincide with the rising sun on the summer solstice. The sun penetrates down into the inner burial chamber. Excavations there have led to 10 examples of rock carvings being found, as well as pottery and flint tools. Amazingly, the history of the site goes back even further, as post holes found in the Henge have been carbon dated back to the Mesolithic period. And it just shows that we're you know, discovering constantly new uh, insights in uh, these uh, uh, sites and discovering others. Another site of particular interest to me is the hill fort at Kaira, Cardiff. This was a major power centre uh, for the region of Cardiff prior to uh, the Roman invasion and uh, a major centre for many thousands of years. Uh, a six-year-old uh, uncovered pottery and arrowheads there, and it emerged that Cairo was the home of a powerful community from at least uh, 3,600 BC. Other arrowheads have been uh, uh, found that were broken, presumably uh, from impact, and weapons and other weapons found, indicating that a battle field uh, uh, that, or a battle took place there uh, some 5,000 years ago of great significance. And this is activity uh, that goes back much earlier than we previously uh, uh, thought. And it just amazes me that uh, a child out there uh, suddenly finding these, uh, 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 th th these remarkable discoveries and then uh, having the wit to uh, ask about them and then, uh, then being identified by the various uh, experts. And uh, this is, I think, you know, uh, what's wonderful about that particular uh, project, which I'll talk a little bit uh, about in a moment. Um, and uh, again, demonstrating that with constant uh, discoveries, we are led to new interpretations of these sites, which is why they are so precious. Kair, Kair are nearly rediscovering the heritage project there. Uh, consists of archaeologists from Cardiff University, along with Ely and Kaira communities first. They aim to explore the history and archaeology of the Cardiff suburbs of Kaira and Ely from prehistory through to the modern day, helping to connect, to connect communities with their heritage and develop educational opportunities. Uh, their website notes that before the advent of the Roman invasion, Kaira Hillfort was the major power centre for the entire Cardiff region and is one of the largest and most impressive hill forts in southeast Wales. During the medieval period, a ringwork and church, St. Mary's, were built within the ancient Iron Age boundaries, and their impressive remains can still be seen today, showing the remarkable continuity of that particular uh, site. And again, I think that's another precious aspect uh, of, of these monuments. And Oliver Davis, who has worked on the project, said that the location and number of Neolithic finds indicate that we have discovered a causeway enclosure, a special place where small communities gathered together at certain important times of the year to celebrate, feast, exchange things, and possibly find marriage partners. It was a key uh, social development of the Neolithic. Such sites, incidentally, are very rare in Wales, with only five other known examples, mostly in the south, as it happens. Uh, and in June this year, Cardiff University's Live Local, Learn Local program, in conjunction with the Kyle Heritage uh, uh, Project, launched a six-week six course, Hidden Histories of Kyra and Ely, which delivers free accredited courses in communities facing social economic challenges. What a wonderful idea that is. Five members of the community, along with several uh, participants from further afield, took part in the course, and I had a rare opportunity to visit the vaults of the National Museum of Wales to get valuable training in designing and executing museum exhibitions. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, can I just say in conclusion that uh, I welcome the Historic Environment Act uh, 2016, which uh, this government uh, 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 brought before us and enacted. And I think it's really important that we see with the removal of the defense of ignorance of a monument or its location, a way of establishing the, uh, the, the, the responsibilities that property owners have when these monuments are uh, discovered uh, or obviously when they are looked after. There are so many, we are so rich in Neolithic heritage that we must ensure that we preserve it uh, as fully as possible because we are reinterpreting, there will be new discoveries in future generations, no doubt, and with aerial photography becoming ever more sophisticated down to the use of uh, uh, using drones, 
Um, we're discovering constantly new, uh, uh, new sites. There's one on the, the uh, display of uh, the earthwork uh, 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 that you can see from uh, you know, a great height, but not uh, from uh, uh, ground level. We also need to improve the awareness and public understanding of Neolithic monuments. And uh, I think the Cairo project is uh, really important in uh, uh, this uh, regard. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, can I just conclude by saying that the Neolithic should be properly, properly honoured because it has a more special place in the story of Wales. Thank you. Thank you. Can I now call on the Minister for Culture, Tourism and Sport to reply to the date? David Ellis Thomas. Uh, Thank you very much for the opportunity, Deputy Presiding Officer, to respond to the extraordinary and unexpected debate. One of the advantages of this place, the Senate of Wales, is that we can discuss, as the legislation that established us, any matters that affect Wales. But I think this is the first time for me to hear a debate and the first time for me to take part in a short debate talking about the past that can be called prehistory. But this is a word that I have some problems with, because I would argue philosophically that if we can talk about prehistory, then it has to exist, and it is in some sense historic. But we'll leave that to the philosophers. I had an opportunity last month to outline the priorities that we have in depart the Department for the Historic Environment of Wales, and the emphasis in those priorities on displaying and demonstrating that Wales arose as a modern nation from the cultural heritage with common elements over thousands of years. And so the member is safe in saying that we started in the depths of the of prehistory, indeed far before the Neolithic period, as that is dated, and what David described as the dawn of agriculture and settlement. We can pursue the story of the nation that is now called Wales. Back to the Ice Age, the last Ice Age at least, and the earliest human traces found in quotation marks of a Welsh person, like in Potnewydd Cave, almost a quarter of a million of years ago. So prehistory is a matter of great interest to the Welsh Government, and I would like to emphasize what the different elements of the heritage that we have tried to be try to safeguard over the period that I have been responsible for this portfolio, just over a year. Our central priority is to care for our historic environment through promoting its enjoyment and enjoyment of it. And it's important that we can understand as far as we can the past that we're talking about so that it can appeal to people in the present day and in future. Now, the findings that have been made in these early periods in Wales are findings that are of international significance in Penavai Cave, in the Gawa, for example, and the history of the construction of burial, burial chambers as David mentioned, referring to Tinkins Wood at Hechevillias, or whatever we want to call it in that area. These are notable buildings in the landscape. And the Bronze Age have seen thousands of these burial mounds spread across the landscape of Wales with valuable items buried in them. The Mould Cape is perhaps the most famous of them, and the Iron Age is development of communities and the hundreds of traces that exist across Wales, such as in Shakiri. And for me, the 
institutions that have interpreted these sites, particularly the Royal Commission on Ancient and Historic Monuments, that have recorded numerous sites very recently during the dry summer where traces were found in the rural landscape so that the prehistory came alive anew, as it were, because of the weather that we experienced at that time. In those events, we have seen through the work of the Commission and through the extraordinary work that it's been done, we've seen the way that there are interesting clusters of these prehistoric sites across our nation. One of the most notable, of course, are the clusters on Anglesey. And I wouldn't want to leave Anglesey out of any discussion of prehistory. And the prehistoric monuments on Anglesey can take their rightly place with Dufferin Boyne in Ireland, with Stonehenge in England, indeed. These are amongst the most extraordinary sites on the British Isles and in Ireland. And there are sites under the care of Cadw, including the first Neolithic burial chambers in Brincachy Thi and Barcote de Gaures. Cadw is also responsible for Neolithic burial chambers in the north of Pembrokeshire, including Pentra Ivan, and in Glamorgan, I've already talked about, as has the member, as mentioned, Tinkins Wood, near St. Nicholas, where I had an opportunity to spend a great deal of time with my family in that area. And I had an extraordinary experience of trying to explain prehistory to young children. And so it is important to emphasize that in the contemporary provision of CADU and the government's work, that we do appreciate this inheritance and legacy and that we do strive to safeguard it. And I want to pay tribute to the archaeological trusts in Wales that have visited and assessed every prehistoric site that we're aware of. And there are 23,000 such sites. And the whole host of information that has emanated from this are records that have legal status in the Historic Environment Act of 2016. Um, we are implementing the Act at the moment through the specific provision that has been made in giving direction for how to implement the Act. And we will be continuing to monitor that and review it formally, indeed, in years to come. CADU also produces online maps, Corv Cymru, which includes the location and description of every prehistoric site that has been safeguarded in Wales. So this information is available, and it's possible to access it. And the technical advice note, the first ever technical advice note for the historic environment has been published as recently as last year. Now, this work is ongoing, but the promotion work continues to be important. And that, for this reason, I bought a gift for the member. So a bilingual description for pupils of Hynkerig Bach, Barclodia de Gaures and Bryn Cachy Thi. And as all members can see, there are wonderful illustrations that reinforce and recreate the Neolithic age and prehistoric age. But, but they are historically accurate. And we're trying to generate enthusiasm amongst the next generation in the long tradition that we're part of. And I'd like to not just thank the trusts, but also the National Museum for their part. The extraordinary developments in St. Fagans over the past few years that have brought us to a situation where they are now open officially, and the new galleries give a clear status, explicit status, to the prehistoric objects from all parts of Wales, and you can't go into any of the museum's buildings without realizing 
that the history of Wales is a long-running one and one that we should all respect. And I'm very grateful once again to discuss such an issue during a debate at the Assembly. Thank you. Thank you. Item 8 on our agenda this afternoon is voting time. Unless three members wish for the bell to be rung, I intend to proceed to that voting time. Can I show, can three members show they want the bell rung? Okay, we'll ring the bell. Thank you.
people I intend now, members, to proceed to a vote in time. And the first vote this afternoon is on the Welsh Conservative debate on Welsh Government performance. And I call for a vote on the motion tabled in the name of Darren Miller. If the proposal is not agreed to, we vote on the amendment tabled to the motion. Open the vote. Close the vote. For the motion, 12. Five abstentions, 25 against. Therefore, the motion is not agreed. And I call for a vote on Amendment 1, tabled in the name of Julie James. Open the vote. Close the vote. For the Amendment 25, five abstentions, 12 against. Therefore, the Amendment 1 is agreed. And I call for a vote on the motion as amended. Open the vote. Close the vote. For the amended motion 25, five abstentions, 12 against. Therefore, the amended motion is agreed. Before we move to the debate on stage three of the Child Care Funding Wales Bill, I intend to suspend proceedings for 10 minutes. The bell will be rung five minutes before we reconvene, and I would encourage members to return to the chamber promptly. Thank you.
I call members to order, and this brings us to our stage three debate on the Child Care Funding Wales Bill. The first group of amendments relates to the duty to provide funded child care. The lead amendment in this group is Amendment 4, and I call on the Minister for Children, Older People and Social Care to move and speak to the lead amendment and other amendments in the group. Here we Davis. Uh, delighted to uh, help open proceedings here on the Stage 3 uh, Committee uh, for this uh, important uh, bill, and I've responded to calls from scrutiny committees. Uh, the uh, Children and Young People's Committee and the Constitutional Legis Legislative Affairs Committee for a duty on the face of the bill, and I've duly brought forward Amendment 4. To give effect to this duty, the Welsh Ministers will need to state the detail around the number of hours of childcare and the number of weeks of provision in the regulations made under Section 1. These regulations will be subject to the affirmative procedure. In practice, Government Amendment 4 achieves exactly the same purposes as Amendments 4A and 4B, but without the need for primary legislation to be amended by regulations, should it be necessary in future to vary the amount of childcare to be secured under Section 1. Amendments 4A and 4B are seeking to nail things down on the face of the bill. Now, I don't think there's any doubt out there about how committed this government is to delivering on this manifesto commitment. We are already discharging our duty in 14 local authorities across Wales. If we can avoid the need to amend primary legislation by regulations and achieve the same purpose, I think that's what we should do. And for this reason, we will not be supporting Amendments 4A and 4B, and I would urge members to support instead Government Amendment 4, which achieves exactly the same purpose. Amendment 20 seeks to define what we mean by childcare on the face of the bill, by reference to other legislation. Now, we had a very useful discussion, which I'm thankful about, during, this, during Stage 2 proceedings, and I also met subsequently with uh, colleague Susie Davis and Janet Finch-Sanders in early November to discuss this and related issues. Now, what we mean by childcare for the purposes of the offer is regulated childcare, which encompasses a wide range of different types of provision subject to a set of national minimum standards and are regulated and inspected by Care Inspectorate Wales or Ofsted. We already have definitions of childcare in other pieces of legislation, so it is simply unnecessary to have this level of detail within the bill itself. But I agree it is important that the link is made so it is clear what we're talking about when we talk of child care. Now, the framework administrative scheme, which I have shared with the responsible committee, does make this connection explicit, and in there we do define what we mean by child care. The benefit of having the definition in there is that we can then more easily accommodate any changes, should that be necessary in future, whilst also ensuring that we are being transparent about the meaning of things. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Janet Finch Saunders. Thank you, Presiding Officer, for giving us a chance to speak on these amendments. As Welsh Conservatives, we welcome the introduction of the Bill and the child care offer, as we always promised Welsh voters, that they would have funded for child care. It is very important, however, that we as elected members ensure that no barrier to employment is present within our society and helping parents with their childcare is indeed a key part of this pledge. As such, we do support the Minister's principle behind Amendment 4, which binds the Welsh Government to a duty to provide funding for childcare. However, it is still disappointing that the Minister has failed to place the childcare offer on the face of this Bill. Whilst it is admirable that the Minister wants to ensure future flexibility through regulations, both the explanatory memorandum and the draft administrative scheme place the number of 30 hours per week for 48 weeks per year. It is therefore important that the Bill has this amount on its face, which can of course then be changed at a later date. We also heard at Stage 2 that the Minister believes placing the office on the face of the bill would create more difficulties to change it in the future. But we contend that this allows for proper scrutiny of the offer's effects. As will become clear throughout the amendments I have tabled at stage three, 
We have broader concerns that the Bill is not affording the National Assembly for Wales sufficient process to examine the effects. Amendment 4B is a technical change, but it also creates a point that the amount should be specified as hours and weeks. The Welsh Government will fund the offer. Finally, Amendment 20, which my colleague Susie Davis AM will speak about in more detail, shows that perhaps the statutory definition of childcare extends further than was intended under this Bill, including the additional charges. I'll speak about those under Amendments 13 and 21. Susie Davis. Uh, <coughs> uh, this Bill is called the Child Care Funding Wales Bill. Um, the Minister will be aware from amendments tabled in my name at stage two that we've been uh, uh, unhappy about the fact that we have yet another uh, Swiss cheese bill laid before us. And while I'm grateful to him for uh, tabling the amendment in this group, it doesn't absolutely specifically put the, your policy from your manifesto, and indeed the policy from our manifesto, explicitly on the face of the bill. So we are left with a bill which still contains uncertainties, uh, which I'll address in later groups as well. But a core uncertainty uh, is the meaning of childcare. The bill does not define it anywhere. And while you say, Minister, it may mean regulated childcare, it doesn't say that in so many words in the bill. And I think it would be quite easy, really, for all of us to turn around and say, well, I think, well, actually, we know what you mean by childcare. We don't need a definition. But it became very clear at stage two that this wasn't the case, and it wasn't clear at all whether it included activities such as providing food, going on visits, and so on. And there is complete inconsistency at the moment about how, or indeed even whether, those uh, uh, activities are provided for free of charge by child care, uh, care providers in Wales. Minister, you argued at stage two that there's no need for a definition of childcare as it's contained in the administrative scheme accompanying the bill, and you just mentioned that. Uh, and furthermore, to put it on the face of the bill would hinder the ability of government to modify or update what we consider to be childcare over time. And I'll start with that second point. This legislature is being asked to pass a bill on what we understand to be the meaning of childcare today. If you plan to change the meaning of the concept so fundamental to this bill that it appears in its very title, then you should come back to this assembly and ask us to agree to those changes. At the very least, you should seek to bring any change to this chamber through the affirmative procedure, because we are voting to allow you to spend taxpayers' money in a very specific way. And if you want to change that, you must come back to this place and ask. On the first point about the need of a definition on the face of the bill, um, as you say, the administrative scheme uh, refers to childcare being defined as, uh, and I quote, care or supervised activity in respect of which the providers required to be registered under part two of the Children and Families Wales Measure 2010 or under part three of the Child Care Act 2006. And section 18 of the latter, as it happens, contains a definition of childcare which includes non-school education and, crucially, and I quote again, any other supervised activity for a child. An administrative scheme is, of course, just that, some helpful guidance. It is not statutory. It is not scrutinised. The Assembly has no say on its content, so it's not the place for a definition on which the whole purpose of a bill made by a law in this Assembly hinges. And its purpose does hinge on it, and I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, the Minister is confident uh, in the definition of childcare, obviously it's included in the administrative scheme because of that, and we as a legislature should uh, not be content with it changing without thorough scrutiny. It is not appropriate to refuse to put the definition on the face of this bill on the grounds of the need to be flexible about the definition of childcare. That's what this bill is actually about. So please put it on the face of the bill if you're confident in it, or at least define it on the face of the bill by reference to the, those two other pieces of legislation. It's hardly novel, if not in the spirit of the new uh, con uh, much more, can I call it, consolidation bill, if the Council General will let me characterise it as that. Uh, so I've tabled this amendment because the definition of childcare would undoubtedly improve the quality of the bill. But in so doing, I recognise that this presents a huge headache for Welsh Government as regards the purpose of this bill, which is namely to provide free childcare. If we adopt the definition as the Minister is currently doing, or asking sorry, uh, local authorities and providers to do via the administrative scheme, he is accepting that, quote, supervised activities providing lunch, going on visits, etc., are within the definition of childcare. And childcare under this bill is intended to be free. There can be no charge for anything that constitutes childcare. 
But at stage two, you made it clear, Minister, that you saw what you thought were childcare and these activities, these supervised activities, as different things. The offer, you said, is not 30 hours of childcare plus everything else together, explaining that that could make the scheme unaffordable, and I agree. But I'm looking at the 2010 measure and the 2006 Act, and they say that such activities are part of childcare, and you say that childcare is free. So this bill needs to distinguish between activities which can be charged for and those which must not be charged for and um, must be free. And by referring to these two pieces of legislation in your administrative scheme, you've already muddied the waters by permitting charging for supervised activities. If this amendment were to be moved and passed, this definition would not facilitate your policy aim, yet you are relying on that very definition for your policy to be delivered. So I hope you see my point. Firstly, the definition in your administrative scheme needs to be changed so that it doesn't contain contradictory guidance. And secondly, as this shows, this bill does nothing to tell us what is free and what will not be free, failing in, in one of its primary purposes. So uh, I'm not going to be moving the amendment because that would embed your mistake into law. But what I hope you will do before stage four is come back to this chamber and tell us how you will overcome that mistake and make it clear in law which we can scrutinise what exactly families can rely upon being free under the law and what not. Thank you. The Minister to reply to the debate, Hewer Anka Davis. And thank you to Susie and Janet for those uh, comments and remarks. And they rehearsed some of the um, points that we covered in both in meetings, but also at earlier stage of this bill as well. Now, I laid out in my opening remarks why I think what we have in front of us, particularly with Amendment 4, gives the right balance between the clarity that we need on the face of the bill and the duties and the flexibility to flex the offer in future, which is something I have to say which committees have also wanted to see within this, the ability not to go back to primary legislation but actually to revisit it in the way that the scheme actually operates. And that's an important part in deciding where we put some of the details of this. But let, let me just reiterate, um, in order to give effect to the duty that we're proposing, we as Welsh Ministers, me or anybody else, will actually have to state the detail around the number of hours of childcare and the number of weeks of provision in the regulations made under Section 1. And there's no disguise in what this offer is. It's already out there being piloted in the early implementer authorities in, seven, in 14 local authorities at the moment, and, mo and all of them by the time we roll it out. So it's pretty clear. And the regulations will be subject to the affirmative procedure. And on the question of uh, childcare itself, well, as I said before, for the purpose, of, and we've covered this on committee, for the purposes of the offer, this is regulated childcare, regulated and inspected childcare that comes under the inspectorates with the Care Inspectorate Wales or with Ofsted. And I turn to those definitions that you mentioned of childcare and other pieces of legislation. But in terms of issues such as whether there are additional costs, whether it's transport or other costs, I know we'll turn to that in other amendments, and we've discussed them at previous at stage two and actually on committee as well, and we'll deal with those there. But we're very clear in the guidance that we've issued uh, related to uh, transport and other costs, exactly what is allowed and what isn't allowed, and what childcare is. To actually put childcare definition on the face of this bill puts us in the situation where if childcare definitions elsewhere were to change, we would, we would by necessity have to come back and revisit this in primary legislation. Uh, I will indeed. Yes, yeah. sorry, just, just a clarification. Yeah. Um, so are you saying then that the definition of childcare in the 2006 Act is incorrect? No, no. The definitions of childcare are actually correct. And what flows from this um, uh, currently being piloted uh, childcare offer is that definition is the basis of the childcare definition that we use. And is, it also then has guidance that is supplementary to this, which has been shared with the committee as well, which shows where, where there are any additional costs, for example, what the guidance is around those. But childcare is childcare, and it's very clearly understood, and we don't need to redefine it on the uh, front of this bill. So, look, in bringing forward Amendment 4, we've provided greater clarity and certainty about the government's commitment to meet its manifesto commitment, and I welcome the fact that you, you won't be pushing the, uh, the other amendments related to that, because we're trying to achieve the same thing here. And let's not forget that the Welsh Ministers will be required, as I say, to set out the detail of the offer in detail, in terms of number of hours, how many weeks, etc., in regulation. So Amendment 4, alongside the other government amendment, which builds into the bill, Susie and Janet, a requirement to review the effectiveness of the legislation, means this government is fully committed not only to the manifesto commitment, but also to transparency about the effectiveness of this offer as well. 
And one important point, Claire, with just to reflect on at the outset of this Stage 3 proceedings, it is important to reflect again on the purpose of this legislation. Its purpose is to give the legislative mechanism we need to engage HMRC in administering the application and eligibility check-in process for the offer. It isn't about the offer per se, although I recognise that members understandably have focused a great deal on the wider offer more broadly throughout the scrutiny stages, and we've been happy to address those issues. And as the responsible minister, I've tried in every way possible to address those broader issues. But in respect of this set of amendments, I would urge members, uh, in light of my comments, to reject those other amendments, although if uh, the member is choosing not to push them, I think that would be excellent, because we're trying to achieve the same aim here. And to support Government Amendment 4 is the amendment which strikes that right balance be between providing greater clarity and certainty and giving this and future administrations discretion over how that duty is defined in future. Question. The lead amendment in Group 1 is Amendment 4, and as Amendment 2, Amendment 4, Amendments 4A and 4B will be disposed of first. Janet French Saunders, Amendment 4A. Formally. Question. The question is that Amendment 4A be agreed to. Does any member object? We'll therefore proceed to an electronic vote on Amendment 4A. Open the vote. Close the vote. In favour, 18. No abstentions, 25 against. Therefore, Amendment 4A is not agreed. Janet Finch Saunders, Amendment 4B. I move. Question. The question is that Amendment 4B be agreed to. Does any member object? We'll proceed to an electronic vote. Open the vote. Close the vote. In favour, 18. No abstentions, 25 against. Therefore, Amendment 4B is not agreed. The question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to. Does any member object? Therefore, Amendment 4 is agreed in accordance with Standing Order 12.36, which brings us to the second group. And the next group of amendments relates to parental eligibility. Amendment 6 is the lead amendment in this group, and I call on Shang Wenhian to move and speak to the lead amendment and the other amendments in the group. Shang Wenhian. Thank you, Llywydd, and I would like to make it clear at the very outset that Plaid Cymru will be voting against the Child Care Funding Wales Bill on the basis that we believe in the principle of free child care. This is consistent with our approach at stage one, but we have introduced amendments in order to seek to strengthen the bill in the hope that we can agree to it even so late in the day. Amendment six was tabled by Plaid Cymru in order to enhance the offer to parents in education or children, and amendments five, nine, and 10 are supplementary to that. Our Amendment 8 seeks to ensure that there is a right for free childcare for parents not in work, and that, that should also be included in this bill. We believe that 30 hours a week of early years education or childcare should be offered to all children between three and four years of age, and that would ensure that children from all backgrounds would have the best start in life. We have tabled these amendments in order to generate the far-reaching change that is required to the child care offer in line with our own vision and in order to provide us with an opportunity to extend the scope of this bill. Perhaps that what's contained within the bill was what within the, was within the Labour manifesto, but our manifesto as Plaid Cymru went further because our focus was on the interests of all children and it's appropriate, therefore, that we bring these amendments forward today in order to honour our manifesto commitments. But even if you don't believe that universal free childcare is the way forward, we move Amendment 6 in order to give you 
the view that the opportunity to include parents in education or training in the bill. We will be supporting Amendment 11, although it doesn't go as far as we would like to see because we believe that it still strengthens the bill. Our Amendment 9 allows the restriction of the bill to those who need the free provision and stops the better off or the most well off from taking advantage of the free offer when they have the means to pay. It isn't fair and it isn't just that this childcare offer doesn't provide for a child whose parents are not in work whilst making the provision to a child where both parents are working and are earning £100,000 a year, in my view. This is erroneous, it's unjust, and it is wrong. And the Welsh Government childcare offer, as it currently stands, would actually exacerbate the attainment gap. According to the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapy, on average, children from the 20% of the poorest of our society are over 17 months behind a child from the highest income group in terms of language development at three years of age. This bill does not tackle that issue, and indeed it is at risk of exacerbating the situation because children where one or two parents are not in work will lose out. The Children's Commissioner endorses and echoes that view and states quite clearly that children of parents who are not in employment will fall behind as compared to their peers. That's the children of parents who are not in employment. Of course, she supports a universal childcare offer for all three to four years old and says further that there is strong evidence that if you invest in early years education and quality childcare, then you will make a substantial difference to the life chances of children from the poorest backgrounds. If you support our amendments today, you will improve this legislation and create that far-reaching change that is truly needed in the lives of children who need support. Yes, there are other proposals and plans available, and I'm sure that the Minister will refer to the FE Fund, the higher education childcare grant and so on and so forth. But there is confusion. People don't know that they qualify for these various schemes. There are no assurances that these schemes will remain in place if the funding sources dry up. And for me, it makes sense to bring everything together in one simple proposal where everyone who fits into the criteria clearly know what their rights are, rather than having the confusion that we have here. Thank you. Saunders. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Amendments 11 and 19 have been retabled from Stage 2, as we are also disappointed with the Minister's responses about the exclusion of parents who are taking up training for employment from accessing the offer. During Stage 1 of the Bill, there was strong opposition to the limitation of the Bill to working parents only including concerns about the lack of an evidence base to limit the offer, as well as the exacerbation of achievement gaps and lacking in its potential to help prevent children in poverty from falling behind their peers early. Now, although Plaid Cymru have tabled a very similar amendment, we believe that by limiting this offer to parents who are undertaking training for at least 16 hours a week, at least 10 weeks in an academic year means that Huarateg's concerns about extending it to a universal offer actually runs the risk of spreading the offer too thin, and we need to see that addressed. Limiting the hours and weeks would further reduce administrative burdens. Processing of courses which last only several days or weeks would increase the burden of applications. The 10-week rule also allows the courses which run to an academic term to be used. However, we do support Sean, Gwentlian, uh, Sean Gwentlian's Amendment 10, as we would also want to divine prescribed. The Minister's responses so far have just been to repeat the huge array of projects to help parents back into work. However, we remain of the belief that the Welsh Government's insistence on limiting some of these existing projects to parents' postcodes is concerning. While the Minister committed to bring a piece of work to the Committee on these programmes of support, 
This does not address a significant gap already present in the provision of free childcare. For example, Flying Star has been criticised by the CYPE committee this year because it misses nearly two-thirds of children who do live in poverty. And how many times do we speak up on behalf of our children in poverty here in this institution? But they are outside very limited Flying Star areas. The PACE programme is also set to end in 2020. Therefore, it will not cover parents seeking help with childcare before the national programme for free childcare is in place. So, it seems that whilst both the Cabinet Secretary for Education and the Minister have indicated their support for extending the offer, they are not supporting the opportunity to do so through this amendment. Moreover, the early implementary evaluation has noted that 60% of the parents who they interviewed said that the offer had provided them with more <coughs> opportunities for in-work training and learning opportunities. We therefore believe that this aspiration should be extended to parents who are actively looking for work through education and training, and I ask all members to support this amendment. Temporary exemption periods, Amendment 17. Again, we've had to retable Amendment 17 to highlight our concerns about the reliance of the Minister on the non-statutory administrative scheme to deliver this part of the offer. The amendment covers parents who temporarily drop out of the current eligibility through providing a grace period. We are concerned that despite the calls of the CYPE committee, and Nazut Naz and Thwarateg, to include this within the bill, the minister's responses during stages one and two have not been strong enough. By again relegating this incredibly important area to the non-statutory administration scheme, the National Assembly for Wales does not have the opportunity to debate and discuss how it can operate smoothly on a national basis. Furthermore, in order to ensure that the pilot areas provisions are smoothly rolled out on a national basis, parents should be made aware of the Welsh Government's intentions on the face of the Bill. Some members, please support this amendment. Finally, on Amendment 22. This requires a definition of care to be included within regulations made under Section 1. As Susie Davis will provide more detail about, it is concerning that the Welsh Government has left so much detail outside of the Bill's application to the extent that some of its sections are rendered actually meaningless. Therefore, we recommend that at the very least, care is defined clearly within secondary legislation made under the Bill so we know who will benefit from the offer. Thank you. Susie Dibbs. Uh, yes, just briefly, shall we? Thank you. Uh, the bill, of course, is aimed at getting parents of children of non-specified age into work or keeping them in work by introducing a non-specified period of funded childcare. Uh, and naturally, it needs to be clear what constitutes a parent, uh, which it does successfully at Section 17A by reference to parental responsibility as defined in the Children Act 1989, uh, and then less successfully at 17B by including, uh, I quote, any individual who has care of a child. Now, what is <coughs> care of a child? I mean, however, in my view, incoherent the government's definition of childcare might be, care clearly means something else here, as parents are the ones who benefit from others supplying childcare. And it doesn't include corporate parenting, as it refers to an individual having care of a child. Does it mean a foster parent, official or unofficial? What does an individual have to do to prove uh, that they have care of the child? And I think this subsection is pretty meaningless as it is, and this amendment allows the minister a way to give it meaning, although um, I still think it should have been clear on the face of the bill. Um, if he intends not to uh, recommend support for this amendment, um, I just ask you, Minister, to explain how you intend to remedy this weakness, bearing in mind there's nothing in the Bill at the moment which obliges you to bring forward regulation uh, in, in order to clarify the position. Um, I, don't, I don't think your know, simple assurance will be satisfactory uh, unless it's backed by a commitment and a timetable to fix this problem. When will you bring forward a regulation? Because uh, I don't think an explanation of flexibility is going to work on this one either, because we will all want to know who can claim that they exercise care. Thank you. Call on the Minister.
Uh, thank you very much. First of all, let, let me just begin by saying this childcare offer is very clear in what it's doing. I think some of the discussion here is what is set out on the face of the bill in primary legislation and what is set out in regulations or in uh, schemes of operation and so on. Uh, this bill is actually very narrow, to, just to repeat it. It's the mechanism that sets up the operation of the HMRC to discuss eligibility of uh, uh, parents to apply for the childcare offer. However, um, I, I would simply say, and in response to um, Sean's uh, ambitions for what a childcare offer may look like, what an early years offer might be, uh, there are always the discussions around where we go in the future, but I would simply say, for want of the perfect, do not throw out what is the very good, because the early implementer responses, the, the year one response to this, showed out how successful this has been, how well it's been regarded, and the fact it's put in 200 to 250 pound in, the, in, the, in households that some of whom are, are are on the lowest wages as well. So this is work and it's effective. But I understand the aspirations to do more in future and so on, and many of us articula have articulated those aspirations for what we do in future. But this childcare offer is very clear. The bill is very narrow. However, some of this discussion is around uh, what's on the face of the bill and so on. Let me just turn to this. The majority of the amendments in the group, particularly amendments 6, 11, 8 and 5, and the consequential amendments 19 and 10, relate to the eligibility criteria for the offer and they're closely aligned with some of the responsible committee's recommendations about opening up the scope of the offer to parents in training and education. Now, we debated this at quite some length at stage two proceedings and very recently, in fact, I wrote to the chair and the members of the Children, Young People and Education Committee outlining the various schemes available to par parents which are outside of the parameters of this offer. So let me just briefly uh, remind all members um, of that so there's a range of other programs already in place to provide support to other categories of parent. This includes PACE and Fly and Start, work-based learning support for non-employed learners, the Financial Contingency Fund for individuals attending further education, and the childcare grant to students in higher education. PACE is £13.5 million of Welsh Government and European Social Fund project funding. It targets the services to economically inactive parents right across Wales, will consider childcare to be the main barrier for them access and training or employment opportunities. And since July, it's worked with over 3,400 3, parents. It's helped 1,100 of those into work. 590 parents have received financial support through PACE for their children to access registered childcare. This has enabled those parents to undertake training, work experience, volunteering, and to increase confidence and employability skills, which have improved their chances of moving into employment. I, I will in a moment, uh, Sean, just in a moment. It's also paid over £400,000 in childcare costs, not only supporting parents to prepare for work, but helping them make the transition into employment for the first few weeks. And, as I outlined in the letter, discussions are ongoing with the Wales European Funding Office regarding extending the PACE project beyond 2020, and the evaluation findings we have as part of this child offer will form part of that consideration. Sean. Uh, just to above, I... I just wanted to know how many of these schemes are statutory um, are, are vint... and how many are reliant on short-term funding sources. Well, I just mentioned in terms of pace, we've gone actually beyond where we uh, might be reasonably expected to go because we're actually looking at extending now beyond 2020, beyond the current tranche of funding, and we're actively involved in, engaged in that. Uh, but that's, of course, not the only one. We also have Fly and Start, for example. It provides quality childcare to parents of eligible two- and three-year-olds for two and a half hours a day, five <coughs> days a week for 39 weeks. The financial uh, and there is work ongoing within government to look at how we, beyond the 10% that we actually uh, modified this year to extend uh, uh, with flexibility on the fly and start, to see what else we can do beyond that as well. So those discussions are ongoing. The Financial Contingency Fund provides help to students in further education who need help with childcare costs. In 2016-17, 901 awards were made to student parents and FE to help with childcare costs amounting to 2.7 million. And there are others that I laid out in the, in the letter as well. But we will need to keep this provision firmly in our sights to make sure it is in place alongside this offer, not as part of this offer. So whilst I'm very sympathetic to all the challenges that all parents, whatever the circumstance, face in, access, in accessing affordable childcare when they need it, I've said all along that this offer this offer is specifically targeted at the working parents of three- and four-year-old children. Now, 
The purpose of Amendment 9 is to ensure the inclusion of the upper earnings cap within the regulations detailing the conditions parents must meet to be considered eligible for the offer. I shall not be supporting this amendment because this amendment makes no difference in terms of practical effect from what we have in the Bill already, and I do not, therefore, consider it necessary. The upper earnings threshold is a fundamental part of the eligibility criteria, and as such, details of the cap will have to be specified in regulations under Section 1. This is rehearsing the same debate we had before in order for the eligibility checks to be made. And in response to the actual cap, we can in future, Sean, actually amend the cap if we wanted to. But there are genuine questions here on the commitment to roll this offer out by 2020 in full across Wales and the demand that there is to do that, I have to say, as well. Aligning this with the current HMRC offer that is currently there makes us able to deliver it with less risk on time, in cost, and to get it up and running. In future, we can indeed, based on the evaluation findings, come back and look at this again. And if we decide as Assembly members that we want to drop it to 80 or 60, and by the way, we've done some of this initial analysis and scoping, and there are issues of cost-benefit analysis, how much you cost to do that and how much you save by doing it, but we can do it. But let me just remind you, as I've said before in committee, over 60% of those who are receiving this childcare in its early implementer phases are below the median wage. This is not leading to the sort of abuse that we've heard talked about of the system where people are living in their uh, swimming pool mansions and so on are using this. This is people who are on low earnings who are accessing this. It is helping them actually extend their hours in work and so on. Now, the purpose of Amendment 17 is to ensure the inclusion of details regarding temporary exemption periods within the regulations under Section 1, Clause 2. A temporary exemption period is that period of time a person would continue to benefit from the offer despite falling out of eligibility. Now, I provided a note, and I've spoken with the committee on this before as well, but I provided a note to the responsive committee during stage one. I've had further discussions with Susie and Janet on this, and I'm disappointed I haven't been able to assure them, despite the fact that we have uh, that period already in place with the offer uh, that deals with that very issue. I still think that the administrative scheme is the best place for administrative matters such as this. So it isn't to say I don't want Assembly members to have the say on these issues, and I've actually offered to bring the scheme forward to the CYP committee in the spring so we can discuss it further. So on this basis, uh, we will not be supporting Amendment 17. Amendment 22 seeks to define what's meant by care in regulation. We've just touched on this. We debated this at stage two. And as I said at the time, I don't see what's to be gained by defining in regulations under this bill what's meant by care. Subordinate legislation under Section 1 will detail very clearly the conditions a parent or a partner or of a parent will need to meet in order to qualify for funding under this offer. And this covers parents and guardians who are acting in local parentis, such as kinship carers, or foster carers. I would urge me Assembly members not to support Amendment 6, 11, 8, 19 and 10, which are around widening the scope of this bill to include parents and training and education. It's absolutely right that we have that in place, but it's out with this offer. In addition to writing to the responsible committee about the range of schemes I've described already in place to support different categories of parents, I have also asked my officials to look at how best we can draw all of this together and improve the communication around it so that it is clearer to people, whatever their circumstances, that what help they can access to support their childcare needs. So I won't be supporting Amendment 9 as it is uh, we deem unnecessary. Um, I think that concludes. Uh, share with Sean Gwynhian to reply to the debate. Um, yeah, um, just in fear of all. Just to pursue all of these other programs, those, these create huge confusion for people. People aren't aware of them. And for me, it would make common sense to bring everything together so that everyone who has children of three or four years old does have that right to free childcare. A question you the question is that Amendment 6 be agreed to. Does any member object? We will proceed to an electronic vote. Open the vote. Close the vote in favour 8. No abstentions, 35 against. Therefore, Amendment 6 is not agreed. 
Amendment 11. Janet French Saunders, Amendment 11. Question. The question is that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Does any member object? Submit. We'll proceed to an electronic vote. <laughs> Open the vote. Kair. Close the vote. In favour, 18. No abstentions, 25 against. Amendment 11 is therefore not agreed. The next group of amendments is the group relating to Welsh language childcare provision. Amendment 7 is the lead and only amendment in this group, and I call on Sian Gwynhian to move and speak to the amendment. Sian Gwynhian. Thank you very much. Amendment 7, in the name of Plaid Cymru, relates to ensuring that the Minister has due regard to the Welsh language in childcare. Beginning with Welsh medium education or Welsh medium childcare from an early age is crucial if we are to reach the target of a million Welsh speakers. And indeed, the Children, Young People and Education Committee in July of this year have confirmed that, and recommendation 37 made by the committee asks for the million Welsh speaker strategy and the childcare bill to be integrated. I am pleased that the Government has considered this piece of work by the Welsh Language Commissioner on the provision of childcare and early years education through the medium of Welsh, which was published a year ago, and that there has been some progress made. This report found that English is the main language of 77% of childcare providers, with 13% through the medium of Welsh and 10% bilingual. This report stated that there weren't specific or robust plans in place as to how to integrate the 30-hour offer and the Cymraeg 2050 vision. And yes, there has been some progress and yes, thanks to pressure from Plaid Cymru, some funding has been allocated for 40 new projects through Midyad Maithrin. But that's just 40 projects across Wales. That isn't much, and it certainly isn't going to take us on that journey towards a million Welsh speaker. It's very slight progress. So I do know that the Minister has some sympathy with what I am saying, and I will listen very carefully to his comments now, and we'll see exactly what he's willing to put on the record. Minister to speak, Hiranka David. Can I just thank you for the constructive discussions that I've had with you and also with Clear as well uh, previously on this issue. And we do indeed have uh, a great deal of sympathy with the spirit of the amendments uh, that have been moved. And we welcome actually the opportunity to put on record uh, some of the things that we can do to achieve exactly that. Uh, and members, if, uh, if they're content to bear with me, because I think it's important to lay out the scope of where we can go uh, with this. Start, the starting point is we absolutely agree that increasing the availability of Welsh medium childcare in the round is vital if we're going to achieve our ambition of Cymraeg 2050, and we need to find a way to make this happen. Now, the amendment that you have is slightly different than the uh, drafting from the earlier amendment that was tabled at stage uh, two, and the focus has moved slightly from placing a duty on the Welsh ministers to meet the Welsh language needs of children access in the offer to ensuring that the importance of the Welsh language is considered in the provision of childcare under subsection one of the uh, bill. Now, this is helpful in getting us to debate this now, uh, but actually the amendment is in its drafting slightly ambiguous in terms of its purpose and its effect, and I'll come to that in a moment. It's not ideal as, as an amendment, but I think you've put it there in order to get this debate, and I welcome it. Um, I fully support the objective, and, and that's why I appreciate the opportunity to discuss these issues with Sean and Clear. Now, I would uh, suggest, however, the best way of achieving these objectives is to actually bring some additional energy and focus to the mechanisms we have in place, rather than by uh, creating a new duty in this bill. Now, we've already got duties on local authorities in terms of the planning and delivery of provision across the early years. Um, under the Child Care Act 2006, local authorities must, and I repeat must, have regard to the needs of parents for childcare involving the Welsh language in ensuring the sufficiency of childcare provision in their areas. Uh, I'm, I'm going through some of the things that are in place before I move on. Under the School Standards and Organisation Wales Act 2013, local authorities are required to set out in their Welsh and Education Strategic Plan, the WESPs, 
how they'll improve both the planning of provision for and the standards of Welsh medium education in their area. But again, we know the reality is that there isn't enough Welsh medium capacity, and this is why, as a government, we are actually now investing, as we speak, in the expansion of the Welsh medium childcare sector, in Welsh language training for the childcare sector, and, importantly, in greater data collection and analysis around the demand for and the capacity to provide more Welsh medium childcare. Now, through the early implementation of this offer, we are testing further where the gaps exist, and from this, where we can look to work with the sector and with partner and umbrella organisations, not just one, but all of them, to build the capacity of this uh, uh, market. We will continue to monitor parent intention to access and actually take up Welsh medium provision, and we'll consider this, by the way, in year two of the independent evaluation. And part of this is based on the feedback that we've had from committee members and from the discussions that we've had. Now, in the meantime, back in September, the Minister for Welsh Language and Lifelong Learning announced £46 million allocated from the Welsh medium capital grant and childcare offer, uh, capital grant, the two of them, to support the growth in Welsh medium education. Now, actually pulling those together and encouraging local providers and local authorities to access them in that joined-up way shows that sort of cross-government approach we need to deliver the objectives uh, that we have for the Welsh language. Now, this grant on its own will support some 41 projects across 16 local authorities. It will create just short of 3,000 school and childcare places for Welsh medium learners. And that's what we want, is that smooth pathway all the way through there. Now, back in the summer, I also announced, in light of discussions we were having, a £60 million capital grant programme across the years of 2018 to 21. And the key aim of this, provision, of this programme is to support the expansion of Welsh medium provision in line with the Cymraeg 2050 strategy. Now, as a government, you mentioned, Sean, Midiad Maithrin. We've also awarded Midiad Maithrin an extra million pound a year over the next two years to help establish new settings in areas where there is a lack of Welsh medium provision to fill in some of those gaps. The first group of the new settings are due to open during this academic year. And we've committed to increasing the number of Welsh medium nursery groups by 150 over the next decade. And as we discussed, by the way, at our recent meeting, it is really encouraging to see increasing numbers of local authorities bringing together now different strands of funding and doing some joined up thinking of their own on how they actually enhance and expand early years childcare and education in a joined up way. And we would encourage that as a government in the way that we put our funding together and put our incentives together. But in addition, there is an advisory board currently looking at WESPs, and it's been considering how to strengthen the links between the planning of Welsh medium childcare provision and statutory education using the data derived from the childcare sufficiency assessments. And I'd be keen to see what effect this data can be used for to strengthen Welsh medium provision. And specifically, we believe there is scope to do more to establish a clear link between a local authority's childcare sufficiency assessment and how that information is used to plan for Welsh medium early, years, uh, early education. It is important, I put on record, that local authorities view the growth of the Welsh language through a long-term lens, starting with the very youngest children. I will explore further with the Minister for Welsh Language and Lifelong Learning how we can encourage local authorities to more actively respond to what their assessments are telling them about gaps and supply issues in their area in respect of the Welsh language. Now, Amendment 7, if passed, and this is where the ambiguity and the narrowness of it causes problems, would only relate to childcare provision under this offer. That is childcare for the qualifying children of working parents as described by the offer. It wouldn't be relevant to childcare provision more broadly, and that's uh, a flaw with the amendment. And I know it's not an intentional flaw, but it actually narrows what we should be aiming to do with Welsh medium childcare. I would argue that looking at the connections that can be made between existing assessments of sufficiency and plans for the future provides a much more strategic way forward that is broader, but also deeper as well. And on that basis, with those remarks, I mean, I would urge Sean and fellow Assembly members to work with us in identifying and using those powerful levers I've described, not only 
to support uh, the spirit behind this uh, amendment, which has an element of ambiguity around it, but actually delivers our shared ambition for the Welsh language uh, as we go forward. And I hope those remarks are reassuring to you, Sean, in our openness to continue to work on this, to look at what we are evaluating from the rollout, and to use all the levers at our disposal in the way that we look at the join-up between much media medication and childcare, in the way that we use WESP, in the way that we use funding streams to actually drive local partners and local authorities to enhance and expand in Welsh medium childcare. Sean Gwilhi and to reply to the debate. A question you are the lead The question is that Amendment 7 be agreed to. Does any member object? Uh, yeah. Object. I, th I think, if I understood that speech correctly, you were objecting. Yes. <laughs> uh, we will therefore proceed to an electronic vote. Open the vote. Close the vote. In favour, 18. No abstentions. 25 against. Therefore, Amendment 7 is not agreed. Group 4 is the next group of amendments, which relates to transportation between providers. Amendment 12 is the lead and only amendment in this group. And I call on Janet Finch Saunders to move and speak to the amendment. Janet Finch Saunders. Amendment 12 has been retabled from stage 2. It is imperative that ministers are under an obligation to deliver the childcare offer free from potential barriers. During stage 1, the Children, Young People and Education Committee was made aware of concerns by a number of organisations about moving children between sites which provide the offer and sites which provide early years education. Both ESTIN and the Welsh Local Government Association have realised it is important to investigate the transportation of children, with some partnership work in being undertaken in parts of Wales. Yet, ESTIN have admitted that they were not observing the movement of children from one site to another, and the Minister's evidence at Stage 1 clearly showed a patchy picture of transport for children across Wales. Either parents were organising their own handovers, or some childcare providers were simply finding ways to link up with different settings. The Minister himself also noted that there should be a focus in future on increasing co-location and collaboration in maintained and non-maintained settings. At stage two, he confirmed this position by maintaining that he wanted to increase significantly the proportion of childcare delivered in co-located premises, yet refused the amendment on the basis that placing a duty on Welsh ministers was not necessary to tackle the issue. It is welcome that the Minister has confirmed additional research questions on the evaluation of Year 2 of the pilot schemes to further examine the matter, as well as promising to consider transportation with the evaluation of national rollout of the offer. However, we believe that this does not go far enough, especially due to the recommendation outlined in the first year's evaluation. Specifically, the evaluation of Year 1 recommends that further consideration needs to be given to the alignment between the provision of childcare and the delivery of foundation phase nurseries. This could include transport to and from settings. It is further recommended that closer working relationships may be required between foundation phase nurseries and childcare providers who are delivering the offer. As such, it is important that Welsh ministers are under a duty to oversee these recommendations so as to prevent further barriers for parents to access the childcare offer. Therefore, we ask the Assembly to support this motion. The Minister, Hugh Ranga Davis. Uh, and uh, just in opening, I think it is important to remind ourselves that this isn't something new, it's not arising as a result of the offer. It's not uncommon now, and myself as a parent, to receive education and childcare in different places and to make arrangements in terms of transport. The need to transport children is not something that rises in every setting, however, or in every part of Wales, but it is a feature of the services provided in some locations, and in part it's arisen as a result of the history of the sector and market pressure. Childcare providers are sometimes responding to what parents are asking for. 
It's important to remember that sometimes parents may want or need to use more than one provider for different parts of the offer or different parts of childcare. Think of parents who work, for example, late or early shifts or even on weekends. So it is important that we are committed to ensuring that there is still sufficient flexibility within both the sector and in the offer to accommodate their needs as well. But Look, let me make clear, I've said all along that I will take steps wherever I can to ensure that this offer is as seamless as possible. I repeat that today for the benefit of parents and for children. Now, as I said during stage two, I don't think that placing a duty on the Welsh Ministers to minimise the impact of transporting children between providers on the face of the bill is the way to tackle this issue. It often arises as a result of those local or specific family circumstances which are outside the remit and the power of government. But at the request of members, I've asked my officials to add research questions which cover specifically the issue of transportation to the independent evaluation of year two. And I hope, Sean, I, uh, uh, John, I can see you not nodding there. I hope you'll welcome that. And I'll consider this again as part of the review of the national rollout as well. The evaluation of year two of early implementation will include in-depth interviews and an online census survey of parents and providers. And we'll ask parents whether they have issues accessing the offer which relate to either transport or wraparound care. And we'll ask parents whether they perceive any transport or wraparound care their child receives to be having a positive or negative effect. And I would say, because I've visited a lot of these settings, some of them where they're co-located, some of them where they are moving between, and for some of the parents, it is exactly what they want. So we shouldn't be trying to stamp out diversity, but I think having more co-location provides much more seamless offer. Now, providers in the survey will also be asked about demand for provision, including transport and wraparound care, any challenges they might have in providing this, and their perception of whether this has a positive or negative impact on the children in their care. Now, as I said, I fully appreciate this situation has arisen not out of the blue. It's been there for years. It's in part because of the way we historically approach education and childcare, and because in some parts of Wales, early education can only be accessed in specific settings. Now, this is something that I and the Cabinet Secretary for Education have discussed and we're keen to address. So we issued revised guidance to local authorities in September, making it clear that we want to see more flexibility in the delivery arrangements for early education. If we allow more childcare providers to offer this, this should increase the options for single-site provision, which is exactly, I think, what, uh, what you're trying to achieve here, as I, as I am. And alongside this, in July, I announced a £60 million capital grant programme spread over the three years till 2021, and one of the primary purposes of this funding is to facilitate and support the co-location of early education and childcare provision wherever possible. This is in line with our Prosperity for All commitment to introduce a new model of community learning centres, providing extended services with childcare, parenting support, family learning, community access to facilities built around the school day. It's where we're heading. And I'll be able to share more information with the committee about the outcome of that grant programme early in the new year. And through guidance and the sharing of good practice and using the financial levers we have at our disposal with things like the Capital Fund, we're encouraging local authorities and providers to think innovatively about how they might be able to deliver the offer. There are many good models out there, and in fact, I've offered to members of the committee to identify those for them and even to arrange for them to go out and see them. Now, in light of those comments that I've made to monitor the impact of transporting children as part of the evaluation of year two, of a more strategic approach to reducing the need of transportation between settings through greater co-location, more innovative solutions, we will not be supporting Amendment 12, and I would ask other members to do the same. Janet Finch-Saunders. Janet Finch um, I seriously do welcome uh, the fact that you are warming to the idea that co-location and sort of better transportation is the way forward. But if I could just ask, as part of the research you say you're going to be carried out, if I would ask you to look at the ECLG uh, evidence that was taken from a number of mothers returning to work 
uh, after maternity, and they were very loud and clear that you know that they were finding a struggle now with those who could actually take up the childcare scheme, that they were finding it very difficult to, to move between providers. So I think there is a problem that exists there, and I would just again reiterate the concerns we've raised and ask that you do in fact show some willingness on your part and support us now on this amendment. A question. The question is that amendment 12 be agreed to. Does any member object? Add. We'll proceed to an electronic vote. Open the vote. Hi. Close the vote. In favour, 17. No abstentions, 26 against. Therefore, amendment 12 is not agreed. The next group is group 5, and this group of amendments relates to additional charges and rates of payment. The lead amendment in this group is amendment 13, and I call on Janet Finn Saunders to move and speak to the lead amendment and the other amendments in the group. Janet Finn Saunders. During stage 2 of the Bill's proceedings, we have highlighted the inconsistencies between the Welsh Government's aim for the Bill to reduce barriers to employment through the childcare offer and the technical nature of the bill. No more is this evident than the additional charges for snacks and consumables, which we believe will still present an added barrier for parents, particularly those on low incomes, to fully access the offer. Ultimately, this actually contradicts the primary aims of the bill, as outlined within the explanatory memorandum. So we have retabled amendments 13 and 21. I again note that the Welsh Government's guidelines within the pilot areas allow childcare providers to charge fees to parents of up to £37.50 per week, amounting to £7.50 per day based on the cost of three meals a day. So for parents who take up the full offer, this would mean finding an extra £1,800 a year. Not only do Welsh employees have the lowest take-home pay in the UK, those in receipt of benefits eligible for free school meals do have extremely low incomes, meaning this is simply unaffordable. Despite the Minister's assurance at Stage 3 that, in reality, parents who take up the offer would weekly receive 15 to 20 hours of childcare, meaning a maximum additional charge of £13.25 per week, this still adds up to £636 per year. Therefore, we still support the position of Care Inspectorate Wales, which noted that additional charges could make the offer unaffordable for some families who are on low incomes. We have also heard emerging evidence that in one pilot area, some childcare providers had started to charge parents when they had not done so previously. The Welsh Government's own evaluation of the offer has shown that 15 per cent of childcare providers interviewed had introduced additional charges as a result of this offer. Worse still is that some childcare providers whose fee was higher than the £4.50 per hour provided by the offer have even introduced additional charges to make up for a shortfall in revenue. Now, obviously, we welcome the Minister's responses at stages two and three, which stated that guidance on additional charges would be revised to strengthen the Welsh Government's position ahead of national rollout. It is also significant that the draft administrative scheme includes references to new guidelines for local authorities on additional charges, and we note the Welsh Government's efforts in warning providers not to charge top-up fees for three- to four-year-olds, with a threat of removal from the offer if this is breached. However, we still remain concerned that the definition of childcare so heavily relied upon by the Minister within the draft administrative scheme, which has been ably described in more detail by my colleague Susan, Susie Davis AM, actually includes supervised activities. Charges for these, we argue, should therefore be paid for under the offer. Furthermore, the first evaluation for early implementers has clearly shown that providers who have introduced additional fees are actually unaware that applying charges in this way is not part of the Welsh Government guidance. The evaluation also notes that in some cases, the additional charges actually replace some of the affordable, affordability barriers which the offer aims to remove. 
Whilst the draft administrative screen mentions that additional charges may not be imposed for the provision of funded childcare, the ancillary charges are still present, meaning that there is a way of childcare providers to make up the difference. Nor are the guidelines provided, meaning the National Assembly for Wales is currently unable to assess whether this could be prevented from happening. Therefore, I urge all members here today to vote in favour of this amendment. Not only would you be being fair to parents on low incomes who are striving to cover childcare costs, it would help to eliminate some of the barriers to employment which have, sadly, been incidentally caused by the offer. Now, Amendment 33 requests that the Welsh Government publish and monitor information relating to additional fees, including snacks. As explained under Amendment 13, charges for extra provisions can prevent some parents from taking up the offer and having to find up to £1,800 a year should they be charged full price for 30 hours a week, 48 weeks per year. However, and this will be a running theme throughout the majority of these amendments I have tabled, all of the Minister's assurances here are unable to be scrutinised or debated upon at a later stage by the National Assembly for Wales due to the fact that they are being left out of this bill. We are retabling this amendment as by refusing it at stage two on the basis of creating additional burdens on providers and local authorities, the Minister contradicted his own assertions at stage one. Moreover, the inclusion of guidelines on additional charges within the draft administrative scheme, as well as the fact that the Minister said he would take action if top-up fees are charged for three to four-year-olds by removing childcare providers from delivering the offer, suggests that monitoring of potential barriers will take place. Therefore, data collection has to be used to underpin this. The early indications from the Welsh Government's own evaluation is that some childcare providers have admitted to charge an additional fee since the offer was introduced. And we believe firmly, as such, a duty to publish information is very necessary to ensure that a robust review is undertaken. Therefore, the Minister must provide this institution with the opportunity to see the data the Welsh Government will inevitably collect on additional charges, rather than simply relegating it to a possibility under the Administrative Scheme's operation. And I urge members again to vote with your conscience and vote accordingly. <coughs> Amendment 32 requires the Welsh Government to publish and monitor the hourly rates paid for childcare and the foundation phase elements of the offer. As currently enacted, the Welsh Government's 30-hour-a-week childcare offer is maintained on a dual stream – the foundation phase nursery early years education and the childcare offer, with at least 10 hours a week to be funded by early years provision through local government revenue support grants. Now, we heard during Stage 1 that a dual setting can create unintended consequences, such as transportation between the providing, offering childcare and early years education. However, of particular concern is that there is a huge difference between the hourly rates paid for non-maintained early years education and the rates the Welsh Government is intending to pay for the childcare offer, with the offer providing substantially more than what is paid to early years education and foundation phase nurseries. The offer grants providers with £4.50 per hour for childcare, which is much higher than the £1.49 to £3.50 per hour estimated by Cullum and the WLGA to be offered to early years providers. Therefore, it is clear that these variations could have a negative impact on early years education by crowding out providers. This has been borne out in the pilot stages with the evaluation. Such variations could have a negative impact on early years education, something that was actually admitted to by the Minister at Stage 1. So through such disparity in payment, the WLGA also stated to the CYPE Committee that concerns had already been raised in pilot areas that early years education could become crowded out because of the childcare element of this offer. 
I have retabled this amendment as the Minister's assertion that it will be too onerous on Welsh ministers does not outweigh the importance of scrutinising the impact of the offer on early years and foundation phase provision. We are also aware of the Cabinet Secretary for Education's promise at Stage 1 that we are looking closely at the possible impact on foundation phase provision, including structural and financial issues that might impact on effective delivery and the quality of provision. The publishing of hourly rates we still contend is an important part of this evaluation. Thank you. The Minister to contribute. Hiranga David. Uh, uh, let me say some important things at the outset. First of all, in terms of the £4.50 an hour rate, the majority of providers uh, considered in, when we got to this rate that that would be an appropriate and adequate uh, hourly rate. And in fact, the, uh, the first year has actually shown that uh, that is considered by providers uh, an appropriate rate to provide uh, childcare and being commercially viable. Now, we have looked at the option of funding providers at a higher rate to cover some of the additional charges, but let's be frank here. We immediately run into problems and questions about within the funding envelope, either limiting the offer then to fewer parents or to less time. There is a choice to be made. Now, it's been our intention in designing the offer to create a childcare offer which offers as much childcare as possible to as many parents as possible within the funding envelope available. And if I could shake that money tree and get uh, the £800,000 that we're uh, 800 million pound that we're short uh, over the last uh, decade, uh, then maybe we'd have more to spend on this, and we could do even more again, and we could deal with the earlier um, suggestions by Sean Brentley and so on. But uh, we could do all those things, but we haven't got it. So we, you know, we know that uh, a number of these uh, amendments or similar ones were tabled uh, during stage uh, two. No amendment 13, the consequential amendment 21, relate to excluding. Uh, the pay, uh, to ex exclude the parents of children who could potentially be eligible for free school meals from paying uh, additional charges. Um, I think we already have sufficient measures in place to safeguard parents against being unreasonably charged. And I would say this is very different from what is happening within the England offer. So we've issued very clear guidance to providers about additional charges, uh, which Janet referred to. We've published guidance to local authorities as well on what the upper charging limit should be. This will help ensure that any charges be are being made are within a reasonable range, and it's very different to that position in England where there's no upper limit. We will publish revised guidance to strengthen our position, learning from the earlier implementing period on additional charges ahead of national rollout of the offer. So we will learn, we will discuss it with the committee, with the assembly, learning from the findings of the evaluation. Here in our office, providers must take account, must take account of our guidelines on additional charges. We've said, for example, that parents must have the option of providing a packed meal rather than pay for a meal provided by the provider. And bear in mind, some providers do not provide food uh, uh, or do not cook food on their premises and so on. It varies from provider to provider. Parents should also be able to opt their child out of uh, paid for site uh, paid for off-site activities and participation in such activities. They cannot be compelled to take part and charged for it. Providers have also been told very clearly that they are not to charge parents any hourly top-up fees for three- and four-year-olds who are ac accessing their services under the terms of offer. This is very different, much clearer in the guidance than in England. If a provider is found to be in breach of this agreement and is charging hourly top-up rates, we will take action. They could ultimately be removed from delivering the childcare offer. And we've also said to providers, Janet, that they should not be treating parents who are receiving childcare under this offer any differently from other parents, in, parents accessing their services. Providers should not charge parents who access this offer more for any additional elements than they charge parents who are not accessing the offer. Now, I, I should say as well, we, shouldn't be, we should be careful now not to jump to conclusions at this very early stage in the offer's implementation. In reality, the number of hours of childcare from which a child will be benefiting under the offer is likely to range between 15 and 20 hours per week. In the worst case scenario, 
Where a child is benefiting from the full 20 hours of childcare per week, a parent should not be required to pay more than £15 per week in additional charges if providers are operating in line with the guidance from Welsh Government. It's likely to be much less, actually, and that's what we're hearing. And that's what the first year evaluation suggested, is the majority of providers are not making charges at all there. Now, bear in mind, this stands against parents who are telling us first-hand, face-to-face, that they are saving because of the government-funded nature of this childcare, 200 to 250 pound a week they are better off because of the government-funded childcare. Now, we will, of course, keep the issue of additional charges under review, regular review. But from our evaluation of the early implementation, we know it's only a small percentage of providers who are charging for extras. And if we listen to the sector itself, for example, what Cullum said in the response to the Stage 1 recommendation, we should not be telling providers what they can and cannot do in terms of additional charges. So there is a fine balance to be struck here. Our guidance is very strong and explicit, but saying to them no charges, well, that has implications, and they wouldn't go with that. Now, in response to Amendment 32, I can give assurances. We will be publishing the hourly rate paid to providers in the administrative scheme, so we have every <coughs> intention of being open and transparent about that. Amendment 33 would require the Welsh Ministers to publish an annual report on the additional fees charged to parents under the offer. Now, look, I've said I'm keen to monitor additional charges as we move forward, and I think this is something we can test sufficiently through our evaluation exercises. And in this regard, I'd be very reluctant to support an amendment that places onerous bureaucratic requirements on the Welsh Ministers where there is no benefit to the people that we serve within this offer. To produce annual reports on additional charges, for example, we'd be heavily reliant on third sector, on third parties to provide the information to inform the reports, putting the bureaucracy on them as well as us, and we'd have no way of guaranteeing the accuracy or the reliability of the data. So, I'm not prepared to support this group of amendments on the basis that we are already taking all necessary action, very different from the England offer, to manage and monitor the issue of additional charges. We're already planning to publish the hourly rate in the administrative scheme. The evaluation of the first year of implementation has recommended further guidance to providers to ensure a consistent approach in charging for additional hours across all childcare settings, and this is something we'll do. And we'll also be reviewing our charging structure for the offer before full rollout in 2020. So on that basis, we may have a point of disagreement here, but I would urge members, therefore, to resist this group of amendments. Janet French Saunders to respond. Diartlow, we move to the vote. Question. The question is that Amendment 13 be agreed to. Does any member object? We'll proceed to an electronic vote to open the vote. Close the vote. In favour, 18. No abstentions, 25 against. Therefore, Amendment 13 is not agreed. Shangwen Hian, Amendment 8. And Thirvio? Yeah. Formally? Question you. Yes, formally. The question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Does any member object? Yeah. We'll open the vote, therefore. Close the vote. In favour, 18. No abstentions, 25 against. Therefore, Amendment 8 is not agreed. The next group of amendments is Group 6, which relates to qualifying children. Amendment 14 is the lead amendment in this group, and I call on Janet Finch Saunders to move and speak to the lead amendment and the other amendments in the group. Janet Finch Saunders. Amendments 14 and 18 brought forward from Stage 2 place the age of the qualifying child on the face of the bill and allows ministers to change that age at a later date through regulation. While the explanatory memorandum and the draft administrative scheme clearly outlined that three- and four-year-old children would be entitled to free childcare, the Bill declines to place the age of the child clearly within its provisions, instead leaving it to secondary legislation. While we understand the Minister's point of view on flexibility, we believe it is still necessary for the Bill itself to be open and transparent about its application. We recognise that the Minister tabled an amendment at Stage 2 to stage that funding will only be available to those under compulsory school age and has clearly included the age within the draft administrative scheme. However, this brings us no further forward to a transparent piece of legislation. 
as it is again left to secondary legislation or non-statutory guidance. Therefore, Amendment 18 is somewhat of a compromise to the Minister's wishes for future flexibility, allowing Welsh Ministers to change the age should evidence show that younger children need to access the offer. For example, evidence from the East LGC Committee inquiry into parenting and employment highlights the need for the childcare offer to be extended to 0 to two year olds to ensure higher employment rates. They also found that the biggest barriers to employment was for parents who are seeking work soon after their first child is born. Although there are concerns about Henry VIII's powers, this places the current aim clearly on the face of the bill, while providing Welsh ministers some flexibility to change the age at a later date, should evidence show further extension to the offer is needed. Turning to Amendment 15, my colleague Susie Davis AM adably outlined why we had to table these at Stage 2, and this sets out the reasoning why we will do so again at Stage 3. Essentially, this is about what actions the Welsh Government must take so that the Bill can even function, and if they are not, would simply leave the Bill as an empty vessel. There are duties here which Welsh Ministers must undertake to make the Bill work. As a result, we call on the Welsh Government to accept this amendment in the true spirit of which this was intended. As to Amendment 16, this is intended to ensure that whatever the eligibility requirements asked for by Welsh Government to apply for the offer is underpinned by giving parents information. Essentially, it's about helping eligible parents to the offer to understand themselves what a qualifying child is. It is concerning that the Welsh Government is intending to set out regulations informing groups of people about their eligibility of a certain offer or grant without providing clear information as to what they need to bring along to evidence their claim. Thank you. Susie Davis. Uh, uh, members, Amendment 50 simply introduces a duty on Ministers to introduce those regulations uh, to define the age of children whose parents can then rely on this legislation. Uh, despite the very welcome duty embodied in Amendment 4, which actually commits Ministers to funding the child care offer, uh, the likely fall of our Amendment 22 means that we are no nearer certainty on which parents will be eligible, because we don't know what care means, and now because uh, we don't know what qualifying children actually are. Uh, so Welsh Government, of course, we know they can introduce uh, the regulations to make this clear, but there's no obligation on them to do so. And for this bill to be actually operable, functional, uh, we need to have that age range, and so we must have uh, those, regula uh, those regulations. Um, so if we don't have the uh, regulations, the bill remains inchoate and unenforceable. Uh, Amendment 16 also improves the subsection, which helps us understand what a qualifying child means. Uh, section 17D refers to a child who is the subject of a declaration made by virtue of as yet non-existent regulations. And I think it could be possible on a generous uh, interpretation, actually, uh, for that subsection to function without regulations, but I really wouldn't want to put money on it. Uh, so um, if they are to be made, I think they must include... Uh, if they are to be made, uh, the Bill already says they may include a range of requirements to be met by a person making such a declaration. Uh, the amendment here simply says that if regulations are introduced placing such conditions on a person making a declaration, then they must also set out what that person needs to produce or prove uh, to, or, or say to show that they have actually met those conditions. Um, I, I don't suggest what you, what you might want to uh, introduce by way of evidence, but basically I don't think you should be uh, placing legal requirements on people unless you're clear how they can comply with those requirements. That's all this says. Uh, the amendment protects parents or others from potential uncertainty about how this bill affects them. Thank you. The Minister to contribute. Uh, the uh, can I uh, welcome the welcome we just had for my stage two amendment, even though it doesn't appear to go quite far enough. Can I also welcome the fact we got to group six before Henry VIII's powers were mentioned within this chamber? Uh, no. <laughs> 
Government amendments were passed at stage two, placing more details about eligible children on the face of the bill. These made it clear that eligible children must be below statutory school age, but provided the Welsh ministers with the flexibility to set that specific age range within regulations. Now, the CYP committee made it very clear in our discussions that it does not wish to close down the debate about the age of qualifying children. The bill, I would argue, as drafted, gives us that flexibility to vary the age of qualifying children in future, should the evidence tell us that that is what we need to do, making amendments 14, 15 and 18 unnecessary and in that way unhelpful. But furthermore, I would argue that the bill as drafted provides Welsh ministers with the power to specify in regulations the type of information a person making a declaration may need to provide. There is, therefore, no need to pass Amendment 16 to allow for this to happen. Now, the Stage 2 amendment was passed, and the Bill as... Uh, indeed, we'll give uh, Sorry, before we move on, thank you, Minister. The whole point is that, if you've got, uh, that these regulations need to be uh, introduced. The power isn't strong enough. You should have a duty. That's all that, that my amendments 15 and 16 were about. No, no, I, I fully understand. But my, uh, my argument, Susie, is that they're not actually necessary because we've made clear the commitment to actually bring forward, uh, bring this forward. Uh, and there's no doubt about that. Um, but if I can just briefly turn to the amendment that we passed at, uh, at the stage two deliberation and the bill as drafted, both now require that an eligible child be below statutory school age. It allows the Welsh Ministers, provides the ability for Welsh Ministers to set by regulations that age range. It allows us also to specify by regulations the type of information that parents should supply when making a declaration about a child's eligibility. Now, I accept this is not the same as specifying exactly what information a person must supply but being very specific about the nature of the information to be supplied, supplied in regulations could indeed fetter HMRC in terms of what they can accept as proof of eligibility. And HMRC, it isn't an accident that we're using them because they're delivering the very similar offer across the border. Uh, so that saying to HMRC, well, if things change with them, we're going to have to come back to our legislation and change it, that seems the wrong balance. Now, I don't see what is added by these amendments which seek to both specify a child must be three years of age to access the offer, uh, but provide the Welsh Ministers with the power to change that age and require Welsh Ministers to include details of the information to be provided in support of a declaration and reg regulations. So I just don't see that they are necessary beyond what we're already doing and what we've committed to do. And on that basis, although I, I welcome the welcome you had for the amendment that we brought through in stage two, I would urge members to reject these amendments 1415. 16, Janet Finch Saunders, do you respond? Uh, let's move to the vote. Question you, other leader being questioned. The question is that Amendment 14 be agreed to. Does any member object? We'll proceed to an electronic vote. Open the vote. Close the vote. In favour, 13. No abstentions. 30 against. Therefore, Amendment 14 is not agreed. Janet Finch Saunders, Amendment 15. 15. I move. Question. The question is that Amendment 15 be agreed to. Does any member object? We'll proceed to an electronic vote. Open the vote. Close the vote. In favour, 13. No abstentions. 30 against. Therefore, Amendment 15 is not agreed. Question Amendment 9. Jean Gunhian. Formally. The question, you are the, the question is that Amendment 9 be agreed to. Does any member object? We'll proceed to an electronic vote. Open the vote. Close the vote. In favour, 8. No abstentions. 35 against. Therefore, Amendment 9 is not agreed. Amendment 16. Janet Finch Saunders. Amendment 16. Moved. A question. It's moved. And the question is that Amendment 16 be agreed to. Does any member object? We'll proceed to an electronic vote. Open the vote. Close the vote. In favour, 13. No abstentions. 30 against. Therefore, Amendment 16 is not agreed. Amendment 17. Janet Finch Saunders. Question. The question is that Amendment 17 be agreed to. Does any member object? Open the vote. Kyle 
close the vote. In favour, 18. No abstentions, 25 against. Therefore, Amendment 17 is not agreed. Amendment 18, Janet Fryn Saunders. I move. The question is that Amendment 18 be agreed to. Does any member object? We'll proceed to an electronic vote. Open the vote. Close the vote. In favour, 13. No abstentions, 30 against. Therefore, Amendment 18 is not agreed. Amendment 19, Janet Fryn Saunders. Not moved. Not moved. Not moved. Question. Amendment 19 is therefore not moved. We reach Amendment 20. Janet Fryn Saunders. Not moved. Also not moved. Question. Amendment 21. Does uh, move? No. Move. Moved. Moved. Yes. Moved. Sorry. Moved. <laughs> <laughs> Question. <laughs> Amendment 21 is moved. A quest the question is that Amendment 21 be agreed to. Does any member object? We'll proceed to a vote. Open the vote. Close the vote. In favour, 18. No abstentions, 25 against. Therefore, Amendment 21 is not agreed. Shan Kwon Hien, Amendment 10. Formally. Question. The question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Does any member object? We'll proceed to a vote. Open the vote. Close the vote. In favour, 17. No abstentions, 25 against. Therefore, Amendment 10 is not agreed. The next group of amendments is Group 7, which relates to regulations to be made by Welsh ministers. Amendment 1 is the lead amendment in this group, and I call on the minister to move and speak to the lead amendment and the other amendment in the group. Hiwaranka Davis. Uh, Diolch Llewydd, and famous last words, but I hope this, uh, these amendments will be uh, uncontroversial. They are two technical amendments. Their purpose is simply to make it clear that regulations under Section 1 and Section 10 of the Bill are regulations made by the Welsh ministers. There are no other speakers on these amendments. I take it that the Minister doesn't wish to reply. So the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Does any member object? No, therefore Amendment 1 is agreed. Amendment 22. Following on from, thank you, presiding officer. Is it, is it, is it moved? Oh, sorry. You've already spoken to the amendment. Oh, move. Um, move. Uh, it is moved. Uh, question. The question is that amendment 22 be agreed. Does any member object? We'll proceed to a vote. Open the vote. Close the vote in favour 17, no abstentions, 25 against, therefore amendment 22 is not agreed. The next group of amendments is group 8, and this group relates to statutory instruments and changes to procedures. Amendment 23 is the lead and only amendment in this group, and I call on Janet French Saunders to move and speak to the amendment. Following on from Claire Griffith's amendment in stage 2 of the bill, we believe that the superaffirmative procedure for the bill should still be followed, hence the reason why Amendment 23 is being tabled. During the investigations of the Constitutional and Legislative Affairs Committee at Stage 1, it was clear that there are serious concerns about the nature of the bill and the reliance of the Minister on future regulations to provide flexibility. We find these concerns have been carried forward to both Stage 2 and Stage 3 of the bill. Quite clearly, the Minister does not intend to routinely consult on the draft regulations, which include important policy direction, such as the offer itself and where it will be directed. Due to the dependence of the Bill on subordinate legislation through regulations, it is critical that the National Assembly for Wales and associated stakeholders are provided with an opportunity to properly scrutinise legislation in this place. 
Both the CYPE and CLA committees were in favour of super affirmative regulations, should less detail be published on the face of the Bill. Therefore, we believe this should be an inherent part of regulation-making powers, at least from the very beginning of the Bill's application. Thank you. The Minister, Hiranka Davis. Uh, Dear Janet, from the very start, we have been entirely open about the eligibility criteria for this offer. They have been shared with the committee as part of the explanatory memorandum for the bill. They are out there now, and they provide the basis for, indeed, the live early implementation of the offer. They are not hidden. They are very transparent. The detailed eligibility criteria for the offer will be set out in subordinate legislation under the powers in Section 1 of the Bill and will be subject to the affirmative procedure, which I think is proportionate given the engagement we have already undertaken and which is ongoing. So how have we been open and engaging? Well, I'll list some of the ways. The Welsh Government has made significant efforts to engage with parents and providers and local authorities about the offer. We are continually evaluating and ensuring that lessons learned from early implementation pilot areas continue to influence and shape and inform aspects of the longer-term policy. Indeed, the findings of the first year of implementation was published on the 22nd of November. We have also heard directly from thousands of parents since we launched our Talk Childcare campaign, and parents are telling us that finding that affordable, available, accessible childcare is one of the biggest challenges facing families in Wales. And they are also telling us that juggling work and the logistics of early education and childcare is far from easy, as we have heard. We have also undertaken an extensive engagement process with childcare providers and the umbrella organisations that represent the sector. We are also in the early years of phase two of our Talk Childcare campaign, which will focus on engaging with providers. We are also working with our early implementer local authorities as they begin to deliver the offer, and they are fully engaged with local authorities who are yet to come on board. So, I am not convinced that we need to consult on subordinate legislation under Section 1, given that we have placed more detail on the face of the Bill about what we mean by an eligible child, addressing one of the Constitutional Legislative Affairs Committee's fundamental concerns. We are already into early implementation of the live offer. This is, in effect, a national consultation on and a test of the offer. We are not embarking on something completely new and unknown here. We are taking reasonable steps to evaluate the offer. There is ongoing and constructive engagement with key stakeholders through our stakeholder reference groups. And we have also listened to what members have been saying about the need for a review clause in the Bill. Government Amendment 2, which will be debated as part of a later group, uh, Group 12, proposes we build into the Bill a requirement to pause and review the effectiveness of the legislation. But can I remind members again that this is a narrow technical Bill to facilitate the application and eligibility check-in process. The regulations that will be made under Section 1 of the Bill will detail the eligibility criteria, which will then form the basis for the eligibility check-in system. So, the procedure we are proposing for making these regulations, we would argue, is entirely proportionate, and I would urge fellow members to join me in not supporting these amendments if they are pushed. This amendment. Janet Finch Saunders, do you respond? <coughs> I will therefore move to the vote. Question you the question is that Amendment 23 be agreed to. Does any member object? So we will proceed to a vote. Open the vote. Close the vote. In favour, 18. No abstentions, 25 against. Therefore, Amendment 23 is not agreed. The next group of amendments is Group 9, and this group relates to categories of providers of funded childcare. Amendment 24 is the lead amendment in this group, and I call on Janet Finn Saunders to move and speak to the lead amendment and the other amendment in the group. Janet Finn Saunders. Thank you, the author. We have retabled amendments 24 and 25 from stage two, because while we recognise that the Minister has listened to the committee and stakeholders and included relatives registered as childminders within both regulations and the draft administrative scheme, this is again left to secondary legislation and a non-statutory scheme to determine. As has been made clear within Stage 2, this is not just about the types of provider listed, but the registration process. We agree that childminders should be subject 
to registration, and we have heard the Minister's reassurance about both schools and grandparents. Yet this misses the fundamental point about the current registration process for being a childcare provider. Grandparents are still unable to register with Care Inspectorate Wales if they only look after their own relatives. And I have to say, uh, Minister, when we've met with you, you yourself have said the ones not taking up the offer have sometimes been those where the grandparents look after their children. As Pace Cymru noted at stage one, this leaves out a vast wave of people who also care for their relatives, leading to concerns about the sustainability of the childcare sector, especially within our rural areas. This ties in somewhat with our continued concerns about workforce planning, which will be dealt with under Amendment 34. The Minister pointed out at Stage 2 that there is no stipulation for relatives to care for other children under the offer. However, this isn't made clear either on the face of the bill or within the draft administrative scheme. Likewise, the exemption for schools under the childminding and daycare exceptions, Wales Order 2010, as the side effect of preventing the Minister's aim of wraparound care, as schools would have to work in partnership with a registered childminder to provide the childcare element or create a separate legal entity for reg representatives to register. While we received assurances at stages two and three that these will be reviewed, this needs to be made clear during the legislative process. That's why we're here today. The CYPE committee is also still waiting for the results of the call for evidence to review the Child Mining and Daycare Exceptions Wales Order 2010, which could ease the registration of both relatives and schools as childcare providers. It is deeply disappointing that the Minister has issued a call for evidence during the latter stages of the Bill's progress, meaning that we, as Assembly members, do not have the ability to scrutinise this evidence before the Bill is passed. This is surely where the process of the Bill are lacking. We are debating a framework Bill which the Minister claims is merely technical, but essentially it's delivering part of the childcare offer through HMRC. The bill was at stage one, six months into testing the pilot areas, at stage two, before a call for evidence on childcare registration, and at stage three, before the first, evalu before the first evaluation of early implementers of the offer was published. It does very much feel as though we are going back to this bill in a year's time when the next evaluation report is published and the year after when the national rollout has begun. That surely is not just putting the cart before the horse, but a whole caravan. Pre uh, uh, right, thank you. <laughs> I nearly said presiding officer then. <laughs> I'm going to need to the Minister to contribute to the debate. Here, Anka David. So, I understood what you meant. I got it. Um, one of the benefits of doing a piloted rollout, where we've moved from seven to 14 and we'll move upwards in terms of local authorities, is that we learn as we go and we evolve and we modify the scheme. But the question here is what is put on the face of primary legislation? It's been, I understand, because it's a running challenge with this, but this is a narrow technical bill to allow HMRC to deliver the childcare offer, and the rest will be described in regulations or in the operation scheme and so on, the administrative scheme. And the administrative scheme, as, as I said, uh, I've made clear, I will bring in front of the committee and I'd be happy to have it reviewed and to discuss this and to analyse it. But look, we've been very, very clear from the start about who can provide childcare under the terms of this offer. It is only registered providers can deliver this childcare offer. These providers are regulated and they're inspected. That for us is important as a measure of quality <laughs> and standards. It provides us with the assurance that the funding use for the childcare offer is being spent on childcare that meets a number of requirements. Now, providers who sign up to things such as voluntary approval schemes, which are very, very welcome, such as the one run, by, run for nannies by CRW, they're very useful schemes, they really are, but they're not registered, they're not inspected, and therefore they cannot deliver this offer. We have, however, 
to clarify, already flets the rules learnt from the first year of early implementer to ensure that childminders can be funded through the offer to care for children who are also relatives. We heard from the committee, we had direct face-to-face -face conversations with grandparents out there who were saying, well, I am actually a registered childminder, I'd like to do this. We talked about this internally, we came in front of the committee and discussed it. We changed what we're doing on the basis of learning live on the ground. But we do realise uh, that the existing legislation has some prohibitions around this arrangement in the wider context, and it's for this reason that I've already committed to review that aspect of existing legislation so that we can look at who can provide. But the benefit of pilots is I will keep coming back to the Assembly and saying, we've now learned this. Do you think it's a good idea that we flex it again? before the full rollout. Now, it's important to keep that, in, uh, keep that in mind. Childminding and daycare are already defined in other pieces of legislation. Replicating this within this context is unnecessary. I've said that already. It raises the risk that those definitions could actually fall out of sync in the future, resulting in confusion or having to revisit primary legislation. And just to be clear as well, we really do appreciate as a government, I do, crikey, as a parent as well, who's had three children, the contribution that many grandparents make in caring for their grandchildren. But my nonna and nonna would not have been able to access this childcare offer as providers because they weren't registered with CIW. They were not inspected. I love them dearly and they provided brilliant childcare, but they wouldn't have been able to access the scheme and it's the right thing. So, you know, that's where the clarity lies. Now, I can't see what would be gained from these regulation-making powers in Amendments 24 and 25, which would only, in effect, be stating and defining categories of providers already stated and defined in other legislation. So, on that basis, whilst I understand where you're coming from on this, we can't support these amendments. Janet Finn Saunders to respond. Thank you. I am particularly disappointed in this, uh, this one, and I'll tell you for why. Within my own constituency, and I'm sure it's replicated across Wales, we have many living in our rural, isolated com uh, communities who, are, who are actually have Welsh grand grandparents and who teach their children and provide childcare now today through the medium of Welsh. And I know for a fact that they will not be able to access that. And I, I see the aims for the Welsh language in this you know, the Welsh Government say, and I really, really, I just cannot comprehend how you cannot support this amendment. Mm. A question. The question is that Amendment 24 be agreed to. Does any member object? We'll proceed to a vote. Open the vote. Close the vote. In favour, 18. No abstentions. 24 against. Therefore, Amendment 24 is not agreed. Amendment, the next amendment is 25. Janet Finn Saunders. Moved. Move. The question is that Amendment 25 be agreed to. Does any member object? We'll proceed to a vote. Open the vote. Close the vote. In favour, 18. No abstentions. 25 against. Therefore, Amendment 25 is not agreed. The next group of amendments is Group 10, and this group relates to administrative arrangements for the provision of funded childcare. Amendment 26 is the lead amendment in this group, and I call on Janet Finn Saunders to move and speak to the lead amendment and the other amendments in the group. Janet Finn Saunders. We have retabled Amendment 26, as this is to help clarify who will be responsible for delivering the childcare offer at the point of national rollout. The Bill is currently silent on whether it will be the Welsh Government at a central level or our local authorities. While the Bill's regulatory impact assessment mentions that without the need for legislation, the implementation model delivered by local authorities at the pilot stage could be rolled out nationally. The explanatory memorandum states legislation is needed to create one national application and eligibility checking system, avoiding any differences. Furthermore, the Welsh Government has indicated that its preferred option is to use HMRC as a vehicle to receive and check applications. At stage two, I felt that the Minister's response slightly missed the point of this amendment. The Minister noted that there was no gain in restating a duty that local authorities already have and stated that this existing duty was broader as it included duties for disabled children and the Welsh language. 
Whilst I do recognise that, the Bill is still silent about who is responsible for delivering the offer at the national rollout stage. As a result, the Minister must provide clarity on this matter, as the Bill is meant to be the mechanism by which applications to the childcare offer will be assessed. Currently, HMRC will be responsible for that side of delivering the offer. Therefore, the Minister must confirm whether the Welsh Government or local authorities are to be held ultimately responsible for the administration of this offer. I also cannot stress enough how concerned we are that the vast majority of the childcare offer will be left to the administrative scheme and is not on the face of the bill. To do so excludes key details, including ages, hours of the offer, how parents can access the childcare offer and conditions which providers need to meet. Of grave concern is that the administrative scheme outlined by the Minister will have no legal status and no scrutiny procedure for the National Assembly for Wales. Both retabled amendments 27 and 28 cover condition providers must meet amendment 28 and how they are to be funded amendment 27, which are currently left to be determined under the administrative scheme. Some stakeholders who gave evidence to the CYPE committee expressed concern about who would be able to provide the childcare, how payments will be made and at what hourly rate. The Welsh Local Government Association stated it was necessary to ensure that the roles of local authorities and HMRC are clearly defined in determining post-eligibility arrangements for childcare, so the practical applications of the Bill and the childcare offer are not affected. Specifically, it was raised that in England, inconsistencies actually arose after HMRC had checked the eligibility criteria. Contradictory evidence has been given by the Minister and his officials during Stage 1. While the Minister has asserted that the payment system would be developed separately to the eligibility checking system in the Bill, his own official stated that Welsh Government would have to work out when local authorities need to know information about eligibility to make their decisions on place allocation for early years education. This suggests that eligibility and post-eligibility arrangements are already being linked. During every stage of this bill, the Minister has repeatedly said that he wants flexibility. However, this need for flexibility by putting much of the offer's eligibility criteria under the administrative scheme comes at the cost of fundamental scrutiny powers of the National Assembly for Wales. So therefore, it is again welcome that some concessions have been made, but place in the administrative scheme before the CYPE committee in the spring uh, does not mean the same scrutiny processes will be undertaken as it would if it was placed on the face of the bill. Therefore, more clarity is needed for post-eligibility arrangements to ensure that the new childcare system will operate smoothly. It is clear from the evidence the CYPE committee heard that arranging to pay childcare providers is just as important as ensuring that the application system for the offer is correctly administered. So I therefore ask members to support this amendment. Jo. Minister to contribute. Here, Anka Dave. Uh, thank you, Claire. And, and I think that helps explain something for me. I think we genuinely have a misunderstanding. What this bill is about is the check-in of eligibility and the application through the mechanism of the HMRC, eligibility for parents to access the childcare offer. What you were talking about, Janet, then, was the aspect of actually delivering the offer. I will be back in front of Assembly members, while well, if I'm still in this post, in some time in the future when we come to the full rollout, to do what local authorities have asked us to do, which is then to put in place the structure of how we actually coordinate delivery across the whole of Wales. It's separate. It is separate. Um, so let me just turn to the amendments here. Uh, you rightly uh, I, I restate what I've said previously in terms of Amendment 26. 
uh, I don't see what's to be gained by restating a duty which local authorities already have in respect of ensuring sufficient childcare is available within their areas. The existing duty, as you said, is also broader than what is proposed as it requires local authorities to have regard for the need for childcare suitable for disabled children and for childcare using the Welsh language. Amendment 27 seems to be seeking to bring within the scope of subordinate legislation much of the operational detail we're planning to include in the administrative scheme. Now, we've, we're going to learn, we're going to continue to learn from experience with this offer, and the administrative scheme is exactly the mechanism which gives us the important flexibility to adjust and review those administrative operational front-end arrangements as we go. The administrative scheme is not some excuse to hide issues from Assembly members. I've already brought it forward in framework form to share with members, and I would genuinely welcome further scrutiny of the scheme in the spring. And in terms of Amendment 28, I'd like to reiterate what I've said previously about the need for providers to be registered and inspectors inspected to take part in the offer. We've always been clear about that and our reasons uh, for this. And, uh, and simply to re refer to the uh, remarks you made in closing a moment ago in the previous bunch of amendments, if there are relatives, grandparents and others out there who want to actually make use of this scheme, including in provision for their own children, as well as uh, others as well, because I've seen some very good provision of people operating in houses with six children there, two or maybe of their own, and the grandchildren and so on. They can do that. They just need to register as well. And there are grandparents who do that, I have to say. Um, now, I think we should also keep in mind this is already a suite of standards childcare providers are required to comply with. They're fully detailed in our national minimum standards, and they were only revised, in fact, in April 2016. So on this basis, with those explanations, uh, I hope that's explained why we can't support amendments 26, 27, or 28. Janet Finn Saunders, to respond? Therefore, move to the vote, please. Question. The question is that Amendment 26 be agreed to. Does any member object? We'll proceed to a vote. Open the vote. Close the vote in favour 18. No abstentions. 25 against. Therefore, Amendment 27, 26 is not agreed. Amendment 27, Janet Finn Saunders. Question. The question is that Amendment 27 be agreed to. Does any member object? We'll proceed to a vote. Open the vote. Close the vote. In favour, 18. No abstentions. 25 against. Therefore, Amendment 27 is not agreed. Amendment 28, Janet Finn Saunders. The question is that Amendment 28 be agreed to. Does any member object? We'll proceed to a vote. Open the vote. Close the vote. In favour, 18. No abstentions. 25 against. Therefore, Amendment 28 is not agreed. The next group of amendments is Group 11, and this group relates to reviews of determinations and appeals to the first tier tribunal. Amendment 29 is the lead and only amendment in this group, and I call on Janet Finn Saunders to move and speak to the amendment. Janet Finn Saunders. Just bear with. As with Amendment 15, Amendment 29 highlights the actions that Welsh Government must take in order to prevent the Bill from causing unintended consequences, this time providing a duty to provide reviews of determinations and appeals to the First Tier Tribunal. Again, my colleague Susie Davis AM will highlight what importance this has from a constitutional perspective and the differences between must and may. We can all agree that Welsh Ministers should and would be bound by their duties if this amendment is passed. Therefore, Ministers must allow the right of appeal from the very beginning of the Bill, as this amendment would allow, rather than potentially kick this decision into the long grass. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, thank you, Janet. Subsection 1 of uh, Section 6 of the Bill gives Ministers the power uh, to make provision for reviews of or appeals to the first tier tribunal against determinations as to eligibility for funding under the bill. Um, and I would say that this bill needs to include a right of appeal, not merely permit ministers to consider <coughs> some time when they have a moment to include one. As a legislature, uh, I don't think we've always thought about uh, what our constituents might do when faced with a wrong decision 
uh, a miscarriage of justice, if you like, however minor. And too often we leave them with something like judicial review as their only meaningful recourse for remedy. And that's not satisfactory. And in the absence of a thought out appeals process on the face of this bill, I, think, uh, I really think we must oblige Welsh Government to bring forward uh, the regulations to fill in that hole. Uh, Minister, you may think that there's you know, not a significant difference between powers and duties in some cases, but actually placing a duty on you to bring forward an appeals um, process through regulation is a huge message to our constituents that you really worry about what happens to them if something goes wrong as a result of this bill. Uh, and uh, for, for, that, for that reason, uh, um, it's, it's one of the reasons I put, I put my own backbench bill into the ballot. I know it didn't get drawn. But, um, <coughs> What happens to our constituents when things go wrong really matters, and I would really like you to consider this, appeal, uh, this amendment seriously because I think it does add value to the bill. Minister to contribute, here at Anka Davis. Uh, dear Llewydd, and I can assure members and constituents that there will be a process for review and decisions made in respect of a person's eligibility for the offer, and that we will be seeking to be open and transparent on how a person can challenge a decision made about their eligibility. In fact, there is a procedure which already exists in respect of the offer in England, and if HMRC, if we take this bill through, becomes the delivery agent for the application and eligibility checking system for the Welsh offer, we will seek to ensure that people here in Wales can follow exactly the same route, including the appeal to the first tier tribunal. The intervention there, Minister. Um, I'm grateful for that assurance. Um, but, uh, if you can give us some kind of steer. Oh, can I ask you for another reassurance then? Is um, that this would be one of the first sets of regulations you bring forward, provided HMRC uh, are, are happy with what you intend to do? Yes, and it, we'd be keen to do that. And those discussions with HMRC have already been ongoing, that we would mirror these uh, mechanisms that they have with, with the appeal to the first uh, tier tribunal. And I'm happy to go back to officials and s seek to ensure that this is amongst the first tranche that we bring forward, if that is of some assurance. Now, the intention of the amendment that's been put forward by Janet would appear to be to restrict somewhat the flexibility by which the Welsh ministers would have to use their regulation-making powers in the bill. And now I'm not convinced that this is wise. By inserting the word must here in the bill, we're binding Welsh ministers to having to make provision in regulation for an appeals process to the first tier tribunal, despite what I just outlined, that if we take this bill through, it'll be there in the HMRC mechanism. So I'm content with the current drafting, which means the Welsh ministers will have these regulation-making powers, but their options in how these appeals are handled in future are kept more open. So for the reasons I've stated, uh, we can't support Amendment 29, and I'd hope that other members are also persuaded of the benefits of proceeding the way we suggest with this bill and not in searching um, what is such a restrictive amendment into, onto the face of the bill. Janet Flynn Saunders to respond. Uh, I believe that my colleague Susie Davis has made the relevant points and I therefore ask that we move to the vote. Question you the leader. The question is that Amendment 29 be agreed. Does any member object? We'll move to a vote, therefore open the vote. Close the vote in favour 18, no abstentions, 25 against. Amendment 29 is therefore not agreed. The next group of amendment is group 12, and this group relates to review and reports on the effect of the Act and sunset provision. Amendment 30 is the lead amendment in the group, and I call on Janet Finn Saunders to move the lead amendment and to speak to the other amendments in the group. I speak to amendments 30, 2A, 2B, 2C, 2D, 2E and 35. Although these seem a bit like diving into a pick and mix of review amendments, all of them are very important. And the main point we wish to raise is that nowhere in the Minister's Amendment 2 does it say independent or to lay before the National Assembly for Wales. At the very least, we would have expected that any report should be both independent and available for the National Assembly as the legislator to scrutinise. Turning to Amendment 30, this is a complete alternative to the Minister's Amendment. As I outlined in Stage 2, the split between the Minister's claims of the technicality of the Bill, as opposed to the very broad policy position within the explanatory memorandum and the draft administration scheme, is stark. By agreeing to scant detail on the face of this bill, the National Assembly for Wales would be allowing the powers of the executive 
to increase, whilst at the same time indeed limiting its own. The Minister throughout stages one and two emphasised that the detail of the offer should be left to secondary legislation to allow for flexibility. However, subordinate legislation could change both the offer and the policy intent completely. Without the National Assembly for Wales using its function as a legislator to scrutinise it in depth. The first evaluation of the offer was also published less than two weeks ago, and more than seven months after this bill was introduced by the Welsh Government. It therefore seems to support the Constitutional and Legislative Affairs Committee's observations that the Welsh Government is legislating for the childcare offer before the conclusion of the pilot programmes and the appraisal of the policy's effectiveness. As to amendments 2A, 2B, 2C, 2D and 2E, these amendments seek to improve upon the Minister's own ideas about reviewing the Bill. The concerns we have around the transparency of the Bill and previous Welsh Government legislation are borne out through the seven powers provided to Welsh Government to make secondary legislation contained within just 13 sections of the Bill. The National Assembly for Wales cannot have just 40 days to vote through unamendable sub subordinate legislation without meaningful consultation. Throughout stages one and two, the Minister has sought to assure the Children, Young People and Education Committee that key concerns surrounding transportation, between childcare settings, workforce planning and the charging of additional fees would be investigated and the draft administrative scheme also makes some concessions on the details of the offer. We therefore welcome some of the concessions and assurances the Minister has made in these areas. For example, we are pleased that the Minister has committed to add research questions to the evaluation of Year 2 of early implementation of the offer on transportation, as well as adding both the offer and additional charges to the draft administrative scheme. Yet there is still no inclusion of the National Assembly for Wales within the process of evaluating the offer and its effects. Listed before us within Amendment 2C are just a few of the areas the Minister has refused to consider placing on the face of this Bill and has instead either dropped, made promises about or relegated to the non-statutory administrative scheme. It is also of note that the Welsh Government's own evaluation of early implementation of the childcare offer, published just two weeks ago, recommended that further research is needed over a longer period of time in order to provide conclusive evidence on impact. We therefore contend that this amendment provides a framework for the National Assembly for Wales to also scrutinise the impact of both the Bill and the childcare offer. As a result, while the list within this amendment is not exhaustive, it serves to show that the wishes of the Assembly are respected rather than downgraded when the Welsh Government undertakes its review of the Bill. Moreover, the fact that the Minister has only promised to bring a copy of the draft administrative scheme before the CYPE Committee in spring, but nothing else, should be a warning that this will not be laid before the Assembly. Moreover, we do not agree with the Minister's assertion that a five-year period will give the Assembly enough time to review the offer. The national rollout will begin in 2020. Therefore, the Assembly should have been able to assess its adequacy from the start. Therefore, we hope that Amendments 2A, 2D and 2E will be passed. Finally, as Susie Davis will also attest under Amendment 35, there is an option for the Bill to sunset by allowing the Assembly to determine whether it has carried out its main duty as a mechanism to provide the childcare offer. As my colleague has noted in Stage 2 of the Bill, review closes do not include the option of concluding whether a piece of legislation has failed to deliver on policy intention. First, a sunset close will allow for the Act to be stopped if regulations on its functions are not introduced. And secondly, it allows for the Act to be sunset if it does not achieve its policy intentions. Given the necessity of both, it is clear that such an amendment should be accepted in the case of a skeleton bill, as that is what we have here. Thank you. 
Minister. Uh, Clowith, and can I just begin by welcoming... Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Minister. I should have called Susie Davis. Uh, Susie Davis. Minister, with uh, yeah. Amendment 35, you haven't covered it. Uh, so, Dio uh, Kikitai. Um, can I just begin by saying I was very grateful to you, Minister, for engaging with us on the, on the question of the review. I think this was really, really important. Uh, I think core to the confidence in any review is this Parliament's ability, though, to help design it, uh, get answers to the questions that we think will satisfy our constituents' uh, interests, as well as, um, as well as providing better legislation, if you like. And I think Janet Finch Saunders's amendments uh, contain, a, as she said, an inexhausted, uh, inexhaustive list of sensible and very relevant criteria, which I would expect all members here to think um, as, as relevant and would expect to be included in any review. Of course, that, that list can be expanded, um, but simply reinforces that point that we as, as, as Assembly members need to be satisfied that the review is, uh, is robust enough rather than uh, just uh, uh, the Welsh Government. So I, I hope you'll be open to any extensions to or inclusions in, uh, the, uh, in that list as, as, as we go forward. Uh, now, uh, Amendment 35, Janet very kindly referred to this bill as a skeleton bill. Uh, you know my view that it's, it's got more holes in it than Steptoe's vests, and it's going to need really, really patch, patching up uh, with a list of regulations, which of course may or may not be uh, effective for this to function as a statute. And I was pleased to see in the draft legislation Wales Bill uh, that the Council General acknowledges the, the merits of sunset clauses in subordinate legislation. And you, in fact, a Minister, as previous Chair of, of CLAC, acknowledged the merit of sunset clauses in primary legislation. And I, I, I agree with you both. Uh, so this duty to review, um, I think you said, Minister, pause and review, uh, newly introduced to the Bill, doesn't include an option to conclude that it's failed on policy intention. And the inclusion of the sunset clause now uh, simply allows for this legislation to be scrapped if regulations either prove insufficient to perfect the functionality of the bill or um, allows it to be scrapped if a re review feels, uh, reveals that it's failing to achieve uh, any of its policy intentions and would continue to fail to do so. Now, I know you'd be worried about HMRC, but the easy way to solve that problem is to bring forward the, uh, the, the regulations to fill in the holes, because we don't want uh, ineffective law hanging around in our due-to-be-codified system. Uh, so this amendment simply, uh, simply gives this Parliament the right to get rid of it without waiting for government to make that decision. Um, it is very much, am I allowed to say the word backstop flower in this chamber? I'm just kind of worried at the moment. But, that, but that's what I'm looking at as. It, it, yes, it, 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 it's kind of uh, somebody standing behind the wicket to make sure you do bring forward these regulations, particularly as you're not very keen on the super affirmative procedure by which we are to do that. So I, I recommend this to other assembly members. Queenie Dog. Seriously, uh, Janet, thank you very much. I'm happy to be tested on this and put some uh, remarks on record as well. And thanks for your engagement in trying to take some of this forward on my own amendment here as, as well. Uh, and can I just uh, acknowledge the welcome that you gave to the way we've already learnt and flexed some aspects of the administrative scheme very openly, uh, said what we're doing, why we're doing it. Uh, we have brought, as I've said, the framework forward already. Uh, I repeat it again as the chair is sitting right next to me, really happy to come in front of the committee in the spring and be tested on that administrative scheme, what more we're learning, and to do that on a regular basis, quite frankly. Um, but look, we set out clearly in the regulatory impact assessment for the bill our intention to review the extent to which the legislation will have achieved its objectives a few years down the line. And we will, of course, be doing that in line with good practice, and I'll give you some detail now. But I do think it's important that we leave sufficient time for the offer and the new system to have become really fully embedded before we conduct that thorough root and branch review. And it is important that parents and providers in the sector also have that time to adjust so that we're able to get a real picture of the way things are working across Wales. Now, it's this balance which my amendment, Amendment 2, is attempting to strike. So it may help members, all members, if I set out the timetable for review as I see it. So subject to the passing of this legislation, we anticipate these powers being commenced during 2019 to enable the necessary work to build and test the national application and eligibility checking system with a view to rolling out the new system fully in 2020. We want to ensure that the new application and eligibility checking system is up and running for a full three years to enable that full comprehensive review, which covers the period then between 2020 and 2023. After the end of that testing period, it is only reasonable that we allow 
reasonable time for the findings to be properly considered, properly analysed, and for a review report to be written in the light of that. So for a programme of this size, this complexity, this could take some time. So we've allowed up to, up to a further year, given us the five-year period which is in our amendment. Now, if we can do it sooner, we will. But this time frame allows for the best possible thorough review of the system. It's for this reason that I don't support the other amendments here. And members also will be mindful of the fact we've committed to independent evaluation of our programme of early implementation. I'll turn to the wider full review as well. The report in the first year of early implementation was published last month. A report in the second year will be available next October. So it's not a case of there being no evaluation and wait in for that full evaluation. As for the detail which uh, Janet would like to see specified on the face of the bill about what the review would cover, I've already conceded, as has been mentioned, on some issues including the transportation issue. I met with the Assembly members and we'll now be looking at that as part of the evaluation of the second year of early implementation. And on charges, I've also said we'll keep this under review and I've set out our plans in relation as well to workforce planning. Now, I'd be very cautious about trying, however, to arrive at a definitive list of aims for the review of the full offer right now, because this is still evolving. There will be other things that people want to see in there. So before we've completed, particularly the early implementation, seeing the findings of the points that members have already queried. Now, I can also confirm that this review, the major review, will not be undertaken in-house and that we would appoint an external, independent evaluation company. I'm keen to give them the broadest remit possible and not to fetter them. And as a consequence, I won't be, I can't be supporting then amendments 2B or 2E. Now, Amendment 35 is the sunset provision, attempting to insert that provision into the bill. Now, as I said at stage two, I'm not convinced of the need for such a provision in the bill. I have concerns that a sunset provision would send the wrong signal to providers, to local authorities and to parents out there about our commitment as a government to this offer, so I won't be supporting this amendment. But I commend the government's amendment number uh, two and urge members to support this amendment, which puts in place that full and thorough review after a suitable and appropriate period. Jonathan Saunders to respond. I move my amendment. Question here with the leader. The proposal is to agree amendment 30. Does any member object? We'll move to a vote. Open the vote. Close the vote. In favour, 18. No abstentions. 25 against. Therefore, Amendment 30 is not agreed. As amendments to Amendment 2, Amendments 2A to 2E will be disposed of first in accordance with the marshalled list. Minister, do you wish to move Amendment 2? Amendment 2A. The question is that Amendment 2A be agreed. Does any member object? We'll move to a vote. Open the vote. Close the vote in favour 18. No abstentions. 25 against. Therefore, Amendment 2A is not agreed. 2B. The question is that Amendment 2B be agreed. Does any member object? We'll move to a vote. Open the vote. Close the vote in favour 18. No abstentions. 25 against. Therefore, Amendment 2B is not agreed. To C, Janet Finn Saunders. The question is that Amendment 2C be agreed. Does any member object? We'll move to a vote. Open the vote. Close the vote. In favour, 18. No abstentions. 25 against. Therefore, Amendment 2C is not agreed. 2D, Janet Finn Saunders. The question is that Amendment 2D be agreed. Does any member object? We'll move to a vote. Open the vote. Close the vote in favour 18, no abstentions, 25 against. Therefore, Amendment 2D is not agreed. 2E, Janet Finn Saunders. The question is that Amendment 2E be agreed. Does any member object? We'll move to a vote. Open the vote. 
Close the vote in favour 18, no abstentions, 25 against. Therefore, Amendment 2E is not agreed. Amendment 2, which has not been amended, it has been moved. The question is that Amendment 2 be agreed. Does any member object? We'll move to a vote. Open the vote. Close the vote. In favour, 32. No abstentions. 11 against. Therefore, Amendment 2 is agreed. The next group of amendment is Group 13, which relates to the duty to promote awareness. The lead amendment in this group is Amendment 31, and it's the only amendment. And I call on Janet Finn Saunders to move the amendment. Janet Finn Saunders. Amount th amendment 31. Even. Places a duty on Welsh Government to promote awareness of the childcare offer. Sorry. Uh, and eligibility. In Wales, the dual stream nature of the offer is evident. Split into the foundation phase, nursery, early years education, administered by local authorities for at least 10 hours per week. And the childcare offered. I've got them on the wrong one. I do apologise. Next one. Uh, no, 13, yeah, I was on the rack. What? Right. In evidence to the committee, the WLGA stated that local authorities remained responsible for administrative systems for early years education, meaning parents would have to apply separately to their local authority and HMRC to access the full 30 hours. However, it has been noted by childcare providers as well as Estin that this could cause widespread confusion among parents. At a national level, HMRC's representative confirmed there was no reason at all why the correspondence couldn't include what a parent is eligible for, and alluded to the fact that the childcare choices could be updated to include Welsh data. We recognise the Minister's admission that there will be potential for confusion arising as a consequence of the Bill but had mentioned that the Welsh Government had funded a fa family information service within each local authority in the pilot areas in order to give clear signposting between the two systems. He further noted that a communication strategy was being tested within the pilot areas to signpost parents on the offer as well as additional support such as tax credits. As such, it is important that Welsh Government continue with their efforts to inform parents of the offer and provide alternatives if they are not fully eligible. This amendment covers the Minister's commitment and will simplify the offer for parents so that no further barriers are placed before them during application. Furthermore, local authorities already have systems in place to signpost parents to the foundation phase childcare offer, enabling a smooth transition towards a national system. Furthermore, the evaluation of early implementers has recommended that promotion and awareness raising should be considered. The evaluation also noted that more and clearer information is needed to help parents of qualifying children to work out the cost of childcare. As a result, we believe that a duty on the Welsh Government to provide information will help to continue funding for local authorities in this respect, as well as to coordinate information services at the point of national rollout. Thank you. Gwynny Dog. Mr. Uh, I am indeed aware that there have been a range of communication challenges for local authorities, parents and providers in relation to the offer to date, and I have considered carefully the findings of the evaluation report on the first year of early implementation, covering many of these points. So, we will be launching a national communications campaign regarding the offer ahead of it being available nationally in 2020, and alongside this, as Janet has referred to, we will continue to work along with the Family Information Service to ensure that details about both this offer and also other wider childcare support is available to parents as needed. Each local authority has a Family Information Service which act, acts as the first point of contact for advice and information on local services for families and carers. It is, of course, also important to make sure parents have access to information about childcare at the point when they make decisions about jobs and careers. So we've been working with the Department of Work and Pensions to ensure employment advisers have that information as well, as well as with our own Welsh Government-funded employability programme. So 
given that all of this work is already underway and that we have a service dedicated to providing families with advice on their childcare choices, I don't see that we need to add additional duties in this regard by way of this bill. So uh, we won't be supporting this amendment. Janet Saunders to respond. I would like to proceed to the vote. Uh, question you. The question is that Amendment 31 be agreed. Does any member object? We'll move to a vote. Open the vote. Close the vote in favour 18. No abstentions. 25 against. Therefore, Amendment 31 is not agreed. Amendment 32. Janet Finn Saunders. The question is that Amendment 32 be agreed. Does any member object? We'll move to a vote. Open the vote. Close the vote in favour 18. No abstentions. 25 against. Therefore, Amendment 32 is not agreed. Amendment 33, Janet Wynne Saunders. I move. Question you, other leader. The question is that Amendment 33 be agreed. Does any member object? We'll move to a vote. Open the vote. Close the vote in favour 18. No abstentions. 25 against. Therefore, the amendment is not agreed. The next group of amendment is group 14. And these amendments relate to workforce planning. Amendment 34 is the lead and only amendment in this group. And I call on Janet Finch Saunders to move the amendment. Saunders. We are retabling Amendment 34 as the Minister's responses on workforce planning throughout stages 1 and 2 have simply not been satisfactory enough. This amendment ensures Ministers are under a duty to examine the capacity of the childcare workforce so enough childcare is available for parents to take up the offer. It is essential that capacity is scrutinised as evidence has highlighted particularly during pinch points during academic years, especially during school holidays, there have been problems. Furthermore, <coughs> Cullum, the umbrella body for five childcare providers in Wales, noted that there was a lack of qualified staff, difficulties in staff retention due to low wages and insufficient hours, a lack of registrable venues and availability of school and community buildings to hold childcare services. Worryingly, there are deficits within certain areas of the childcare sector, include, including providers who can give childcare through the medium of Welsh and staff who are trained to provide childcare for children with additional learning needs. National Deaf Children's Society Cymru has called on the Welsh Government to consider skill sets of the childcare workforce in relation to children with ALN. Furthermore, as the recent revaluation of the office pilot areas showed, low usage rates of the Welsh Government's SEM budget for early implementer local authorities, uh, oh, uh, implementer, local authorities highlight uncertainty by local authorities about how to allocate this budget, and this could be used to train the childcare providers. Social Care Wales also estimates that 21,000 additional full-time equivalent places would be needed to meet demand if the anticipated number of parents take up the offer, and 2,637 extra workers would be needed nationally by the full rollout in 2020. As there is not present capacity to provide this, to meet a potential shortfall, a 700% increase would be needed in the number of childcare apprenticeship recruitments and completions over two years. Additionally, the recent evaluation on the early implementers of the childcare offer has noted that while few providers have concerns about capacity to accommodate the current demand, many note that they were already operating at full or near, near full capacity, and others did not wish to expand as this would adversely affect the character of their childcare setting. It is also concerning to see that one third of childcare providers in the pilot areas now do not have capacity to expand should demand increase. So there again, not only does this contradict the Minister's assertions at stage two that early implementer authorities were not showing strains within the system, it makes a review of workforce capacity even more necessary. While the Minister is promising more robust reviews of workforce planning in years two and three of implementing the offer, 
This still leaves out the Assembly's functions to scrutinise whether the childcare workforce does have capacity to deliver this offer. Thank you. Queenie Dog. Minister. Uh, can I begin by just refreshing members' um, knowledge and recollection of the significant contribution that we're actually already making as a government through the Tenure Workforce Plan published last year in terms of building exactly what the members requested, which is that additional capacity and capability across the childcare and the play sector. That tenure plan aims to professionalise the sector, create a highly skilled workforce capable of offering high quality, <coughs> flexible, affordable childcare. And in terms of investment in the skills and quality of the workforce, there is indeed a new suite of childcare qualifications being developed ready for introduction in the later part of 2019 alongside the rollout of the childcare offer. The apprenticeship programme, which provides part of this, will support providers and their workforce to access these qualifications. But we've also been working already on new ways to encourage real diversity in the workforce. So in partnership, for example, with the NN NDNA, the National Day Nurseries Association, we've run the Childcare Works project. I've seen it firsthand myself. It targets those who are currently economically inactive, but who have the right skills and personal attributes to work with our young children. It's produced a number of successful outcomes, including job creation, and we're considering now giving, uh, going ahead with a second phase. But I do also recognise the financial challenges the sector faces, and that's why we're prioritising investment into the sector. It's targeted at business support measures as well as skills, and it'll help the sector to build its own capacity and capability. And one of the key drivers for this will be, indeed, the exemption of business rates for all registered day nurseries from next April. This exception will be for a period of three years alongside the rollout, supporting existing providers to become more established and to support new start-ups in local areas as we continue to roll out the childcare offer and roll out the expansion of the workforce. But we do have to remember that the sector is a mixed economy. It's made up of private and third sector organisations as well as some in the public sector. And the job creation, therefore, within the sector is dependent on a number of factors, not all are within the gift of Welsh ministers to influence or control. But we will continue to monitor how these plans can be improved to best support the sector to be able to take full advantage of this exciting childcare offer commitment. So in light of the current and the planned activity by this government to support and develop the workforce across what must be said is a very diverse sector, we will not be supporting the amendment. Saunders to respond. Uh, I'd like to proceed to the vote. Sorry. Question you other. The question is that Amendment 34 be agreed. Does any member object? We'll move to a vote. Open the vote. Close the vote. In favour, 18. No abstentions. 25 against. Amendment 34 is therefore not agreed. Amendment 35. Janet Finn Saunders. The question is that Amendment 35 be agreed. Does any member object? We'll move to a vote. Open the vote. Close the vote. In favour, 18. No abstentions. 25 against. Amendment 35 is therefore not agreed. Amendment 3, Minister. I move formally. Question. The question is that Amendment 3 be agreed. Does any member object? Amendment 3 is therefore agreed. The next group is Group 15, and the final group, and these amendments relate to commencement. The lead amendment and only amendment in this group is Amendment 36, and I call on Janice Finn Saunders to move the amendment and to speak to it. Janice Finn Saunders. Sorry. <coughs> Amendment 36 has been retabled on a matter of principle. At stage two, my colleague Susie Davis AM was very clear to the Minister that there should be a power for the Assembly to halt the actions of the Welsh Government momentarily if we believe that it has acted outside of its powers. Section 12 3B of the Bill allows the Welsh Government to make a number of provisions in connection with the Bills coming into force, and this amendment gives the Assembly that very same opportunity for the Welsh Government to explain their actions if questions are asked. Thank you. Susie Davis. 
Yeah. Spotted. Uh, well, we're at the end of the debate here, so I'm not going to keep you long. But it's a perfect time to welcome back old friends, isn't it? And Amendment uh, 42 is one of those old friends. It's about commencement orders. Uh, we routinely bring this... Uh, of, uh, yeah, we do, uh, for a good reason, Cabinet Secretary, because this is something the government needs to pay attention to, because it can often forget that this assembly is the legislature, not them. And if we want the opportunity to scrutinise any Welsh Government actions undertaken by virtue of statute, then we can. And if we think Welsh Ministers may have overstepped the mark, I'm not saying they will have, but if we think they may have, perhaps sucked it ultra-virus, then we should be able to, as Janet said, halt their actions momentarily just for us to check. And that's what Section 12.3b allows Welsh, uh, uh, would, would allow us to do. Because the Welsh, uh, sorry, that's what this amendment uh, would allow us to do, because uh, that section allows Welsh Government uh, to make a range of provisions in connection with the bills coming into force, transitory, transitional or saving provisions. I can sing along if it's easier. Um, <laughs> these are pretty standard wordings. And I must, uh, no, 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 I'm not Peter Lilly. Um, I, and of course, you know, I accept that this is standard wording, um, but they could actually mean anything, couldn't they? So. Um, in stage two, the uh, Minister said that the making of commencement orders is not normally subject to any procedure, and the Welsh Government's position has always been clear that, Welsh, that commencement orders do not need any subject to any procedure. Well, they're not normally attached to this because Welsh Government keeps knocking us back with the help of uh, whip back benches. Uh, but actually, it's not the Government's view that's important here. It's actually the legislator's view, a point that we do make repeatedly and is pushed back by Government in a way that I now think is probably... Uh, inappropriate. So, uh, if the government's going to keep uh, stopping us introducing this one, um, I think it's, it's time for me to ask Labour Bill benches to do something quite radical here. It's been a week when parliaments have been uh, asserting themselves against governments. Uh, so, why not take this opportunity to take a tiny stand and join a tiny revolution by supporting this amendment and affecting this tiny defeat on Welsh Government, which just has a serious point, which is reinforcing the role of this Welsh Parliament vis-à-vis -vis Welsh Government. Thank you. Uh, Dog. Minister. I do a uh, at all, and uh, can I urge, uh, urge uh, colleagues on these benches and across here to let's keep those rebellions happening in Westminster, not here. Uh, <laughs> Even though it's late in the day. Uh, and can I just thank, um, in this final amendment, those who have moved amendments and uh, applied good scrutiny to the stage of the bill. This issue indeed did come up during stages one and two. In fact, it was this exact amendment. So my response may be entirely foreseeable. The making of commencement orders is not normally subject to any procedure as they bring into force matters that the National Assembly has already approved. The Welsh Government's position on this issue has already been clarified. I see no reason, therefore, to deviate from the current convention in relation to commencement orders. <laughs> Thank you very much, Minister. I appreciate uh, your, your kindness on this one. Yes, it is, a, it is about an order that's bringing forward something the Assembly has agreed, but we need to make sure you're doing it properly. And that's the tiny little bit of uh, extra scrutiny that we are asking for here. I'm almost sure that in 100% of occasions there will be no problem, but you never know. And that's what we as parliamentarians need, parliamentarians need to keep an eye on. Thank you, Susie. I think we've now, we have now jointly exhausted the forbearance of all our colleagues. Yeah. I shall not be... <laughs> I shall not be supporting this amendment. <laughs> Jonathan Saunders, your matter. Okay. Jonathan Saunders to reply. No. Um, <laughs> no, we'll move to the vote, but before I do so, I'd like to thank you, Cloward, uh, and the Minister, and all the colleagues for your p uh, patience and graciousness during our amendments. We've tabled these in the best of intentions because we firmly believe that um, we want <laughs> our, our children across Wales to be able to access this um, this offer and more importantly we want to see our parents being able to get back into work to get back into education and to get back into training so we have done our best to ably scrut uh, you know to, to scrutinize this and i'd like to obviously thank my um colleague susie davis for her work on this also question you the question is that amendment 36 be agreed does any member object we'll move to a vote therefore open the vote Close the vote in favour 18, no abstention 25 against. <laughs> amendment 36 is not agreed. The final amendment is Amendment 5, Jean Gwentlian. 
I formally move the amendment. The question is that Amendment 5 be agreed. Does any member object? We'll move to a vote on this amendment. Open the vote. Close the vote in favour 17, no abstentions, 25 against, therefore Amendment 5 is not agreed. And we have reached the end of our Stage 3 consideration of the Child Care Funding Wales Bill, and I declare that all sections of the Bill are deemed agreed, and that brings today's proceedings to a close.